The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides Translated from the original Arabic text by Michael Friedlander Read by Daniel Davison This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Introduction Letter of the Author to His Pupil Rabbi Yosef Ibn Aknin in the name of God, Lord of the universe, to Rabbi Yosef, may God protect him, son of Rabbi Yehuda, may his repose be in paradise. My dear pupil, ever since you resolved to come to me from a distant country and to study under my direction, I thought highly of your thirst for knowledge and your fondness for speculative pursuits, which found expression in your poems. I refer to the time when I received your writings in prose and verse from Alexandria. I was then not yet able to test your powers of apprehension, and I thought that your desire might possibly exceed your capacity. But when you had gone with me through a course of astronomy after having completed the other elementary studies which are indispensable for the understanding of that science, I was still more gratified by the acuteness and the quickness of your apprehension. Observing your great fondness for mathematics, I let you study them more deeply, for I felt sure of your ultimate success. Afterwards, when I took you through a course of logic, I found that my great expectations of you were confirmed, and I considered you fit to receive from me an exposition of the esoteric ideas contained in the prophetic books, that you might understand them as they are understood by men of culture. When I commenced by way of hints, I noticed that you desired additional explanation, urging me to expound some metaphysical problems, to teach you the system of the mutakalamim, to tell you whether their arguments were based on logical proof, and if not, what their method was. I perceived that you had acquired some knowledge in those matters from others, and that you were perplexed and bewildered, yet you sought to find out a solution to your difficulty. I urged you to desist from this pursuit, and enjoined you to continue your studies systematically, for my object was that the truth should present itself in connected order, and that you should not hit upon it by mere chance. Whilst you studied with me, I never refused to explain difficult verses in the Bible, or passages in rabbinical literature which we happened to meet. When, by the will of God, we parted, and you went your way, our discussions aroused in me a resolution which had long been dormant. Your absence has prompted me to compose this treatise for you, and for those who are like you, however few they may be. I have divided it into chapters, each of which shall be sent to you as soon as it is completed. Farewell. Prefatory Remarks Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Psalms 143, 8 Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. Proverbs 8, 4 Bow down thine ear, and hear the words of the wise, and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. Proverbs 22, 17 my primary object in this work is to explain certain words occurring in the prophetic books. Of these, some are homonyms, and of their several meanings, the ignorant choose the wrong ones. Other terms which are employed in a figurative sense are erroneously taken by such persons in their primary signification. There are also hybrid terms denoting things which are of the same class from one point of view and of a different class from another. It is not here intended to explain all these expressions to the unlettered or to mere tyros, a previous knowledge of logic and natural philosophy being indispensable, or to those who confine their attention to the study of our holy law. I mean the study of the canonical law alone, for the true knowledge of the Torah is the special aim of this and similar work. The object of this treatise is to enlighten a religious man who has been trained to believe in the truth of our holy law, who conscientiously fulfills his moral and religious duties, and at the same time has been successful in his philosophical studies. Human reason has attracted him to abide within its sphere, and he finds it difficult to accept as correct the teaching based on the literal interpretation of the law, and especially that which he himself or others derive from those homonymous, metaphorical, or hybrid expressions. Hence he is lost in perplexity and anxiety. If he be guided solely by reason, and renounce his previous views which are based on those expressions, he would consider that he had rejected the fundamental principles of the law. 
and even if he retains the opinions which were derived from those expressions, and if instead of following his reason he abandoned its guidance altogether, it would still appear that his religious convictions had suffered loss and injury, for he would then be left with those airs which give rise to fear and anxiety, constant grief and great perplexity. This work has also a second object in view. It seeks to explain certain obscure figures which occur in the prophets and are not distinctly characterized as being figures. Ignorant and superficial readers take them in a literal sense, not in a figurative sense. Even well-informed persons are bewildered if they understand these passages in their literal signification, but they are entirely relieved of their perplexity when we explain the figure or merely suggest that the terms are figurative. For this reason, I have called this book Guide for the Perplexed. I do not presume to think that this treatise settles every doubt in the minds of those who understand it, but I maintain that it settles the greater part of their difficulties. No intelligent man will require and expect that on introducing any subject I shall completely exhaust it, or that on commencing the exposition of a figure I shall fully explain all its parts. Such a course could not be followed by a teacher in a viva voce exposition, much less by an author in writing a book without becoming a target for every foolish conceited person to discharge the arrows of folly at him. Some general principles bearing upon this point have been fully discussed in our works on the Talmud, and we have there called the attention of the reader to many themes of this kind. We also stated Mishneh Torah, Part 1, Chapter 2, Section 12, and Chapter 4, Section 10, that the expression Ma'aseh Berashit, Account of the Creation, signified natural science, and Ma'aseh Merkabah, Description of the Chariot, Metaphysics and we explain the force of the rabbinical dictum, the Ma'ase Merkaba must not be fully expounded even in the presence of a single student unless he be wise and able to reason for himself, and even then you should merely acquaint him with the heads of the different sections of the subject, Babylonian Talmud Hagiga, Folio 11b. You must therefore not expect from me more than such heads, and even these have not been methodically and systematically arranged in this work, but have been, on the contrary, scattered, and are interspersed with other topics which we shall have occasion to explain. My object in adopting this arrangement is that the truths should be at one time apparent, and at another time concealed. Thus we shall not be in opposition to the divine will from which it is wrong to deviate, which has withheld from the multitude the truths required for the knowledge of God, according to the words, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. Psalm 25, 14. Know that also in natural science there are topics which are not to be fully explained. Our sages laid down the rule. The Ma'ase Berashit must not be expounded in the presence of two. If an author were to explain these principles in writing, it would be equal to expounding them unto thousands of men. For this reason the prophets treat these subjects in figures, and our sages, imitating the method of scripture, speak of them in metaphors and allegories, because there is a close affinity between these subjects and metaphysics, and indeed they form part of its mysteries. Do not imagine that these most difficult problems can be thoroughly understood by any one of us. This is not the case. At times the truth shines so brightly that we perceive it as clear as day. Our nature and habit then draw a veil over our perception, and we return to a darkness almost as dense as before. We are like those who, though beholding frequent flashes of lightning, still find themselves in the thickest darkness of the night. On some the lightning flashes in rapid succession, and they seem to be in continuous light, and their night is as clear as the day. This was the degree of prophetic excellence attained by Moses, the greatest of the prophets, to whom God said, But as for thee, stand thou here by me. Deuteronomy 5.31 And of whom it is written, The skin of his face shone, etc. Exodus 34.29 some perceive the prophetic flash at long intervals. This is the degree of most prophets. By others only once during the whole night is a flash of lightning perceived. This is the case with those of whom we are informed. They prophesied and did not prophesy again. Numbers 11.25
There are some to whom the flashes of lightning appear with varying intervals. Others are in the condition of men whose darkness is illumined not by lightning, but by some kind of crystal or similar stone or other substances that possess the property of shining during the night, and to them even this small amount of light is not continuous, but now it shines and now it vanishes as if it were the flame of the rotating sword. The degrees in the perfection of men vary according to these distinctions. Concerning those who never beheld the light even for one day but walk in continual darkness, it is written, They know not, neither will they understand, they walk on in darkness. Psalms 82.5 Truth, in spite of all its powerful manifestations, is completely withheld from them, and the following words of Scripture may be applied to them. And now men see not the light which is bright in the skies. Job 37.21 They are the multitude of ordinary men. There is no need to notice them in this treatise. You must know that if a person who has attained a certain degree of perfection wishes to impart to others either orally or in writing any portion of the knowledge which he has acquired of these subjects, he is utterly unable to be as systematic and explicit as he could be in a science of which the method is well known. The same difficulties which he encountered when investigating the subject for himself will attend him when endeavoring to instruct others. Videlicet, at one time the explanation will appear lucid, at another time obscure. This property of the subject appears to remain the same both to the advanced scholar and to the beginner. For this reason great theological scholars gave instruction in all such matters only by means of metaphors and allegories. They frequently employed them in forms varying more or less essentially. In most cases they place the lesson to be illustrated at the beginning or in the middle or at the end of the simile, when they could find no simile which from beginning to end corresponded to the idea which was to be illustrated, they divided the subject of the lesson, although in itself one whole, into different parts, and expressed each by a separate figure. Still more obscure are those instances in which one simile is employed to illustrate many subjects, the beginning of the simile representing one thing, the end another. Sometimes the whole metaphor may refer to two cognate subjects in the same branch of knowledge. If we were to teach in these disciplines without the use of parables and figures, we should be compelled to resort to expressions both profound and transcendental, and by no means more intelligible than metaphors and similes, as though the wise and learned were drawn into this course by the divine will, in the same way as they are compelled to follow the laws of nature in matters relating to the body. You are no doubt aware that the Almighty, desiring to lead us to perfection and to improve our state of society, has revealed to us laws which are to regulate our actions. These laws, however, presuppose an advanced state of intellectual culture. We must first form a conception of the existence of the Creator according to our capabilities. That is, we must have knowledge of metaphysics. But this discipline can only be approached after the study of physics, for the science of physics borders on metaphysics, and must even precede it in the course of our studies, as is clear to all who are familiar with these questions. Therefore the Almighty commenced Holy Writ with a description of the creation, that is, with physical science the subject being on the one hand most weighty and important, and on the other hand our means of fully comprehending those great problems being limited. He described those profound truths which his divine wisdom found it necessary to communicate to us in allegorical, figurative, and metaphorical language. Our sages have said, Yemen Midrash, on Genesis 1.1, It is impossible to give a full account of the creation of man. Therefore, Scripture simply tells us, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1 Thus they have suggested that this subject is a deep mystery, and in the words of Solomon, far off and exceedingly deep. Who can find it out? Ecclesiastes 7.24 it has been treated in metaphors in order that the uneducated may comprehend it according to the measure of their faculties and the feebleness of their apprehension, while the educated persons may take it in a different sense. 
In our commentary on the Mishnah, we stated our intention to explain difficult problems in the book on prophecy and in the book on harmony. In the latter, we intended to examine all the passages in the Midrash, which, if taken literally, appear to be inconsistent with truth and common sense, and must therefore be taken figuratively. Many years have elapsed since I first commenced those works. I had proceeded but a short way when I became dissatisfied with my original plan for I observe that by expounding these passages by means of allegorical and mystical terms, we do not explain anything, but merely substitute one thing for another of the same nature, whilst in explaining them fully our efforts would displease most people, and my sole object in planning to write those books was to make the contents of Midrashim and the exoteric lessons of the prophecies intelligible to everybody. We have further noticed that when an ill-informed theologian reads these midrashim, he will find no difficulty. For possessing no knowledge of the properties of things, he will not reject statements which involve impossibilities. When, however, a person who is both religious and well-educated reads them, he cannot escape the following dilemma. Either he takes them literally and questions the abilities of the author and the soundness of his mind, doing thereby nothing which is opposed to the principles of our faith, or he will acquiesce in assuming that the passages in question have some secret meaning, and he will continue to hold the author in high estimation whether he understood the allegory or not. As regards prophecy in its various degrees and the different metaphors used in the prophetic books, we shall give in the present work an explanation according to a different method. Guided by these considerations, I have refrained from writing those two books as I had previously intended. In my larger work, the Mishnah Torah, I have contented myself with briefly stating the principles of our faith and its fundamental truths, together with such hints as approach a clear exposition. In this work, however, I address those who have studied philosophy and have acquired some knowledge, and who, while firm in religious matters, are perplexed and bewildered on account of the ambiguous and figurative expressions employed in the holy writings. Some chapters may be found in this work which contain no reference whatever to homonyms. Such chapters will serve as an introduction to others. They will contain some reference to the signification of a homonym which I do not wish to mention in that place, or explain some figure, point out that a certain expression is a figure, treat of difficult passages generally misunderstood in consequence of the homonymy they include, or because the simile they contain is taken in place of that which it represents, and vice versa. Having spoken of similes, I proceed to make the following remark. The key to the understanding and to the full comprehension of all that the prophets have said is found in the knowledge of the figures, their general ideas, and the meaning of each word they contain. You know the verse. I have also spoken in similes by the prophets. Hosea 12.10 And also the verse, Put forth a riddle and speak a parable. Ezekiel 17.2 and because the prophets continually employ figures, Ezekiel said, Does he not speak parables? 21.5 Again, Solomon begins his book of Proverbs with the words, To understand a proverb and figurative speech, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Proverbs 1.6 And we read in Midrash Shir Ha-Shirim Rabbah 1.1 to what were the words of the law to be compared before the time of Solomon? To a well the waters of which are at a great depth, and though cool and fresh, yet no man could drink of them. A clever man joined cord with cord, and rope with rope, and drew up and drank. So Solomon went from figure to figure, and from subject to subject, till he obtained the true sense of the law. So far go the words of our sages. I do not believe that any intelligent man thinks that the words of the law mentioned here as requiring the application of figures in order to be understood can refer to the rules for building tabernacles, for preparing the lulab, or for the four kinds of trustees. What is really meant is the apprehension of profound and difficult subjects concerning which our sages say, if a man loses in his house a sela or a pearl, he can find it by lighting a taper worth only one isar. Thus the parables in themselves are of no great value, but through them the words of the holy law are rendered intelligible.
These likewise are the words of our sages. Consider well their statement, that the deeper sense of the words of the holy law are pearls, and the literal acceptation of a figure is of no value in itself. They compare the hidden meaning included in the literal sense of the simile to a pearl lost in a dark room which is full of furniture. It is certain that the pearl is in the room, but the man can neither see it nor know where it lies. It is just as if the pearl were no longer in his possession, for as has been stated, it affords him no benefit whatever until he kindles a light. The same is the case with the comprehension of that which the simile represents. The wise king said, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in vessels of silver. Proverbs 25.2 Hear the explanation of what he said. The word maskeot, the Hebrew equivalent for vessels, denotes filigree network. Id est, things in which there are very small apertures, such as are frequently wrought by silversmiths. They are called in Hebrew maskeot, literally transpicuous, from the verb saka, he saw, a root which occurs also in the Targum of Onkelos, Genesis 26, 8, because the eye penetrates through them. Thus Solomon meant to say, just as apples of gold in silver filigree with small apertures, so is a word fitly spoken. See how beautifully the conditions of a good simile are described in this figure? It shows that in every word which has a double sense, a literal one and a figurative one, the plain meaning must be as valuable as silver, and the hidden meaning still more precious, so that the figurative meaning bears the same relation to the literal one as gold to silver. It is further necessary that the plain sense of the phrase shall give to those who consider it some notion of that which the figure represents. Just as a golden apple, overlaid with a network of silver when seen at a distance, or looked at superficially, is mistaken for a silver apple, but when a keen-sighted person looks at the object well, he will find what is within and see that the apple is gold. The same is the case with the figures employed by the prophets. Taken literally, such expressions contain wisdom useful for many purposes, among others, for the amelioration of the condition of society, exempla gratia, the Proverbs of Solomon, and similar sayings in their literal sense. Their hidden meaning, however, is profound wisdom, conducive to the recognition of real truth. No that the figures employed by prophets are of two kinds. First, where every word which occurs in the simile represents a certain idea, and secondly, where the simile as a whole represents a general idea, but has a great many points which have no reference whatever to that idea. They are simply required to give to the simile its proper form and order, or better to conceal the idea. The simile is therefore continued as far as necessary according to its literal sense. Consider this well. An example of the first class of prophetic figures is to be found in Genesis. And behold, a ladder set upon the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Genesis 28.12. The word ladder refers to one idea, set up on the earth to another, and the top of it reached to heaven to a third, angels of God to a fourth, ascending to a fifth, descending to a sixth, the Lord stood above it, verse 13, to a seventh. Every word in this figure introduces a fresh element into the idea represented by the figure. An example of the second class of prophetic figures is found in Proverbs 7, verses 6 to 26. For at the window of my house I looked through my casement, and beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, and behold there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn, her feet abide not in her house, now she is without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait in every corner. So she caught him, and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me, this day have I paid my vows, therefore came I forth to meet thee.
thee diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with striped cloths of the yarn of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves, for the good man is not at home. He is gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him, and will come at the day appointed. With her much fair speech she caused him to yield. With a flattering of her lips she forced him. He goeth after her straightway, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as fetters to the correction of a fool, till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. The general principle expounded in all these verses is to abstain from excessive indulgence in bodily pleasures. The author compares the body which is the source of all sensual pleasures to a married woman who at the same time is a harlot, and this figure he has taken as the basis of the entire book. We shall hereafter show the wisdom of Solomon in comparing sensual pleasures to an adulterous harlot. We shall explain how aptly he concludes that work with the praises of a faithful wife who devotes herself to the welfare of her husband and of her household. All obstacles which prevent man from attaining his highest aim in life, all the deficiencies in the character of man, all his evil propensities, are to be traced to the body alone. This will be explained later on. The predominant idea running throughout the figure is that man shall not be entirely guided by his animal or material nature, for the material substance of man is identical with that of the brute creation. An adequate explanation of the figure having been given, and its meaning having been shown, do not imagine that you will find in its application a corresponding element for each part of the figure. You must not ask what is meant by, I have peace offerings with me, verse 14, by, I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, verse 16, or what is added to the force of the figure by the observation, for the good man is not at home, verse 19, and so on to the end of the chapter. For all this is merely to complete the illustration of the metaphor in its literal meaning. The circumstances described here are such as are common to adulterers. Such conversations take place between all adulterous persons. You must well understand what I have said, for it is a principle of the utmost importance with respect to these things which I intend to expound. If you observe in one of the chapters that I explain the meaning of a certain figure and point it out to you its general scope, do not trouble yourself further in order to find an interpretation of each separate portion, for that would lead you to one of the two following erroneous courses. Either you will miss the sense included in the metaphor, or you will be induced to explain certain things which require no explanation and which are not introduced for that purpose. Through this unnecessary trouble you may fall into the great error which besets most modern sects in their foolish writings and discussions. They all endeavor to find some hidden meaning in expressions which were never uttered by the author in that sense. Your object should be to discover in most of the figures the general idea which the author wishes to express. In some instances it will be sufficient if you understand from my remarks that a certain expression contains a figure although I may offer no further comment. For when you know that it is not to be taken literally, you will understand at once to what subject it refers. My statement that it is a figurative expression will, as it were, remove the screen from between the object and the observer. Directions for the study of this work if you desire to grasp all that is contained in this book so that nothing shall escape your notice, consider the chapters in connected order. In studying each chapter, do not content yourself with comprehending its principal subject, but attend to every term mentioned therein, although it may seem to have no connection with the principal subject. For what I have written in this work was not the suggestion of the moment. It is the result of deep study and great application. 
Care has been taken that nothing that appeared doubtful should be left unexplained. Nothing of what is mentioned is out of place. Every mark will be found to illustrate the subject matter of the respective chapter. Do not read superficially, lest you do me an injury and derive no benefit for yourself. You must study thoroughly and read continually, for you will then find the solution of those important problems of religion which are a source of anxiety to all intelligent men. I adjure any reader of my book, in the name of the Most High, not to add any explanation even to a single word, nor to explain to another any portion of it except such passages as have been fully treated of by previous theological authorities. He must not teach others anything that he has learnt from my work alone, and that has not been hitherto discussed by any of our authorities. The reader must, moreover, beware of raising objections to any of my statements, because it is very probable that he may understand my words to mean the exact opposite to what I intended to say. He will injure me while I endeavoured to benefit him. He will requite me evil for good. Let the reader make a careful study of this work, and if his doubt be removed on even one point, let him praise his Maker and rest contented with the knowledge he has acquired. But if he derive from it no benefit whatever, he may consider the book as if it had never been written. Should he notice any opinions with which he does not agree, let him endeavour to find a suitable explanation, even if it seem far-fetched, in order that he may judge me charitably. Such a duty we owe to every one. We owe it especially to our scholars and theologians, who endeavour to teach us what is the truth according to the best of their ability. I feel assured that those of my readers who have not studied philosophy will still derive profit from many a chapter, but the thinker whose studies have brought him into collision with religion will, as I have already mentioned, derive much benefit from every chapter. How greatly will he rejoice! How agreeably will my words strike his ears! Those, however, whose minds are confused with false notions and perverse methods, who regard them as leading studies as sciences, and imagine themselves philosophers, though they have no knowledge that could truly be termed science, will object to many chapters and will find in them many insuperable difficulties because they do not understand their meaning, and because I expose therein the absurdity of their perverse notions which constitute their riches and peculiar your treasure stored up for their ruin. God knows that I hesitated very much before writing on the subjects contained in this work, since they are profound mysteries. They are topics which since the time of our captivity have not been treated by any of our scholars as far as we possess their writings. How then shall I now make a beginning and discuss them? But I rely on two precedents. First, to similar cases our sages applied the verse, It is time to do something in honour of the Lord, for they have made void thy law. Psalms 119.126 Secondly, they have said, Let all thy acts be guided by pure intentions. On these two principles I relied while composing some parts of this work. Lastly, when I have a difficult subject before me, when I find the road narrow, and can see no other way of teaching a well-established truth except by pleasing one intelligent man and displeasing ten thousand fools, I prefer to address myself to the one man, and to take no notice whatever of the condemnation of the multitude. I prefer to extricate the intelligent man from his embarrassment and show him the cause of his perplexity, so that he may attain perfection and be at peace. Introductory Remarks on Method There are seven causes of inconsistencies and contradictions to be met with in a literary work. The first cause arises from the fact that the author collects the opinions of various men, each differing from the other, but neglects to mention the name of the author of any particular opinion. In such a work, contradictions or inconsistencies must occur, since any two statements may belong to two different authors. Second cause. The author holds at first one opinion, which he subsequently rejects. In his work, however, both his original and altered views are retained. 
third cause. The passages in question are not all to be taken literally. Some only are to be understood in their literal sense, while in others figurative language is employed, which includes another meaning besides the literal one. Or, in the apparently inconsistent passages, figurative language is employed which, if taken literally, would seem to be contradictories or contraries. Fourth cause. The premises are not identical in both statements, but for certain reasons they are not fully stated in these passages, or two propositions with different subjects which are expressed by the same term without having the difference in meaning pointed out occur in two passages. The contradiction is therefore only apparent, but there is no contradiction in reality. The fifth cause is traceable to the use of a certain method adopted in teaching and expounding profound problems. Namely, a difficult and obscure theorem must sometimes be mentioned and assumed as known for the illustration of some elementary and intelligible subject which must be taught beforehand, the commencement being always made with the easier thing. The teacher must therefore facilitate, in any manner which he can devise, the explanation of those theorems which have to be assumed as known, and he must content himself with giving a general though somewhat inaccurate notion on the subject. It is for the present explained according to the capacity of the students that they may comprehend it as far as they are required to understand the subject. Later on, the same subject is thoroughly treated and fully developed in its right place. Sixth cause. The contradiction is not apparent, and only becomes evident through a series of premises. The larger the number of premises necessary to prove the contradiction between the two conclusions, the greater is the chance that it will escape detection, and that the author will not perceive his own inconsistency. Only when from each conclusion, by means of suitable premises, an inference is made, and from the enunciation thus inferred, by means of proper arguments, other conclusions are formed, and after that process has been repeated many times, then it becomes clear that the original conclusions are contradictories or contraries. Even able writers are liable to overlook such inconsistencies. If, however, the contradiction between the original statements can at once be discovered, and the author, while writing the second, does not think of the first, he evinces a greater deficiency, and his words deserve no notice whatever. Seventh Cause It is sometimes necessary to introduce such metaphysical matter as may partly be disclosed but must partly be concealed. While, therefore, on one occasion the object which the author has in view may demand that the metaphysical problem be treated as solved in one way, it may be convenient on another occasion to treat it as solved in the opposite way. The author must endeavor, by concealing the fact as much as possible, to prevent the uneducated reader from perceiving the contradiction. Inconsistencies occurring in the Mishnah and Bore Tot are traceable to the first cause. You meet frequently in the Gemara with passages like the following. Does not the beginning of the passage contradict the end? No, the beginning is the dictum of a certain rabbi, the end that of another. Or, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi approved of the opinion of a certain rabbi in one case and gave it therefore anonymously, and having accepted that of another rabbi in the other case, he introduced that view without naming the authority. Or, who is the author of this anonymous dictum? Rabbi A. Who is the author of that paragraph in the Mishnah? Rabbi B. Instances of this kind are innumerable. Apparent contradictions or differences occurring in the Gemara may be traced to the first cause and to the second as exempli gratia. In this particular case, he agrees with this rabbi, or he agrees with him in one point, but differs from him in another, or these two dicta are the opinions of two Amoraim who differ as regards the statement made by a certain rabbi. These are examples of contradictions traceable to the first cause. The following are instances which may be traced to the second cause. Rabbah altered his opinion on that point. It then becomes necessary to consider which of the two opinions came second. Again, in the first recension of the Talmud by Rabbi Ashi, he made one assertion, and in the second, a different one. The inconsistencies and contradictions met with in some passages of the prophetic books, if taken literally, 
are all traceable to the third or fourth cause, and it is exclusively in reference to this subject that I wrote the present introduction. You know that the following expression frequently occurs. One verse says this, another that, showing the contradiction and explaining that either some premise is wanting or the subject is altered. Compare. Solomon, it is not sufficient that thy words contradict thy father. They are themselves inconsistent, etc. Many similar instances occur in the writings of our sages. The passages in the prophetical books which our sages have explained mostly refer to religious or moral precepts. Our desire, however, is to discuss such passages as contain apparent contradictions in regard to the principles of our faith. I shall explain some of them in various chapters of the present work, for this subject also belongs to the secrets of the Torah. Contradictions traceable to the seventh cause occurring in the prophetical works require special investigation, and no one should express his opinion on that matter by reasoning and arguing without weighing the matter well in his mind. Inconsistencies in the writings of true philosophers are traceable to the fifth cause, contradictions occurring in the writings of most authors and commentators such as are not included in the above-mentioned works are due to the sixth cause. Many examples of this class of contradictions are found in the Midrash and the Agada. Hence the saying, we must not raise questions concerning the contradictions met with in the Agada. You may also notice in them contradictions due to the seventh cause. Any inconsistency discovered in the present work will be found to arise in consequence of the fifth cause or the seventh. Notice this, consider its truth, and remember it well, lest you misunderstand some of the chapters in this book. Having concluded these introductory remarks, I proceed to examine those expressions to the true meaning of which, as apparent from the context, it is necessary to direct your attention. This book will then be a key, admitting to places the gates of which would otherwise be closed. When the gates are opened and men enter, their souls will enjoy repose, their eyes will be gratified, and even their bodies, after all toil and labor, will be refreshed. End of the Introduction of the Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 1 of the Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Open ye the gate, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Isaiah 26, 2 Chapter 1 Some have been of the opinion that by the Hebrew tselem, the shape and figure of a thing, is to be understood, and this explanation led men to believe in the corporeality of the divine being. For they thought that the words let us make man in our tselem, Genesis 1.26, implied that God had the form of a human being. It est that he had figure and shape, and that consequently he was corporeal. They adhered faithfully to this view, and thought that if they were to relinquish it, they would eo ipso reject the truth of the Bible. And further, if they did not conceive God as having a body possessed of face and limbs similar to their own in appearance, they would have to deny even the existence of God. The sole difference which they admitted was that he excelled in greatness and splendor, and that his substance was not flesh and blood. Thus far went their conception of the greatness and glory of God. The incorporeality of the divine being, and his unity in the true sense of the word, for there is no real unity without incorporeality, will be fully proved in the course of the present treatise, Part 2, Chapter 1. In this chapter, it is our sole intention to explain the meaning of the words selam and demut, I hold that the Hebrew equivalent of form in the ordinary acceptation of the word, videlicit, the figure and shape of a thing, is to'ar. Thus we find, and Joseph was beautiful in to'ar, form, and beautiful in appearance. Genesis 39, 6. 
what form to ar is he of? 1 Samuel 28, 14. As the form to ar of the children of a king. Judges 8, 18. It is also applied to form produced by human labor, as he marketh its form to ar with a line, and he marketh its form to ar with a compass. Isaiah 44, 13. This term is not at all applicable to God. The term tselem, on the other hand, signifies a specific form, videlicet, that which constitutes the essence of a thing, whereby the thing is what it is, the reality of a thing, in so far as it is that particular being. In man, the form is that constituent which gives him human perception, and on account of this intellectual perception, the term tselem is employed in the sentences, In the tselem of God he created him. Genesis 1.27 It is therefore rightly said, Thou despisest their tselem. Psalms 63.20 The contempt can only concern the soul, the specific form of man, not the properties and shape of his body. I am also of opinion that the reason why this term is used for idols may be found in the circumstance that they are worshipped on account of some idea represented by them, not on account of their figure and shape. For the same reason the term is used in the expression the forms salme of your emirates, 1 Samuel 6, 5, for the chief object was the removal of the injury caused by the emirates, not a change of their shape. As, however, it must be admitted that the term salem is employed in these two cases, videlicet, the images of the emirates and the idols on account of the external shape, the term salem is either a homonym or a hybrid term and would denote both the specific form and the outward shape and similar properties relating to dimensions and the shape of material bodies. And in the phrase, let us make man in our tselem, Genesis 1.26, the term signifies the specific form of man, vide legit his intellectual perception and does not refer to his figure or shape. Thus we have shown the difference between tselem and to'ar, and explain the meaning of tselem. Demut is derived from the verb dama, he is like. This term likewise denotes agreement with regard to some abstract relation. Compare, I am like a pelican of the wilderness. Psalms 102.7 The author does not compare himself to the pelican in point of wings and feathers, but in point of sadness nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in beauty. Ezekiel 31, 8. The comparison refers to the idea of beauty. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. Psalm 58, 5. He is like unto a lion. Psalm 17, 12. The resemblance indicated in these passages does not refer to the figure and shape, but to some abstract idea. In the same manner is used the likeness of the throne, Ezekiel 1.26. The comparison is made with regard to greatness and glory, not, as many believe, with regard to its square form, its breadth, or the length of its legs. This explanation applies also to the phrase, the likeness of the hayot, living creatures, Ezekiel 1.13. As man's distinction consists in a property which no other creature on earth possesses, videlicet intellectual perception, in the exercise of which he does not employ his senses, nor move his hand or his foot, this perception has been compared, though only apparently, not in truth, to the divine perception, which requires no corporeal organ. On this account, it is on account of the divine intellect with which man has been endowed. He is said to have been made in the form and likeness of the Almighty, but far from it be the notion that the Supreme Being is corporeal, having a material form. End of Part 1, Chapter 1
Part 1, Chapter 2 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 Some years ago a learned man asked me a question of great importance. The problem and the solution which we gave in our reply deserve the closest attention. Before, however, entering upon this problem and its solution, I must premise that every Hebrew knows that the term Elohim is a homonym and denotes God, angels, judges, and the rulers of countries, and that Onkelos, the proselyte, explained it in the true and correct manner by taking Elohim in the sentence, And ye shall be like Elohim, Genesis 3, 5, in the last mentioned meaning, and rendering the sentence, And ye shall be like princes. Having pointed out the homonymity of the term Elohim, we return to the question under consideration. It would at first sight, said the objector, appear from Scripture that man was originally intended to be perfectly equal to the rest of the animal creation, which is not endowed with intellect, reason, or power of distinguishing between good and evil, but that Adam's disobedience to the command of God procured him that great perfection, which is the peculiarity of man, vide licet, the power of distinguishing between good and evil, the noblest of all the faculties of our nature, the essential characteristic of the human race. It thus appears strange that the punishment for rebelliousness should be the means of elevating man to a pinnacle of perfection to which he had not attained previously. This is equivalent to saying that a certain man was rebellious and extremely wicked, wherefore his nature was changed for the better, and he was made to shine as a star in the heavens. Such was the purport and subject of the question, though not in the exact words of the inquirer. Now mark our reply, which was as follows. You appear to have studied the matter superficially, and nevertheless you imagine that you can understand a book which has been the guide of past and present generations, when you for a moment withdraw from your lusts and appetites and glance over its contents as if you were reading a historical work or some poetical composition. Collect your thoughts and examine the matter carefully, for it is not to be understood as you at first sight think, but as you will find after due deliberation, namely, the intellect which was granted to man as the highest endowment was bestowed on him before his disobedience. With reference to this gift, the Bible states that man was created in the form and likeness of God. On account of this gift of intellect, man was addressed by God and received his commandments, as it is said, And the Lord commanded Adam. Genesis 2.16 For no commandments are given to the brute creation or to those who are devoid of understanding. Through the intellect man distinguishes between the true and the false. This faculty Adam possessed perfectly and completely. The right and the wrong are terms employed in the science of apparent truths, morals, not in that of necessary truths. As exempli gratia, it is not correct to say in reference to the proposition, the heavens are spherical, it is good, or to declare the assertion that the earth is flat to be bad. We say of the one it is true, of the other it is false. Similarly, our language expresses the idea of true and false by the terms emet and sheker, of the morally right and the morally wrong by tob and ra. Thus it is the function of the intellect to discriminate between the true and the false, a distinction which is applicable to all objects of intellectual perception. When Adam was yet in a state of innocence and was guided solely by reflection and reason, on account of which it is said, Thou hast made him, man, little lower than the angels. Psalms 8, 6. He was not at all able to follow or to understand the principles of apparent truths. The most manifest impropriety, vide licet, to appear in a state of nudity, was nothing unbecoming according to his idea. He could not comprehend why it should be so. After man's disobedience, however, when he began to give way to desires which had their source in his imagination and to the gratification of his bodily appetites, as it is said, and the wife saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to the eyes, Genesis 3, 6, he was punished by the loss of part of that intellectual faculty which he had previously possessed. He therefore transgressed a command with which he had been charged on the score of his reason, 
and having obtained a knowledge of the apparent truths, he was wholly absorbed in the study of what is proper and what improper. Then he fully understood the magnitude of the loss he had sustained, what he had forfeited, and in what situation he was thereby placed. Hence we read, And ye shall be like Elohim, knowing good and evil, and not knowing or discerning the true and the false. While in necessary truths we can only apply the words true and false, not good and evil. Further, observe the passage, and the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked. Genesis 3, 7. It is not said, and the eyes of both were opened, and they saw, for what the man had previously, and what he saw after the circumstance, was precisely the same. There had been no blindness, which was now removed, but he received a new faculty, whereby he found things wrong, which previously he had not regarded as wrong. Besides, you must know that the Hebrew word pakah, used in this passage, is exclusively employed in the figurative sense of receiving new sources of knowledge, not in that of regaining the sense of sight. Compare, God opened her eyes, Genesis 11.19. Then shall the eyes of the blind be open, Isaiah 38, 8. Open ears, he heareth not, Ibid, 42, 20. Similar in sense to the verse, which have eyes to see, and see not, Ezekiel 12, 2. When, however, scripture says of Adam, he changed his face, Panav, and thou sentest him forth, Job 14, 20, it must be understood in the following way. On account of the change of his original aim, he was sent away. For panim, the Hebrew equivalent of face, is derived from the verb pana, he turned, and signifies also aim, because man generally turns his face towards the thing he desires. In accordance with this interpretation, our text suggests that Adam, as he altered his intention and directed his thoughts to the acquisition of what he was forbidden, he was banished from paradise. This was his punishment. It was measure for measure. At first he had the privilege of tasting pleasure and happiness, and of enjoying repose and security. But as his appetites grew stronger, and he followed his desires and impulses, as we have already stated above, and partook, of the food he was forbidden to taste, he was deprived of everything, was doomed to subsist on the meanest kind of food, such as he had never tasted before, and this even only after exertion and labor, as it is said, thorns and thistles shall grow up for thee, Genesis 3.18 by the sweat of thy brow, etc. And in explanation of this, the text continues, And the Lord God drove him from the garden of Eden to till the ground whence he was taken. He was now, with respect to food and many other requirements, brought to the level of the lower animals. Compare, Thou shalt eat the grass of the field. Genesis 3.18 Reflecting on his condition, the psalmist says, Adam, unable to dwell in dignity, was brought to the level of the dumb beast. Psalms 49.13 May the Almighty be praised, whose design and wisdom cannot be fathomed. End of Part 1, Chapter 2 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 3 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 it might be thought that the Hebrew words tamuna and tabnit have one and the same meaning, but this is not the case. Tabnit, derived from the verb banna, he built, signifies the build and construction of a thing, that is to say its figure, whether square, round, triangular, or any other shape. Compare the pattern, tabnit, of the tabernacle, and the pattern, tabnit, of all its vessels, Exodus 25, 9, according to the pattern, tabnit, which thou wast shown upon the mount, Exodus 25, 40, the form of any bird, Deuteronomy 4, 17, the form, tabnit, of a hand, Ezekiel 8, 3, the pattern, tabnit, of the porch, First Chronicles 28, 11. 
In all these quotations, it is the shape which is referred to. Therefore, the Hebrew language never employs the word tabnit in speaking of the qualities of God Almighty. The term tamuna, on the other hand, is used in the Bible in three different senses. It signifies first the outlines of things which are perceived by our bodily senses. It est their shape and form as exempli gratia. And ye make an image, the form, tamunat, of some likeness. Deuteronomy 4.16 For ye saw no likeness, tamuna. Deuteronomy 4.15 Secondly, the forms of our imagination, id est the impressions retained in imagination when the objects have ceased to affect our senses. In this sense, it is used in the passage which begins, in thoughts from the visions of the night, Job 4.13, and which concludes, it remained but I could not recognize its sight, only an image, Tamuna was before my eyes. Id est an image which presented itself to my sight during sleep. Thirdly, the true form of an object which is perceived only by the intellect. And it is in this third signification that the term is applied to God. The words and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Numbers 12, 8. Therefore mean he shall comprehend the true essence of the Lord. End of Part 1, Chapter 3。Part 1, Chapter 4 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Chapter 4 the three verbs ra'a, hebit, and haza, which denote he perceived with the eye, are also used figuratively in the sense of intellectual perception. As regards the first of these verbs, this is well known, exempli gratia. And he looked, the yar, and behold, a well in the field. Genesis 29, 2. Here it signifies ocular perception. Yea, my heart has seen, ra'a, much of wisdom and of knowledge. Ecclesiastes 1.16 In this passage it refers to the intellectual perception. In this figurative sense the verb is to be understood when applied to God. Exempli gratia. I saw, ra'iti, the Lord. 1 Kings 22.19 and the Lord appeared va yira, unto him. Genesis 18.1 And God saw va yar, that it was good. Genesis 1.10 I beseech thee, show me harani thy glory. Exodus 33.18 and they saw va Yeruh, the God of Israel, Exodus 24.10. All these instances refer to intellectual perception, and by no means to perception with the eye as in its literal meaning. For, on the one hand, the eye can only perceive a corporeal object and in connection with it certain accidents as color, shape, etc., and on the other hand, God does not perceive by means of a corporeal organ, as will be explained. In the same manner, the Hebrew hebit signifies he viewed with the eye. Compare, look, tabit, not behind thee, Genesis 19.17. But his wife looked, vatabet, back from him, Genesis 19.26. And if one look, venibet, unto the land, Isaiah 5.30. And, figuratively, to view and observe with the intellect, to contemplate a thing till it be understood. In this sense, the verb is used in passages like the following. He hath not beheld hibbit iniquity in Jacob. Numbers 23.21 For iniquity cannot be seen with the eye. The words, and they looked vehibitu after Moses. Exodus 33.8 in addition to the literal understanding of the phrase, were explained by our sages in a figurative sense. According to them, these words mean that the Israelites examined and criticized the actions and sayings of Moses. Compare also, contemplate, habet, I pray thee, the heaven. Genesis 15, 5. For this took place in a prophetic vision. This verb, when applied to God, is employed in this figurative sense, exempli gratia, to look, mehabit, upon God, Exodus 3, 6, 
and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Yebit Numbers 12, 8. And thou canst not look, habet, on iniquity. Habakkuk 1, 13. The same explanation applies to Chaza. It denotes to view with the eye, as, and let our eye look, vatahaz upon Zion, Micah 4, 2, and also figuratively to perceive mentally, which he saw Chaza concerning Judah and Jerusalem, Isaiah 1, 1. The word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, Mahaze, Genesis 15.1. In this sense, Chaza is used in the phrase, Also they saw, Va'yachetzu, God, Exodus 24.2. Note this well. End of part one, chapter four. Part 1, Chapter 5 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 When the chief of philosophers, Aristotle, was about to inquire into some very profound subjects and to establish his theory by proofs, he commenced his treatise with an apology and requested the reader to attribute the author's inquiries not to presumption, vanity, egotism, or arrogance, as though he were interfering with things of which he had no knowledge, but rather to his zeal and his desire to discover and establish true doctrines as far as lay in human power. We take the same position, and think that a man, when he commences to speculate, ought not to embark at once on a subject so vast and important. He should previously adapt himself to the study of the several branches of science and knowledge, should most thoroughly refine his moral character and subdue his passions and desires, the offspring of his imagination, when, in addition, he has obtained a knowledge of the true fundamental propositions, a comprehension of the several methods of inference and proof and the capacity of guarding against fallacies, then he may approach the investigation of this subject. He must, however, not decide any question by the first idea that suggests itself to his mind, or at once direct his thoughts and force them to obtain a knowledge of the Creator, but he must wait modestly and patiently and advance step by step. In this sense we must understand the words, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Exodus 3, 6. Though retaining also the literal meaning of the passage that Moses was afraid to gaze at the light which appeared to his eyes, but it must on no account be assumed that the being which is exalted far above every imperfection can be perceived by the eye. This act of Moses was highly commended by God, and he bestowed on him a well-deserved portion of his goodness, as it is said, And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Numbers 12, 8. This, say our sages, was the reward for having previously hidden his face, lest he should gaze at the Eternal. Babylonian Talmud, Tractate Barakot. But the nobles of the children of Israel were impetuous and allowed their thoughts to go unrestrained. What they perceived was but imperfect. Therefore it is said of them, And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, etc. Exodus 24.10 And not merely, And they saw the God of Israel. The purpose of the whole passage is to criticize their act of seeing, and not to describe it. They are blamed for the nature of their perception, which was to a certain extent corporeal, a result which necessarily followed from the fact that they ventured too far before being perfectly prepared. They deserved to perish, but at the intercession of Moses this fate was averted by God for the time. They were afterwards burnt at Tabara except Nadab and Abihu, who were burnt in the tabernacle of the congregation, according to what is stated by authentic tradition, Midrash Rabbah ad -Lukum. If such was the case with them, how much more is it incumbent on us, who are inferior, and on those who are below us, to persevere in perfecting our knowledge of the elements, and in rightly understanding the preliminaries which purify the mind from the defilement of error. Then we may enter the holy and divine camp in order to gaze, as the Bible says, and let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. Exodus 19.22 
Solomon also had cautioned all who endeavor to attain this high degree of knowledge in the following figurative terms. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. Ecclesiastes 4.17 I will now return to complete what I commenced to explain. The nobles of the children of Israel, besides erring in their perception, were through this cause also misled in their actions, for in consequence of their confused perception they gave way to bodily cravings. This is meant by the words, also they saw God, and did eat and drink. Exodus 24.11 The principal part of that passage, vide licet, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. Exodus 24.10 will be further explained in the course of the present treatise in chapter 28. All we here intend to say is that wherever in a similar connection any one of the three verbs mentioned above occurs, it has reference to intellectual perception, not to the sensation of sight by the eye. For God is not a being to be perceived by the eye. It will do no harm, however, if those who are unable to comprehend what we here endeavor to explain should refer all the words in question to sensuous perception, to seeing lights created for the purpose, angels, or similar beings. End of Part 1, Chapter 5Part 1, Chapter 6 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 The two Hebrew nouns Ish and Isha were originally employed to designate the male and female of human beings, but were afterwards applied to the male and female of the other species of the animal creation. For instance, we read, Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, Ish ve Ishto, Genesis 7-2, in the same sense as Ish ve Isha male and female. The term zakar ve nekaba was afterwards applied to anything designed and prepared for union with another object. Thus we read, the five curtains shall be coupled together, one isha to the other, a chuta, Exodus 26, 3. It will easily be seen that the Hebrew equivalents for brother and sister are likewise treated as homonyms and used in a figurative sense, like ish and isha. End of Part 1, Chapter 6 Part 1, Chapter 7 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 It is well known that the verb yelad means to bear. They have borne va yeledu him children. Deuteronomy 21.15 the word was next used in a figurative sense with reference to various objects in nature, meaning to create, exempli gratia. Before the mountains were created, Yuladu, Psalms 92. Also to produce, in reference to that which the earth causes to come forth, as if by birth, exempli gratia. He will cause her to bear holida and bring forth, Isaiah 55.10. The verb further denotes to bring forth, said of changes in the process of time, as though they were things which were born, exempli gratia, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth, yeled, Proverbs 27, 1. Another figurative use of the word is its application to the formation of thoughts and ideas, or of opinions resulting from them. Compare, and brought forth, the yeled, falsehoods psalms 714 also and they please themselves in the children yelde of strangers isaiah 2 6 id est they delight in the opinions of strangers jonathan the son of ozael paraphrases this passage they walk in the customs of other nations a man who has instructed another in any subject and has improved his knowledge may, in like manner, be regarded as the parent of the person taught, because he is the author of that knowledge, and thus the pupils of the prophets are called sons of the prophets, as I shall explain when treating of the homonymity of ben, son. In this figurative sense, the verb yelad 
to bear is employed when it is said of Adam, and Adam lived an hundred and thirty years, and begat Vayulid a son in his own likeness in his form. Genesis 5 3. As regards the words, the form of Adam and his likeness, we have already stated in chapter 1 their meaning. Those sons of Adam who were born before that time were not human in the true sense of the word. They had not the form of man. With reference to Seth, who had been instructed, enlightened, and brought to human perfection, it could rightly be said, he, Adam, begat a son in his likeness, in his form. It is acknowledged that a man who does not possess this form, the nature of which has just been explained, is not human, but a mere animal in human shape and form. Yet such a creature has the power of causing harm and injury, a power which does not belong to other creatures. For those gifts of intelligence and judgment with which he has been endowed for the purpose of acquiring perfection, but which he has failed to apply to their proper aim, are used by him for wicked and mischievous ends. He begets evil things as though he merely resembled man or simulated his outward appearance. Such was the condition of those sons of Adam who preceded Seth. In reference to this subject, the Midrash says, during the 130 years when Adam was under rebuke, he begat spirits, id es demons. When, however, he was again restored to divine favor, he begat in his likeness, in his form. This is the sense of the passage, Adam lived 130 years, and he begat in his likeness, in his form. Genesis 5.3 End of Part 1, Chapter 7「Part 1, Chapter 8 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Originally the Hebrew term makam, place, applied both to a particular spot and to space in general. Subsequently, it received a wider signification and denoted position or degree as regards the perfection of man in certain things. We say, exempli gratia, this man occupies a certain place in such and such a subject. In this sense, this term, as is well known, is frequently used by authors. Exempli gratia, he fills his ancestor's place, makam, in point of wisdom and piety. The dispute still remains in its place, makam, id est in status quo ante. In the verse, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place, mekomo, Ezekiel 3.12, makam has this figurative meaning and the verse may be paraphrased, Blessed be the Lord according to the exalted nature of his existence. And wherever makam is applied to God, it expresses the same idea, namely, the distinguished position of his existence to which nothing is equal or comparable, as will be shown below, chapter 56. It should be observed that when we treat in this work of any homonym, we do not desire you to confine yourself to that which is stated in that particular chapter, but we open for you a portal and direct your attention to those significations of the word which are suited to our purpose, though they may not be complete from a philological point of view. You should examine the prophetical books and other works composed by men of science, notice the meaning of every word which occurs in them, and take homonyms in that sense which is in harmony with the context. What I say in a particular passage is a key for the comprehension of all similar passages. For example, we have explained here makam in the sentence, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place, mekomo. But you must understand that the word makam has the same signification in the passage, Behold, a place, makam, is with me. Exodus 33.26 Vide licet, a certain degree of contemplation and intellectual intuition, not of ocular inspection, in addition to its literal meaning, a place, vide licet, the mountain which was pointed out to Moses for seclusion and for the attainment of perfection. End of Part 1, Chapter 8 Part 1, Chapter 9 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 The original meaning of the word kissa, throne, requires no comment, since men of greatness and authority, as exempli gratia kings, use the throne as a seat, and the throne thus indicates the rank, dignity, and position of the person for whom it is made, the sanctuary has been styled the throne, inasmuch as it likewise indicates the superiority of him who manifests himself and causes his light and glory to dwell therein. Compare, a glorious throne on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. Jeremiah 17.12 For the same reason the heavens are called throne. For to the mind of him who observes them with intelligence, they suggest the omnipotence of the being which has called them into existence, regulates their motions, and governs the sublunary world by their beneficial influence. As we read, Thus saith the Lord, The heavens are my throne, and the earth my footstool. Isaiah 66, 1. It is, they testify to my existence, my essence, and my omnipotence, as the throne testifies to the greatness of him who is worthy to occupy it. This is the idea which true believers should entertain, not, however, that the omnipotent supreme God is supported by any material object, for God is incorporeal, as we shall prove further on. How, then, can he be said to occupy any space or rest on a body? The fact which I wish to point out is this. Every place distinguished by the Almighty and chosen to receive his light and splendor, as, for instance, the sanctuary or the heavens, is termed throne, and taken in a wider sense as in the passage, For my hand is upon the throne of God. Exodus 17:16. The throne denotes here the essence and greatness of God. These, however, the essence and greatness of God, need not be considered as something separate from the God himself or as part of the creation, so that God would appear to have existed both without the throne and with the throne. Such a belief would be undoubtedly heretical. It is distinctly stated that, Thou, O Lord, remainest forever, thy throne from generation to generation. Lamentations 5.19 By thy throne we must therefore understand something inseparable from God. On that account, both here and in all similar passages, the word the throne denotes God's greatness and essence, which are inseparable from his being. Our opinion will be further elucidated in the course of this treatise. End of chapter 9。Part 1, Chapter 10 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10. We have already remarked that when we treat in this work of homonyms, we have not the intention to exhaust the meanings of a word, for this is not a philological treatise. We shall mention no other significations but those which bear on our subject. We shall thus proceed in our treatment of the terms Ala and Yarad. These two words, Ala, he went up, and Yarad, he went down, are Hebrew terms used in the sense of ascending and descending. When a body moves from a higher to a lower place, the verb Yarad, to go down, is used. When it moves from a lower to a higher place, Ala, to go up, is applied. These two verbs were afterwards employed with regards to greatness and power. When a man falls from his high position, we say, he has come down, and when he rises in station, he has gone up. Thus the Almighty says, The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. Deuteronomy 28.43 Again, the Lord thy God will set thee on high, Elion, above all nations of the earth. Deuteronomy 28, 1. And the Lord magnified Solomon exceedingly. Le Ma'alla. 1 Chronicles 29, 25. The sages often employ these expressions as, in holy matters men must ascend, Ma'alin, and not descend, Moridin. The two words are also applied to intellectual processes, namely, when we reflect on something beneath ourselves we are said to go down, and when our attention is raised to a subject above us, we are said to rise. Now, 
We occupy a lowly position, both in space and rank in comparison with the heavenly sphere, and the Almighty is most high not in space, but with respect to absolute existence, greatness, and power. When it pleased the Almighty to grant to a human being a certain degree of wisdom or prophetic inspiration, the divine communication thus made to the prophet and the entrance of the divine presence into a certain place is termed Yerida, descending, while the termination of the prophetic communication or the departure of the divine glory from a place is called Aliyah, ascending. The expressions to go up and to go down, when used in reference to God, must be interpreted in this sense. Again, when in accordance with the divine will some misfortune befalls a nation or region of the earth, and when the biblical account of that misfortune is preceded by the statement that the Almighty visited the actions of the people and that he punished them accordingly, then the prophetic author employs the term to descend. For man is so low and insignificant that his actions would not be visited and would not bring punishment on him were it not for the divine will. As is clearly stated in the Bible with regard to this idea, What is man that thou shouldst remember him, and the son of man that thou shouldst visit him? Psalms 8, 5. The design of the deity to punish man is, therefore, introduced by the verb to descend. Compare. Go to, let us go down, and therefore confound their language. Genesis 11, 7. And the Lord came down to see. Genesis 11, 5. I will go down now and see. Genesis 18, 21. All these instances convey the idea that man here below is going to be punished. More numerous, however, are the instances of the first case, vide licet, in which these verbs are used in connection with the revelation of the word and of the glory of God, exemple gratia, and I will come down and talk with thee there, Numbers 11.17, and the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, Exodus 19.20, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people, Exodus 19.11, and God went up from him, Genesis 35, 13. And God went up from Abraham. Genesis 17, 22. When, on the other hand, it says, And Moses went up unto God. Exodus 19, 3. It must be taken in the third signification of these verbs. In addition to its literal meaning that Moses also ascended to the top of the mount upon which a certain material light, the manifestation of God's glory, was visible. But we must not imagine that the Supreme Being occupies a place to which we can ascend or from which we can descend. He is far from what the ignorant imagine. End of chapter 10part 1 chapter 11 of the guide for the perplexed by moses maimonides this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 11 the primary meaning of the hebrew yeshab is he was seated as now eli the priest sat yeshab upon a seat 1 samuel 1 9 but since a person can best remain motionless and at rest when sitting, the term was applied to everything that is permanent and unchanging. Thus, in the promise that Jerusalem should remain constantly and permanently in an exalted condition, it is stated, She will rise and sit in her place. Zechariah 14.10 Further, he maketh the woman who was childless to sit as a joyful mother of children. Psalms 113.9 it est he makes her happy condition to be permanent and enduring. When applied to God, the verb is to be taken in that latter sense. Thou, O Lord, remainest, Teshub, for ever. Lamentations 5.19 O thou who sittest, ha Yoshebi in the heavens. Psalms 1.23.1 He who sitteth in the heavens, 2.4 
It est he who is everlasting, constant, and in no way subject to change, immutable in his essence, and as he consists of naught but his essence, he is mutable in no way whatever, not mutable in his relation to other things, for there is no relation whatever existing between him and any other being, as will be explained below, and therefore no change as regards such relations can take place in him. Hence he is immutable in every respect, as he expressly declares, I, the Lord, do not change. Malachi 3.6 It est in me there is not any change whatever. This idea is expressed by the term yeshub when referring to God. The verb, when employed of God, is frequently complemented by the heavens, inasmuch as the heavens are without change or mutation. That is to say, they do not individually change as the individual beings on earth by transition from existence into non-existence. The verb is also employed in descriptions of God's relation. The term relation is here used as a homonym to existing species of evanescent things. For those species are as constant, well-organized, and unvarying as the individuals of the heavenly hosts. Thus we find who sitteth over the circle of the earth, Isaiah 40.22, who remains constantly and unremittingly over the sphere of the earth, that is to say, over the things that come into existence within that sphere. Again, the Lord sitteth upon the flood, Psalms 29.10. It is, despite the change and variation of earthly objects, no change takes place with respect to God's relation to the earth. His relation to each of the things which come into existence and perish again is stable and constant, for it concerns only the existing species and not the individuals. It should therefore be borne in mind that whenever the term sitting is applied to God, it is used in this sense. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12. The term calm, he rose, is a homonym. In one of its significations, it is the opposite of to sit, as he did not rise, calm, nor move for him. Esther 5.9. It further denotes the confirmation and verification of a thing. Exempli gratia. The Lord will verify Yaakim, his promise. 1 Samuel 1.23. The field of Ephron was made sure, va Yaakim, as the property of Abraham. Genesis 23.17. The house that is in the walled city shall be established, ve kam. Leviticus 25.30. And the kingdom of Israel shall be firmly established, ve kamab. In thy hands, First Samuel twenty four twenty. It is always in this sense that the verb is employed with reference to the Almighty, as Now shall I rise, Akum, saith the Lord, Psalms twelve seven, which is the same as saying, Now shall I verify my word and my dispensation for good or evil. Thou shalt arise, Takum, and have mercy upon Zion, Psalms one hundred two thirteen which means thou wilt establish what thou hast promised, videlicet, that thou wouldst pity Zion. Generally, a person who resolves to set about a matter accompanies his resolve by rising. Hence, the verb is employed to express to resolve, to do a certain thing, as that my son hath stirred up my servant against me. 1 Samuel 22, 8. The word is figuratively used to signify the execution of a divine decree against a people sentenced to extermination, as, And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam, Amos 7, 9, but he will arise against the house of the evil doers, Isaiah 31, 2. Possibly in Psalms 12, 7 the verb has this latter sense, as also in Psalms 102, 13, namely, Thou wilt rise up against her enemies. There are many passages to be interpreted in this manner, but in no way should it be understood that he rises or sits. Far be such a notion. Our sages express this idea in the formula, 
In the world above there is neither sitting nor standing, Amida, for the two verbs Ahmad and Qam are synonyms, and what is said about the former is also applicable to the latter. End of chapter 12 Part 1, Chapter 13 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13. The term Ahmad, he stood, is a homonym signifying in the first instance to stand upright, as when he stood before Pharaoh, Genesis 41, 46. Though Moses and Samuel stood, Ya'amud, Jeremiah 15, 1. He stood by them. Genesis 18.8 It further denotes cessation and interruption, as, But they stood still, Amedu, and answered no more. Job 32.16 And she ceased, Va ta'amud, to bear. Genesis 29.35 Next it signifies to be enduring and lasting, as, That they may continue, Yo'amadu, many days, Jeremiah thirty two fourteen. Then shalt thou be able to endure, Amud, Exodus eighteen twenty three. His taste remained, Amud, in him, Jeremiah forty eight eleven. It est, it has continued and remained in existence without any change. His righteousness standeth for ever, Psalms one eleven three. It est is permanent and everlasting. The verb applied to God must be understood in this latter sense, as in Zechariah 14.4, And his feet shall stand, ve'amedu, in that day upon the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14.4. His causes, it is the events of which he is the cause, will remain efficient, etc. This will be further elucidated when we speak of the meaning of regal, foot, Vide Infra, chapter 28. In the same sense is this verb employed in Deuteronomy 5.28, But as for thee, stand thou here by me, and Deuteronomy 5.5, 5, I stood between the Lord and you. End of chapter 13. Part 1, Chapter 14 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14. The homonymous term Adam is in the first place the name of the first man, being, as scripture indicates, derived from Adama, earth. Next it means mankind, as my spirit shall not strive with man, Adam, Genesis 6, 3. Again, who knoweth the spirit of the children of man, Adam, Ecclesiastes 3.21. So that a man, Adam, has no preeminence above a beast, Ecclesiastes 3.19. Adam signifies also the multitude, the lower classes as opposed to those distinguished from the rest, as both low, bene Adam, and high, bene ish, Psalms 49.3. It is in this third signification that it occurs in the verses, The sons of the higher order, Elohim, saw the daughters of the lower order, Adam, Genesis 6, 2, and, Forsooth, as the humble man, Adam, you shall die, Psalms 82, 7. End of chapter 14. Part 1, Chapter 15 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 Although the two roots, Natsub and Yetzub, are distinct, yet their meaning is, as you know, identical in all their various forms. The verb has several meanings. In some instances it signifies to stand or to place oneself, as, and his sister stood, Vatetetzub far off, Exodus 2, 4. The kings of the earth set themselves, yit yitzebu, Psalms 2, 2. They came out and stood, nitzabim, Numbers sixteen twenty seven. In other instances it denotes continuance and permanence, as, thy word is established, nitzab, in heaven, Psalms one nineteen eighty nine. 
id est, it remains forever. Whenever this term is applied to God, it must be understood in the latter sense, as, and behold, the Lord stood, nitzab, upon it. Genesis 28, 13. It est, appeared as eternal and everlasting upon it, namely upon the ladder, the upper end of which reached to heaven, while the lower end touched the earth. This ladder all may climb up who wish to do so, and they must ultimately attain to a knowledge of him who is above the summit of the ladder, because he remains upon it permanently. It must be well understood that the term upon it is employed by me in harmony with this metaphor. Angels of God who were going up represent the prophets. That the term angel was applied to prophets may clearly be seen in the following passages. He sent an angel, Numbers 20:16. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim. Judges 2, 1. How suggestive, too, is the expression ascending and descending on it. The ascent is mentioned before the descent, inasmuch as the ascending and arriving at a certain height of the ladder precedes the descending. It is the application of the knowledge acquired in the ascent for the training and instruction of mankind. This application is termed descent in accordance with our explanation of the term Yarad, chapter 10. To return to our subject, the phrase stood upon it indicates the permanence and constancy of God and does not imply the idea of physical position. This is also the sense of the phrase, Thou shalt stand upon the rock, Exodus 33:21. It is therefore clear that Nitzab and Ahmad are identical in this figurative signification. Compare, Behold, I will stand, Omed, before thee there, upon the rock in Horeb. Exodus 17.6 End of chapter 15Part 1, Chapter 16 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 The word sur, rock, is a homonym. First, it denotes rock as, And thou shalt smite the rock, tsur, Exodus 17.6. Then, hard stone, like the flint, exempli gratia, knives of stone, tsurim, Joshua 5.2. It is next employed to signify the quarry from which the stones are hewn. Compare, look unto the rock, Tzur, whence ye are hewn, Isaiah 51, 1. From this latter meaning of the term, another figurative notion was subsequently derived, vide licet, the root and origin of all things. It is on this account that after the words, look to the rock whence ye are hewn, the prophet continues, Look unto Abraham your father, from which we evidently may infer that the words Abraham your father serve to explain the rock whence ye are hewn, and that the prophet meant to say, Walk in his ways, put faith in his instruction, and conduct yourselves according to the rule of his life. For the properties contained in the quarry should be found again in those things which are formed and hewn out of it. It is in the latter sense that the Almighty is called rock he being the origin and causa efficiens of all things besides himself. Thus we read, He is the rock, his work is perfect. Deuteronomy 32.4 Of the rock that begat thee thou art unmindful. Deuteronomy 32.18 Their rock had sold them. 31.30 There is no rock like our God. 1 Samuel 2.2 2. The rock of eternity. Isaiah 26, 4. Again, and thou shalt stand upon the rock. Exodus 33, 21. It est, be firm and steadfast in the conviction that God is the source of all things, for this will lead you towards the knowledge of the divine being. We have shown, chapter 8, that the words, Behold, a place is with me, Exodus 33, 21, contain the same idea. End of chapter 16. Part 1, Chapter 17 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 Do not imagine that metaphysics should be taught with reserve to the common people and to the uninitiated, for the same is also the case with the greater part of natural science. 
In this sense we have repeatedly made use of the expression of the sages, do not expound the chapter on the creation in the presence of two. Vide Introduction, page 2. This principle was not peculiar to our sages. Ancient philosophers and scholars of other nations were likewise wont to treat of the Principia Rerum obscurely, and to use figurative language in discussing such objects. Thus Plato and his predecessors called substance the female, and form the male. You are aware that the Principia of all existing transient things are three, vide lucet, substance form, and absence of a particular form. The last-named principle is always inherent in the substance, for otherwise the substance would be incapable of receiving a new form. And it is from this point of view that absence of a particular form is included among the Principia. As soon, then, as a substance has received a certain form, the privation of that form, namely, of that which has just been received, has ceased, and is replaced by the privation of another form, and so on with all possible forms, as is explained in treatises on natural philosophy. Now, if those philosophers who have nothing to fear from a lucid explanation of these metaphysical subjects still were in the habit of discussing them in figures and metaphors, how much more should we, having the interest of religion at heart, refrain from elucidating to the mass any subject that is beyond their comprehension or that might be taken in a sense directly opposite to the one intended? This also deserves attention. End of chapter 17「Part 1, Chapter 18 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18. The three words, Qarab, to come near, Naga, to touch, and Nagash, to approach, sometimes signify contact or nearness in space, sometimes the approach of man's knowledge to an object, as if it resembled the physical approach of one body to another. As to the use of karab in the first meaning, videlicet to draw near a certain spot, compare, as he drew near, karab the camp, Exodus 32.19, and Pharaoh drew near, Hikrib, Exodus 14.10, Naga, in the first sense, vide licet, expressing the contact of two bodies, occurs in, and she cast it, va tagga, at his feet, Exodus 4.25. He caused it to touch, va yagga, his mouth, Isaiah 6.7. And nagash, in the first sense, vide licet, to approach or move towards another person, is found exempli gratia in, and Judah drew near, va yigash unto him. Genesis 44, 1. The second meaning of these three words is approach by means of knowledge or contact by comprehension, not in reference to space. As to nagga, in this second sense, compare, for her judgment reacheth nagga unto heaven. Jeremiah 51, 9. An instance of Kara being used in this meaning is contained in the following passage. And the cause that is too hard for you, bring, takrebun, it unto me. Deuteronomy 1.17 This is equivalent to saying, ye shall make it known unto me. The verb karab in the hefil is thus employed in the sense of giving information concerning a thing. The verb nagash is used figuratively in the phrase, And Abraham drew near, the yagash, and said, Genesis 18.23. This took place in a prophetic vision, as will be explained, Part 1, Chapter 21, and Part 2, Chapter 41. Also, in for as much as this people drew near, nagash me, with their mouths and with their lips, Isaiah 29.13. Wherever a word denoting approach or contact is employed in prophetic writings to describe a certain relation between the Almighty and any created being, it has to be understood in this latter sense, vide licet, to approach mentally. 
For as will be proved in this treatise, part 2, chapter 4, the supreme is incorporeal, and consequently he does not approach or draw near a thing, nor can aught approach or touch him. For when a being is without corporeality, it cannot occupy space, and all idea of approach, contact, distance, conjunction, separation, touch, or proximity is inapplicable to such a thing. There can be no doubt respecting the verses, The Lord is nigh, Karob, unto all them that call upon him. Psalms 145.18 They take delight in approaching, Gerbat, to God. Isaiah 58.2 The nearness, Gerbat, of God is pleasant to me. Psalms 73.28 All such phrases intimate a spiritual approach. It is the attainment of some knowledge, not, however, approach in space. Thus also, who hath God so nigh? Kerobim, unto him. Deuteronomy 4.7 Draw thou near, Kerab, and hear. Deuteronomy 5.27 And Moses alone shall draw near. Vanigash, the Lord. But they shall not come nigh. Yigashu. Exodus 24.2 if, however, you wish to take the words, and Moses shall draw near, to mean that he shall draw near a certain place in the mountain, whereon the divine light shone, or in the words of the Bible, where the glory of the Lord abode, you may do so, provided you do not lose sight of the truth, that there is no difference whether a person stand at the center of the earth or at the highest point of the ninth sphere, if this were possible. He is no further away from God in the one case or near to him in the other. Those only approach him who obtain a knowledge of him, while those who remain ignorant of him recede from him. In this approach towards or recession from God, there are numerous grades, one above the other, and I shall further elucidate in one of the subsequent chapters of the treatise, Part 1, Chapter 60, and Part 2, Chapter 36, what constitutes the difference in our perception of God. In the passage, touch, ga, the mountains, and they shall smoke. Psalms 144, 5. The verb touch is used in a figurative sense, vide licet, let thy word touch them. So also the words, touch thou him, Job 2, 5, have the same meaning as bring thy infliction upon him. In a similar manner must this verb, in whatever form it may be employed, be interpreted in each place according to the context. For in some cases it denotes contact of two material objects, in others knowledge and comprehension of a thing, as if he who now comprehends anything which he had not comprehended previously had thereby approached a subject which had been distant from him. This point is of considerable importance. End of chapter 18《Part 1, Chapter 19 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19. The term malla is a homonym which denotes that one substance enters another and fills it, as, and she filled va te malla her pitcher, Genesis 24, 16, an omerful melo for each, Exodus 16:32 and many other instances. Next it signifies the expiration or completion of a fixed period of time, as, and when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, va yemla'u, Genesis 25, 24, and forty days were completed, va yemla'u, for him, Genesis 1, 3. It further denotes attainment of the highest degree of excellency, as, full, ma'la, with the blessing of the Lord, Deuteronomy 33.23 Them hath he filled, milla, with wisdom of heart. Exodus 35.35 He was filled, va yimala, with wisdom and understanding and cunning. 1 Kings 7.14 In this sense it is said, the whole earth is full, mello, of his glory. Isaiah 6.4 All the earth gives evidence of his perfection. It est leads to a knowledge of it. Thus also the glory of the Lord filled, Malla, the tabernacle, Exodus 40, 34. And in fact, every application of the word to God must be interpreted in this manner, and not that he has a body occupying space. 
If, on the other hand, you prefer to think that in this passage by the glory of the Lord, a certain light created for the purpose is to be understood, that such light is always termed glory, and that such light filled the tabernacle, we have no objection. End of chapter 19「Part 1, Chapter 20 of the Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20. The word Ram, high, is a homonym, denoting elevation in space and elevation in dignity. It has greatness, honor, and power. It has the first meaning in, and the ark was lifted up, va tarom, above the earth, Genesis 7:17 and the latter meaning in I have exalted Harumoti, one chosen out of the people. Psalms 89.20 Forasmuch as I have exalted Harumoti, thee, from amongst the dust. 1 Kings 16.2 Forasmuch as I have exalted Harumoti, thee, from among the people. 1 Kings 14.7 Whenever this term is employed in reference to God, it must be taken in the second sense. Be thou exalted, Rumah, O God above the heavens. Psalms 57, 12. In the same manner does the root, Nasa, to lift up, denote both elevation in space and elevation in rank and dignity. In the former sense it occurs in, And they lifted up, Vayasau, their corn upon their asses. Genesis 42.26. And there are many instances like this in which this verb has the meaning to carry, to move from place to place, for this implies elevation in space. In the second sense we have, and his kingdom shall be exalted, Vatinese, Numbers 24.7. And he bare them and carried them, Vatinesayim, Isaiah 63.9. Wherefore do you exalt yourselves? Titnasa'u. Numbers 16.3. Every form of this verb, when applied to God, has this latter sense. Exemple gratia. Lift up thyself. Hinase. Thou judge of earth. Psalms 94.2. Thus saith the high, Ram, and exalted, Nisa. 1. Isaiah 57.15. Denoting elevation in rank, quality and power, and not elevation in space. You may be surprised that I employ the expression elevation in rank, quality, and power, and you may say, how can you assert that several distinct expressions denote the same thing? It will be explained later on, chapter 1, et sequens, that those who possess a true knowledge of God do not consider that he possesses many attributes, but believe that these various attributes which describe his might, greatness, power, perfection, goodness, etc., are identical, denoting his essence, and not anything extraneous to his essence. I shall devote special chapters to the names and attributes of God. Our intention here is solely to show that high and exalted, in the passage quoted, denote elevation and rank, not in space. End of chapter 20 Part 1, Chapter 21 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21 In its primary signification, the Hebrew abar, to pass, refers to the motion of a body in space and is chiefly applied to living creatures moving at some distance in a straight line, exemple gratia, and he passed over abar before them, Genesis 33, 3. Pass, abor, before the people, Exodus 17.5. Instances of this kind are numerous. The verb was next applied to the passage of sound through the air, as, and they caused a sound to pass, va yaabiru, through the camp, Exodus 36.6. That I hear the Lord's people spreading the report, ma'aberim, 1 Samuel 2.24. Figuratively, it denoted the appearance of the light and the divine presence, Shechina, which the prophets perceived in their prophetic visions, as it is said, And behold a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed, a abar, between those pieces, Genesis 15.17. This took place in a prophetic vision, for the narrative commences, and a deep sleep, 
fell upon Abraham. The verb has this latter meaning in Exodus 12.12, 12, And I shall pass, va'abarti, through the land of Egypt, denoting, I shall reveal myself, etc., and in all similar phrases. The verb is next employed to express that a person has gone too far and transgressed the usual limit in the performance of some act, as, and as a man who is drinking wine has passed, a'baru, the proper limit, Jeremiah 23, 9. It is also used figuratively to denote to abandon one aim and turn to a different aim and object, exempli gratia. He shot an arrow, causing it to miss the aim, lecha'abiru, 1 Samuel 20, 36. This is the sense that appears to me of this verb in, and the Lord passed by, va'ya'abur, before his face. Exodus 34, 6. I take his face to mean the face of God. Our teachers likewise interpreted his face as being identical with the face of God. And although this is found in the midst of agatic interpretations which would be out of place in this work, yet it is some support of our view that the pronoun his is employed in this passage as a substitute for God's, and the whole passage could, in my opinion, be explained as follows. Moses sought to attain to a certain perception which is called the perception of the divine face, a term occurring in the phrase, My face cannot be seen, but God vouchsafed to him a perception of a lower degree, videlicet, the one called the seeing of the back, in the words, And thou shalt see my back. Exodus 33.23 We have mentioned this subject in our work Mishneh Torah. Accordingly, it is stated in the above-mentioned passage that the Lord withheld from Moses that perception which is termed the seeing of the divine face, and substituted for it another gift, videlicet, the knowledge of the acts attributed to God, which, as I shall explain, chapter 54, are considered to be different and separate attributes of the Supreme. In asserting that God withheld from Moses the higher knowledge, I mean to say that this knowledge was unattainable, that by its nature it was inaccessible to Moses. For man, whilst able to gain perfection by applying his reasoning faculties to the attainment of what is within the reach of his intellect, either weakens his reason or loses it altogether as soon as he ventures to seek a higher degree of knowledge, as I shall elucidate in one of the chapters of this work, unless he be granted a special aid from heaven, as is described in the words, And I will cover thee with my hand until I pass by. Exodus 33.23 Onkelos, in translating this verse, adopts the same method which he applies to the explanation of similar passages, videlicet every expression implying corporeality or corporal properties when referring to God, he explains by assuming an ellipsis of a nomen regens before God, thus connecting the expression of corporeality with another word which is supplied and which governs the genitive, God, exempli gratia, and behold the Lord stood upon it, Genesis 28.13. He explains, the glory of the Lord stood arrayed above it. Again, the Lord watched between me and thee. Genesis 31.49 He paraphrases, the word of the Lord shall watch. This is his ordinary method of explaining scripture. He applies it also to Exodus 34.6, which he paraphrases, the Lord caused his presence to pass before his face and called. According to this rendering, the thing which passed was unquestionably some physical object. The pronoun, his, refers to Moses, and the phrase, al-panav, is identical with lefanav, before him. Compare, so went the present over before him, al-panav, Genesis 32.22. This is likewise an appropriate and satisfactory explanation. I can adduce still further support for the opinion of Onkelos from the words, While my glory passeth by, Ba'abur, Exodus 33.23.
33.22, which expressly state that the passing object was something ascribed to God, not God himself, and of this divine glory. It is also said, until I pass by, and, and the Lord passed by before him. Should it, however, be considered necessary to assume here an ellipsis according to the method of Onkelos, who supplies in some instances the term the glory, in others the word, and in others the divine presence, as the context may require in each particular case, we may also supply here the word voice, and explain the passage, and a voice from the Lord passed before him and called. We have already shown that the verb abar, he passed, can be applied to the voice as in, and they caused the voice to pass through the camp. Exodus 36, 6. According to this explanation, it was the voice which called. No objection can be raised to applying the verb kara, he called, to kol, voice, for a similar phrase occurs in the Bible in reference to God's commands to Moses. He heard the voice speaking unto him, and, in the same manner as it can be said, the voice spoke, we may also say, the voice called. Indeed, we can even support this application of the verbs to say and to call to the voice by parallel passages, as, A voice saith cry, and it says, What shall I cry? Isaiah 46 According to this view, the meaning of the passage under discussion would be, A voice of God passed before him and called, Eternal, Eternal, All-Powerful, All-Merciful, and All-Gracious. The word eternal is repeated. It is in the vocative, for the eternal is the one who is called. Compare Moses, Moses, Abraham, Abraham. This again is a very appropriate explanation of the text. You will surely not find it strange that the subject, so profound and difficult, should bear various interpretations, for it will not impair the force of the argument with which we are here concerned. Either explanation may be adopted. You may take the grand scene altogether as a prophetic vision, and the whole occurrence as a mental operation, and consider that what Moses sought, what was withheld from him, and what he attained, were things perceived by the intellect without the use of the senses, as we have explained above. Or you may assume that in addition there was a certain ocular perception of a material object, the sight of which would assist intellectual perception. The latter is the view of Onkelos, unless he assumes that in this instance the ocular perception was likewise a prophetic vision, as was the case with a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces, Genesis 15.17, mentioned in the history of Abraham. You may also assume that in addition there was a perception of sound, and that there was a voice which passed before him, and was undoubtedly something material. You may choose either of these opinions, for our sole intention and purpose is to guard you against the belief that the phrase, and the Lord passed, is analogous to, pass before the people, Exodus 17, 5. For God, being incorporeal, cannot be said to move, and consequently the verb to pass cannot with propriety be applied to him in its primary signification. End of chapter 21Part 1, Chapter 22 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 In Hebrew, the verb bo signifies to come, as applied to a living being. It is its arrival at a certain place or approach to a certain person, as thy brother came ba with subtlety. Genesis 27.35 it next denotes with regard to a living being to enter a certain place, exempli gratia, and when Joseph came va yabo into the house, Genesis forty three twenty six, when ye come ta into the land, Exodus twelve twenty five. 
The term was also employed metaphorically in the sense of to come, applied to a certain event, that is, to something incorporeal, as when thy sayings come to pass, Yabu, Judges 13.17, of that which will come, Yabau, over thee, Isaiah 47.13. Nay, it is even applied to privatives, exempli gratia, yet evil came, va Yabu, Job 3.26, and darkness came, va Yabu. Now, since the word has been applied to incorporeal things, it has also been used in reference to God, to the fulfillment of his word, or to the manifestation of his presence, the Shekhinah. In this figurative sense, it is said, Lo, I come, ba, unto thee in a thick cloud. Exodus 19.9 For the Lord the God of Israel cometh, ba, through it. Ezekiel 44.2 in these and all similar passages, the coming of the Shekhinah is meant, but the words, And the Lord my God shall come, Uba, Zechariah 14.5, are identical with His word will come. That is to say, the promises which He made through the prophets will be fulfilled. Therefore, Scripture adds, All the holy ones that are with thee, that is to say, the word of the Lord my God will be performed which has been spoken by all the holy ones who are with thee, who address the Israelites. End of chapter 22。Part 1, Chapter 23 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23. Yetza, he came out, is the opposite of ba. He came in. The term yatsa is applied to the motion of a body from a place in which it had previously rested to another place, whether the body be a living being or not. Exempli gratia. And when they were gone out, yatseu, of the city. Genesis 44 4. If fire break out, tetse. Exodus 22 5. It was then figuratively employed to denote the appearance of something incorporeal as the word went out, yatsa, of the king's mouth, Esther 7, 8. When this deed of the queen shall come abroad, yitze, unto all women, Esther 1, 17. That is to say, the report will spread. Again, for out of Zion shall go forth, tetze, the law, Isaiah 2, 3. Further, the sun had risen, yatsa, upon the earth, Genesis 19.23. It est, its light became visible. In this figurative sense, we must take every expression of coming out when applied to the Almighty, exempli gratia, behold the Lord cometh out, yotze, of his place, Isaiah 26.21. It est, the word of God which until now has been seen in secret, cometh out and will become manifest, it est, something will come into being which had not existed before. For everything new emanating from God is ascribed to his word. Compare, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Psalms 33, 6. This is a simile taken from the conduct of kings, who employ the word as the means of carrying their will into effect. God, however, requires no instrument wherewith to operate in order to perform anything. The effect is produced solely by his will alone. He does not employ any kind of speech, as will be explained further, chapter 55. The verb to come out is thus employed to designate the manifestation of a certain work of God, as we noticed in our interpretation of the phrase, Behold, the Lord cometh out of his place. In a similar manner, the term shub, to return, has been figuratively employed to denote the discontinuance of a certain act according to the will of God, as in, I will go and return to my place, Hosea 5.15. That is to say, the divine presence, Shechina, which had been in our midst, departed from us, the consequence of which has been the absence of divine protection from amongst us. 
Thus the prophet, foretelling misfortune, says, And I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured. Deuteronomy 31, 17. For when a man is deprived of divine protection, he is exposed to all dangers, and becomes the butt of all fortuitous circumstances. His fortune and misfortune then depend on chance. Alas, how terrible a threat! This is the idea contained in the words, I will go and return to my place. Hosea 5.15 End of chapter 23「Part 1 Chapter 24 of the Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 24 The term halak is likewise one of the words which denote movements performed by living beings, as in, And Jacob went, halak, on his way, Genesis 32, 1, and in many other instances. The verb to go was next employed in describing movements of objects less solid than the bodies of living beings. Compare, and the waters were going on, halok, decreasing, Genesis 8, 5, and the fire went along, va te halak, upon the ground, Exodus 9, 23. Then it was employed to express the spreading and manifestation of something incorporeal. Compare, the voice thereof shall go like a serpent, Jeremiah 46.22 Again, the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. Genesis 3.8 It is the voice that is qualified by walking. Whenever the word to go is used in reference to God, it must be taken in this figurative sense. It est, it applies to incorporeal things and signifies either the manifestation of something incorporeal or the withdrawal of the divine protection, an act corresponding in lifeless beings to the removal of a thing, in living beings to the departure of a living being, walking. The withdrawal of God's protection is called in the Bible the hiding of God's countenance, as in Deuteronomy 31.18, As for me, I will hide my countenance. On the same ground it has been designated going away or moving away from a thing. Compare, I will depart and return to my place. Hosea 5.15 But in the passage, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he went. Numbers 12.9 The two meanings of the verb are combined. Vide licet, the withdrawal of the divine protection expressed by and he went, and the revelation, manifestation, and appearance of something, namely of the anger which went forth and reached them, in consequence of which Miriam became leprous, white as snow. The expression to walk was further applied to conduct which concerns only the inner life, and which requires no bodily motion, as in the following passages. And thou shalt walk in his ways. Deuteronomy 28, 9. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 13, 5. Come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Isaiah 2, 5. End of chapter 24. Part 1, Chapter 25 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25. The Hebrew, Shechem, as is well known, signifies to dwell, as, and he was dwelling, Shechem, in the plains of Mamre. Genesis 14, 13. And it came to pass, when Israel dwelt, be Shechem. Genesis 35, 22. This is the most common meaning of the word, but dwelling in a place consists in the continued stay in a place, general or special. When a living being dwells long in a place, we say that it stays in that place, although it unquestionably moves about in it. Compare, and he was staying in the plains of Mamre, Genesis 14.13, and, and it came to pass when Israel stayed, Genesis 35.22. The term was next applied metaphorically to inanimate objects, id est, to everything which has settled and remains fixed on one object, although the object on which the thing remains is not a place, and the thing itself is not a living being. For instance, 
Let a cloud dwell upon it, the day. Job 3, 5. There is no doubt that the cloud is not a living being, and that the day is not a corporeal thing, but a division of time. In this sense, the term is employed in reference to God, that is to say, to denote the continuance of His divine presence, Shekhinah, or of His providence, in some place where the divine presence manifested itself constantly, or in some object, which was constantly protected by providence. Compare, and the glory of the Lord abode, Exodus 24, 16, and I will dwell among the children of Israel, Exodus 29, 45, and for the good will of him that dwelt in the bush, Deuteronomy 33, 16. Whenever the term is applied to the Almighty, it must be taken consistently with the context in the sense either as referring to the presence of his Shekhinah, it is of his light that was created for the purpose in a certain place, or of the continuance of his providence protecting a certain object. End of chapter 25Part 1, Chapter 26 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26 You no doubt know the Talmudical saying, which includes in itself all the various kinds of interpretation connected with our subject. It runs thus, The Torah speaks according to the language of man, that is to say, expressions, which can easily be comprehended and understood by all, are applied to the Creator. Hence the description of God by attributes implying corporeality, in order to express His existence. Because the multitude of people do not easily conceive existence unless in connection with a body, and that which is not a body nor connected with a body has for them no existence. Whatever we regard as a state of perfection is likewise attributed to God, as expressing that He is perfect in every respect, and that no imperfection or deficiency whatever is found in Him. But there is not attributed to God anything which the multitude consider a defect or want. Thus He is never represented as eating, drinking, sleeping, being ill, using violence, and the like. Whatever, on the other hand, is commonly regarded as a state of perfection is attributed to him, although it is only a state of perfection in relation to ourselves. For in relation to God, what we consider to be a state of perfection is in truth the highest degree of imperfection. If, however, men were to think that those human perfections were absent in God, they would consider him as imperfect. You are aware that locomotion is one of the distinguishing characteristics of living beings, and is indispensable for them in their progress towards perfection. As they require food and drink to supply animal waste, so they require locomotion in order to approach that which is good for them and in harmony with their nature, and to escape from what is injurious and contrary to their nature. It makes, in fact, no difference whether we ascribe to God eating and drinking or locomotion, but according to human modes of expression, that is to say, according to common notions, eating and drinking would be an imperfection in God, while motion would not, in spite of the fact that the necessity of locomotion is the result of some want. Furthermore, it has been clearly proved that everything which moves is corporeal and divisible. It will be shown below that God is incorporeal, and that he can have no locomotion, nor can rest be ascribed to him. For rest can only be applied to that which also moves. All expressions, however, which imply the various modes of movement in living beings are employed with regard to God in the manner we have described and in the same way as life is ascribed to Him. Although motion is an accident pertaining to living beings, and there is no doubt that without corporeality expressions like the following could not be imagined. To descend, to ascend, to walk, to place, to stand, to surround, to sit, to dwell, to depart, 
to enter, to pass, etc. It would have been superfluous thus to dilate on this subject were it not for the mass of the people who are accustomed to such ideas. It has been necessary to expatiate on the subject, as we have attempted, for the benefit of those who are anxious to acquire perfection, to remove from them such notions as have grown up with them from the days of youth. End of chapter 26part 1 chapter 27 of the guide for the perplexed by moses maimonides this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 27 onkelos the proselyte who was thoroughly acquainted with the hebrew and chaldaic languages made it his task to oppose the belief in god's corporeality Accordingly, any expression employed in the Pentateuch in reference to God, and in any way implying corporeality, he paraphrases in consonance with the context. All expressions denoting any mode of motion are explained by him to mean the appearance or manifestation of a certain light that had been created for the occasion, ides, the Shechina, divine presence, or providence. Thus he paraphrases, The Lord will come down, Exodus 19.11, The Lord will manifest himself, and God came down, Exodus 16.20, and God manifested himself, and does not say, and God came down, I will go down now and see, Genesis 18.21, he paraphrases, I will manifest myself now and see. This is his rendering of the verb yarad, he went down, when used in reference to God throughout his version, with the exception of the following passage, I will go down, erad, with thee into Egypt, Genesis 46, 4, which he renders literally. A remarkable proof of this great man's talents, the excellence of his version, and the correctness of his interpretation. By this version, he discloses to us an important principle as regards prophecy. This narrative begins, And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night, and said, Jacob, Jacob, etc. And he said, I am God, etc. I will go down with thee into Egypt. Genesis 46, 2, 3. Seeing that the whole narrative is introduced as a vision of the night, Onkelos did not hesitate to translate literally the words addressed to Jacob in the nocturnal vision, and thus gave a faithful account of the occurrence. For the passage in question contains a statement of what Jacob was told, not what actually took place as is the case in the words, And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, Exodus 19.20. Here we have an account of what actually occurred in the physical world. The verb yarad is therefore paraphrased, he manifested himself, and entirely detached from the idea of motion. Accounts of what happened in the imagination of man, I mean of what he was told, are not altered, a most remarkable distinction. Hence you may infer that there is a great difference between a communication designated as having been made in a dream or a vision of the night and a vision or a manifestation simply introduced with phrases like, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, And the Lord spake unto me, saying, According to my opinion, it is also possible that Onkelos understood Elohim in the above passage to signify angel, and that for this reason he did not hesitate to translate literally, I will go down with thee to Egypt. I do not think it strange that Onkelos should have believed the Elohim who said to Jacob, I am God, the God of thy father, Ibid 3, to be an angel, for this sentence can, in the same form, also have been spoken by an angel. Thus Jacob says, And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here am I. 
etc. Genesis 31:11, and concludes the report of the angel's words to him in the following way, I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vowest a vow unto me. Ibid 13. Although there is no doubt that Jacob vowed to God not to the angel, it is the usual practice of prophets to relate words addressed to them by an angel in the name of God, as though God himself had spoken to them. Such passages are all to be explained by supplying the nomen regens, and by considering them as identical with, I am the messenger of the God of thy father, I am the messenger of God who appeared to thee in Bethel, and the like. Prophecy, with its various degrees, and the nature of angels will be fully discussed in the sequel in accordance with the object of this treatise, Part 2, Chapter 14. End of Chapter 27。Part 1, Chapter 28 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 28 The term regal is homonymous, signifying in the first place the foot of a living being. Compare foot for foot, Exodus 21-24. Next it denotes an object which follows another. Compare and all the people that follow thee, literally that are at thy feet, Ibid 11-18. Another signification of the word is cause. Compare, and the Lord hath blessed thee, I being the cause, le ragli, Genesis 30, 30, it est for my sake. For that which exists for the sake of another thing has the latter for its final cause. Examples of the term used in this sense are numerous. It has that meaning in Genesis 33:14, because le regel of the cattle that goeth before me, and because le regel of the children. Consequently, the Hebrew text of which the literal rendering is, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14:4, can be explained in the following way. And the things caused by him, Raglav, on that day upon the Mount of Olives, that is to say the wonders which will then be seen, and of which God will be the cause, or the maker, will remain permanently. To this explanation does Jonathan, son of Ozael, incline in paraphrasing the passage, and he will appear in his might on that day upon the Mount of Olives. He generally expresses terms denoting those parts of the body by which contact and motion are affected by his might when referring to God, because all such expressions denote acts done by his will. In the passage, Exodus 24.10, literally, and there was under his feet, like the action of the whiteness of a sapphire stone, Onkelos, as you know, in his version, considers the word raglav, his feet, as a figurative expression and a substitute for throne. The words under his feet, he therefore paraphrases, and under the throne of his glory. Consider this well, and you will observe with wonder how Onkelos keeps free from the idea of the corporeality of God and from everything that leads thereto, even in the remotest degree. For he does not say, and under his throne, the direct relation of the throne to God implied in the literal sense of the phrase, his throne, would necessarily suggest the idea that God is supported by a material object and thus lead directly to the corporeality of God. He therefore refers the throne to his glory, id es to the Shekhinah, which is a light created for the purpose. Similarly, he paraphrases the words, For my hand I lift up to the throne of God. Exodus 17.16 An oath has been uttered by God, whose Shekhinah is upon the throne of his glory. This principle found also expression in the popular phrase, the throne of the glory. We have already gone too far away from the subject of this chapter and touched upon things which will be discussed in other chapters. 
we will now return to our present theme. You are acquainted with the version of Onkelos of the passage quoted. He contents himself with excluding from his version all expressions of corporeality in reference to God, and does not show us what they, the nobles of the children of Israel, Exodus 24.10, perceived, or what is meant by that figure. In all similar instances, Onkelos also abstains from entering into such questions, and only endeavors to exclude every expression implying corporeality. For the incorporeality of God is a demonstrative truth and an indispensable element in our faith. He could decidedly state all that was necessary in that respect. The interpretation of a simile is a doubtful thing. It may possibly have that meaning, but it may also refer to something else. It contains besides very profound matter, the understanding of which is not a fundamental element in our faith, and the comprehension of which is not easy for the common people. Onkelos, therefore, did not enter at all into the subject. We, however, remaining faithful to our task in this treatise, find ourselves compelled to give our explanation. According to our opinion, under his feet, Raglav denotes under that of which he is the cause, that which exists through him, as we have already stated. They, the nobles of the children of Israel, therefore comprehended the real nature of the materia prima, which emanated from him, and of whose existence he is the only cause. Consider well the phrase, like the action of the whiteness of the sapphire stone. If the color were the point of comparison, the words, as the whiteness of the sapphire stone, would have sufficed. But the addition of, like the action, was necessary, because matter as such is, as you are well aware, always receptive and passive, active only by some accident. On the other hand, form as such is always active, and only passive by some accident, as is explained in works on physics. This explains the addition of like the action in reference to the materia prima. The expression, the whiteness of the sapphire, refers to the transparency, not to the white color, for the whiteness of the sapphire is not a white color, but the property of being transparent. Things, however, which are transparent have no color of their own, as is proved in works on physics. For if they had a color, they would not permit all the colors to pass through them, nor would they receive colors. It is only when the transparent object is totally colorless that it is able to receive successively all the colors. In this respect, it, the whiteness of the sapphire, is like the materia prima, which as such is entirely formless, and thus receives all the forms one after the other. What they, the nobles of the children of Israel, perceived was therefore the materia prima, whose relation to God is distinctly mentioned, because it is the source of those of his creatures which are subject to genesis and destruction, and has been created by him. This subject also will be treated later on more fully. Observe that you must have recourse to an explanation of this kind, even when adopting the rendering of Onkelos, and under the throne of his glory. For in fact, the materia prima is also under the heavens, which are called throne of God, as we have remarked above. I should not have thought of this unusual interpretation, or hit on this argument, were it not for an utterance of Rabbi Eliezer ben Hyrcanus, which will be discussed in one of the parts of this treatise, Part 2, Chapter 26. The primary object of every intelligent person must be to deny the corporeality of God, and to believe that all those perceptions described in the above passage were of a spiritual, not of a material character. Note this and consider it well. End of chapter 28Part 1, Chapter 29 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
Chapter 29 The term etzeb is homonymous, denoting in the first place pain and trembling. Compare, in sorrow be'etzeb, thou shalt bring forth children, Genesis 3.16. Next it denotes anger, compare, and this father had not made him angry, atzabu, at any time, 1 Kings 1.6. For he was angry, Naetzeb, for the sake of David, 1 Samuel 20.34. The term signifies also provocation. Compare, they rebelled and vexed, Etzebul, his Holy Spirit, Isaiah 63.10, and provoked, Yaetzebahu, him in the desert, Psalms 78.40. If there be any way of provocation, Otzeb, in me, Ibid 139.24. Every day they rebel, Yaetzebu, against my words. Ibid 56.6. In Genesis 6.6, 6, the word has either the second or the third signification. In the first case, the sense of the Hebrew, Va Yaetzeb el libo, is, God was angry with them on account of the wickedness of their deeds. As to the words, to his heart, used here, and also in the history of Noah, Ibid 8.21, I will here explain what they mean. With regard to man, we use the expression, he said to himself, or he said in his heart, in reference to a subject which he did not utter or communicate to any other person. Similarly, the phrase, and God said in his heart, is used in reference to an act which God decreed without mentioning it to any prophet at the time the event took place according to the will of God. And a figure of this kind is admissible, since the Torah speaketh in accordance with the language of man. Supra, page 26. This is plain and clear. In the Pentateuch, no distinct mention is made of a message sent to the wicked generation of the flood, cautioning or threatening them with death. Therefore it is said concerning them that God was angry with them in his heart. Likewise, when he decreed that no flood should happen again, he did not tell a prophet to communicate it to others, and for that reason the words, in his heart, are added. Taking the verb in the third signification, we explain the passage thus, And man rebelled against God's will concerning him, for leb, heart, also signifies will, as we shall explain when treating of the homonymity of leb, heart. End of chapter 29 Part 1, Chapter 30 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30 In its primary meaning, ekel, to eat, is used in the sense of taking food by animals. This needs no illustration. It was afterwards observed that eating includes two processes. One, the loss of the food, id s, the destruction of its form, which first takes place. Two, the growth of animals, the preservation of their strength and their existence, and the support of all the forces of their body caused by the food they take. The consideration of the first process led to the figurative use of the verb in the sense of consuming, destroying. Hence, it includes all modes of depriving a thing of its form. Compare, and the land of your enemies shall destroy, literally eat you. Leviticus 26, 38. A land that destroyeth, literally eateth, the inhabitants thereof. Numbers 13, 32. Ye shall be destroyed literally eaten, with the sword. Isaiah 1, 6. Shall the sword destroy, literally eat. Second Samuel 2, 26. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them, and destroyed, literally ate them, that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. Numbers 11, 1. God is a destroying, literally eating fire. Deuteronomy 4, 24. That is, he destroys those who rebel against him, as the fire destroys everything that comes within its reach. Instances of this kind are very frequent. With reference to the second effect of the act of eating, 
the verb to eat is figuratively used in the sense of acquiring wisdom, learning, in short, for all intellectual perceptions. These preserve the human form, intellect, constantly in the most perfect manner, in the same way as food preserves the body in its best condition. Compare. Come ye, buy and eat. Isaiah 55. 1. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good. Ibid 2. It is not good to eat much honey. Proverbs 25, 27. My son, eat thou honey, because it is good, and the honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul. Ibid 24, 13 and 14. This figurative use of the verb to eat in the sense of acquiring wisdom is frequently met with in the Talmud. Exempli gratia. Come, eat fat meat at Rabba's. Baba Bathra 22a. Compare all expressions of eating and drinking found in this book of Proverbs refer to wisdom or, according to another reading, to the law. Kohelet Rabba on Ecclesiastes 3.13. Thirteen. Wisdom has also been frequently called water, exempli gratia. Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. Isaiah 55, 1. The figurative meaning of these expressions has been so general and common that it was almost considered as its primitive signification and led to the employment of hunger and thirst in the sense of absence of wisdom and intelligence. Compare, I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. Psalms 42, 3. Instances of this kind occur frequently. The words, With joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. Isaiah 12, 3 are paraphrased by Jonathan son of Ozael thus, You will joyfully receive new instruction from the chosen of the righteous. Consider how he explains water to indicate the wisdom which will then spread, and the wells, ma'ayane, as being identical with the eyes of the congregation. Numbers 15, 24. In the sense of the chiefs or the wise. By the phrase from the chosen of the righteous, he expresses his belief that righteousness is true salvation. You now see how he gives to every word in this verse some signification referring to wisdom and study. This should be well considered. End of chapter 30. Part 1, Chapter 31 of the Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 31 Know that for the human mind there are certain objects of perception which are within the scope of its nature and capacity. On the other hand, there are amongst things which actually exist, certain objects which the mind can in no way and by no means grasp. The gates of perception are closed against it. Further, there are things of which the mind understands one part, but remains ignorant of the other. And when man is able to comprehend certain things, it does not follow that he must be able to comprehend everything. This also applies to the senses. They are able to perceive things, but not at every distance, and all other powers of the body are limited in a similar way. A man can, exempli gratia, carry two kikar, but he cannot carry ten kikar. How individuals of the same species surpass each other in these sensations and in other bodily faculties is universally known, but there is a limit to them, and their power cannot extend to every distance or to every degree. All this is applicable to the intellectual faculties of man. There is a considerable difference between one person and another as regards to these faculties, as is well known to philosophers. While one man can discover a certain thing by himself, another is never able to understand it, even if taught by means of all possible expressions and metaphors, and during a long period. 
His mind can in no way grasp it. His capacity is insufficient for it. This distinction is not unlimited. A boundary is undoubtedly set to the human mind which it cannot pass. There are things beyond that boundary which are acknowledged to be inaccessible to human understanding, and man does not show any desire to comprehend them. Being aware that such knowledge is impossible and that there are no means of overcoming the difficulty. Exemple gratia, we do not know the number of stars in heaven, whether the number is even or odd. We do not know the number of animals, minerals, or plants, and the like. There are other things, however, which man very much desires to know, and strenuous efforts to examine and to investigate them have been made by thinkers of all classes and at all times. They differ and disagree and constantly raise new doubts with regard to them because their minds are bent on comprehending such things, that is to say, they are moved by desire, and every one of them believes that he has discovered the way leading to a true knowledge of the thing, although human reason is entirely unable to demonstrate the fact by convincing evidence. For a proposition which can be proved by evidence is not subject to dispute, denial, or rejection. None but the ignorant would contradict it, and such contradiction is called denial of a demonstrated proof. Thus you find men who deny the spherical form of the earth, or the circular form of the line in which the stars move, and the like. Such men are not considered in this treatise. This confusion prevails mostly in metaphysical subjects, less in problems relating to physics, and is entirely absent from the exact sciences. Alexander Aphrodisius said that there are three causes which prevent men from discovering the exact truth. First, arrogance and vainglory. Secondly, the subtlety, depth, and difficulty of any subject which is being examined. Thirdly, ignorance and want of capacity to comprehend what might be comprehended. These causes are enumerated by Alexander. At the present time there is a fourth cause not mentioned by him because it did not then prevail, namely habit and training. We naturally like what we have been accustomed to and are attracted towards it. This may be observed amongst villagers. Though they rarely enjoy the benefit of a douche or bath, and have few enjoyments and pass a life of privation, they dislike town life and do not desire its pleasures, preferring the inferior things to which they are accustomed to the better things to which they are strangers. It would give them no satisfaction to live in palaces, to be clothed in silk, and to indulge in baths, ointments, and perfumes. The same is the case with those opinions of man to which he has been accustomed from his youth. He likes them, defends them, and shuns the opposite views. This is likewise one of the causes which prevent men from finding truth, and which make them cling to their habitual opinions. Such is, exempli gratia, the case with the vulgar notions with respect to the corporeality of God, and many other metaphysical questions, as we shall explain. It is the result of long familiarity with passages of the Bible which they are accustomed to respect and to receive as true, and the literal sense of which implies the corporeality of God and other false notions. In truth, however, these words were employed as figures and metaphors for reason to be mentioned below. Do not imagine that what we have said of the insufficiency of our understanding and of its limited extent is an assertion founded only on the Bible. For philosophers likewise assert the same, and perfectly understand it, without having regard to any religion or opinion. It is a fact which is only doubted by those who ignore things fully proved. This chapter is intended as an introduction to the next. End of chapter 31。Part 1, Chapter 32 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 32. You must consider when reading this treatise that mental perception, because connected with matter, is subject to conditions similar to those to which physical perception is subject. 
That is to say, if your eye looks around, you can perceive all that is within the range of your vision. If, however, you overstrain your eye, exerting it too much by attempting to see an object which is too distant for your eye, or to examine writings or engravings too small for your sight, and forcing it to obtain a correct perception of them, you will not only weaken your sight with regard to that special object, but also for those things which you otherwise are able to perceive. Your eye will have become too weak to perceive what you were able to see before you exerted yourself and exceeded the limits of your vision. The same is the case with the speculative faculties of one who devotes himself to the study of any science. If a person studies too much and exhausts his reflective powers, he will be confused and will not be able to apprehend even that which had been within the power of his apprehension. For the powers of the body are all alike in this respect. The mental perceptions are not exempt from a similar condition. If you admit the doubt and do not persuade yourself to believe that there is a proof for things which cannot be demonstrated, or to try at once to reject and positively to deny an assertion the opposite of which has never been proved, or attempt to perceive things which are beyond your perception, then you have attained the highest degree of human perfection. Then you are like Rabbi Akiba, who, in peace, entered the study of these theological problems and came out in peace. If, on the other hand, you attempt to exceed the limit of your intellectual power, or at once to reject things as impossible which have never been proved to be impossible, or which are in fact possible, though their possibility be very remote, then you will be like Elisha Acher, you will not only fail to become perfect, but you will become exceedingly imperfect. Ideas founded on mere imagination will prevail over you. You will incline toward defects and toward base and degraded habits on account of the confusion which troubles your mind and of the dimness of its light, just as weakness of sight causes invalids to see many kinds of unreal images, especially when they have looked for a long time at dazzling or at very minute objects. Respecting this it has been said, Hast thou found honey, eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith, and vomit it. Proverbs 25.16 our sages also applied this verse to Elisha Acher. How excellent is this simile! In comparing knowledge to food, as we observed in chapter 30, the author of Proverbs mentions the sweetest food, namely honey, which has the further property of irritating the stomach and of causing sickness. He thus fully describes the nature of knowledge. Though great, excellent, noble, and perfect, it is injurious if not kept within bounds or not guarded properly. It is like honey, which gives nourishment and is pleasant when eaten in moderation, but is totally thrown away when eaten immoderately. Therefore it is not said, lest thou be filled and loathe it, but lest thou vomit it. The same idea is expressed in the words, It is not good to eat much honey. Proverbs 25, 27 And in the words, Neither make thyself overwise. Why shouldst thou destroy thyself? Ecclesiastes 7, 16 Compare, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. Ibid 5, 1 The same subject is alluded to in the words of David. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Psalms 131, 2. And in the sayings of our sages, Do not inquire into things which are too difficult for thee. Do not search what is hidden from thee. Study what you are allowed to study, and do not occupy thyself with mysteries. They meant to say, Let thy mind only attempt things which are within human perception. For the study of things which lie beyond man's comprehension is extremely injurious, as has been already stated. This lesson is also contained in the Talmudical passage which begins, He who considers four things, etc., and concludes, He who does not regard the honor of his Creator. 
Here also is given the advice, which we have already mentioned, fide licet, that man should not rashly engage in speculation with false conceptions, and when he is in doubt about anything, or unable to find a proof for the object of his inquiry, he must not at once abandon, reject, and deny it. He must modestly keep back, and from regard to the honor of his Creator, hesitate from uttering an opinion and pause. This has already been explained. It was not the object of the prophets and our sages in these utterances to close the gate of investigation entirely, and to prevent the mind from comprehending what is within its reach, as is imagined by simple and idle people, whom it suits better to put forth their ignorance and incapacity as wisdom and perfection, and to regard the distinction and wisdom of others as irreligion and imperfection, thus taking darkness for light and light for darkness. The whole object of the prophets and the sages was to declare that a limit is set to human reason where it must halt, do not criticize the words used in this chapter and in others in reference to the mind, for we only intended to give some idea of the subject in view, not to describe the essence of the intellect, for other chapters have been dedicated to this subject. End of chapter 32 Part 1, Chapter 33 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 33 You must know that it is very injurious to begin with this branch of philosophy, videlicet metaphysics, or to explain, at first, the sense of the similes occurring in prophecies, and interpret the metaphors which are employed in historical accounts and which abound in the writings of the prophets. On the contrary, it is necessary to initiate the young and to instruct the less intelligent according to their comprehension. For those who appear to be talented and to have capacity for the higher method of study, it is that based on proof and on true logical argument should be gradually advanced towards perfection either by tuition or by self-instruction. He, however, who begins with metaphysics will not only become confused in matters of religion, but will fall into complete infidelity. I compare such a person to an infant fed with wheaten bread, meat, and wine. It will undoubtedly die, not because such food is naturally unfit for the human body, but because of the weakness of the child, who is unable to digest the food and cannot derive benefit from it. The same is the case with the true principles of science. They were presented in enigmas, clad in riddles, and taught by all wise men in the most mysterious way that could be devised, not because they contain some secret evil or are contrary to the fundamental principles of the law, as fools think who are only philosophers in their own eyes, but because of the incapacity of man to comprehend them at the beginning of his studies. Only slight allusions have been made to them to serve for the guidance of those who are capable of understanding them. These sciences were, therefore, called mysteries, sodot, and secrets of the law, sitra Torah, as we shall explain. This also is the reason why the Torah speaks the language of man, as we have explained, for it is the object of the Torah to serve as a guide for the instruction of the young, of women, and of the common people, and as all of them are incapable to comprehend the true sense of the words, tradition was considered sufficient to convey all truths which were to be established, and as regards ideals, only such remarks were made as would lead towards a knowledge of their existence, though not to a comprehension of their true essence. When a man attains to perfection, and arrives at a knowledge of the secrets of the law, either through the assistance of a teacher or by self-instruction, being led by the understanding of one part to the study of the other, he will belong to those who faithfully believe in the true principles, either because of conclusive proof, where proof is possible, or by forcible arguments, where argument is admissible. He will have a true notion of those things which he previously received in similes and metaphors, and he will fully understand their sense. 
We have frequently mentioned in this treatise the principle of our sages not to discuss the Ma'asa Merkaba even in the presence of one pupil, except he be wise and intelligent, and then only the headings of the chapters are to be given to him. We must therefore begin with teaching these subjects according to the capacity of the pupil and on two conditions. First, that he be wise, it est, that he should have successfully gone through the preliminary studies, and secondly, that he be intelligent, talented, clear-headed, and of quick perception, that is, have a mind of his own, mebin mda'ato, as our sages termed it. I will now proceed to explain the reasons why we should not instruct the multitude in pure metaphysics or begin with describing to them the true essence of things or with showing them that a thing must be as it is and cannot be otherwise. This will form the subject of the next chapter, and I proceed to say. End of chapter 33 Part 1, Chapter 34 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 34 There are five reasons why instruction should not begin with metaphysics, but should at first be restricted to pointing out what is fitted for notice and what may be manifest to the multitude. First reason. The subject itself is difficult, subtle, and profound far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? Ecclesiastes 7.24 The following words of Job may be applied to it. Whence then cometh wisdom, and where is the place of understanding? Job 28.20 Instruction should not begin with abstruse and difficult subjects. In one of the similes contained in the Bible, wisdom is compared to water, and amongst other interpretations given by our sages of this simile occurs the following. He who can swim may bring up pearls from the depth of the sea. He who is unable to swim will be drowned. Therefore only such persons as have had proper instruction should expose themselves to the risk. Second reason. The intelligence of man is at first insufficient, for he is not endowed with perfection at the beginning, but at first possesses perfection only in potentia, not in fact. Thus it is said, and man is born a wild ass. Job 11.12 If a man possesses a certain faculty in potentia, it does not follow that it must become in him a reality. He may possibly remain deficient either on account of some obstacle or from want of training and practices which would turn the possibility into a reality. Thus it is distinctly stated in the Bible, Not many are wise, Ibid 32, 9. Also our sages say, I noticed how few were those who attained to a higher degree of perfection. Babylonian Talmud Tractate Sukkah 45a there are many things which obstruct the path to perfection and which keep man away from it. Where can he find sufficient preparation and leisure to learn all that is necessary in order to develop that perfection which he has in potentia? Third reason. The preparatory studies are of long duration, and man, in his natural desire to reach the goal, finds them frequently too wearisome and does not wish to be troubled by them. Be convinced that if man were able to reach the end without preparatory studies, such studies would not be preparatory, but tiresome and utterly superfluous. Suppose you awaken any person, even the most simple, as if from sleep, and you say to him, Do you not desire to know what the heavens are, what is their number and their form, what beings are contained in them, what the angels are? how the creation of the whole world took place, what is its purpose, and what is the relation of its various parts to each other, what is the nature of the soul, how it enters the body, whether it has an independent existence, and if so, how it can exist independently of the body, by what means and to what purpose, and similar problems? 
he would undoubtedly say yes and show a natural desire for the true knowledge of these things, but he will wish to satisfy that desire and to attain to that knowledge by listening to a few words from you. Ask him to interrupt his usual pursuits for a week till he learn all this. He would not do it and would be satisfied and contented with imaginary and misleading notions. He would refuse to believe that there is anything which requires preparatory studies and persevering research. You, however, know how all these subjects are connected together, for there is nothing else in existence but God and his works, the latter including all existing things besides him. We can only obtain a knowledge of him through his works. His works give evidence of his existence and show what must be assumed concerning him, that is to say, what must be attributed to him either affirmatively or negatively. It is thus necessary to examine all things according to their essence, to infer from every species such true and well-established propositions as may assist us in the solution of metaphysical problems. Again, many propositions based on the nature of numbers and the properties of geometrical figures are useful in examining things which must be negatived in reference to God, and these negations will lead us to further inferences. You will certainly not doubt the necessity of studying astronomy and physics if you are desirous of comprehending the relation between the world and providence as it is in reality, and not according to imagination. There are also many subjects of speculation which, though not preparing the way for metaphysics, help to train the reasoning power, enabling it to understand the nature of a proof and to test truth by characteristics essential to it. They remove the confusion arising in the minds of most thinkers who confound accidental with essential properties and likewise the wrong opinions resulting therefrom. We may add that although they do not form the basis for metaphysical research, they assist in forming a correct notion of these things and are certainly useful in many other things connected with that discipline. Consequently, he who wishes to attain to human perfection must therefore first study logic, next the various branches of mathematics in their proper order, then physics, and lastly metaphysics. We find that many who have advanced to a certain point in the study of these disciplines become weary and stop, that others who are endowed with sufficient capacity are interrupted in their studies by death which surprises them while still engaged with the preliminary course. Now if no knowledge whatever had been given to us by means of tradition, and if we had not been brought to the belief in a thing through the medium of similes, we would have been bound to form a perfect notion of things with their essential characteristics, and to believe only what we could prove, a goal which could only be attained by long preparation. In such a case most people would die without having known whether there was a God or not, much less that certain things must be asserted about him, and other things denied as defects. From such a fate not even one of a city or two of a family, Jeremiah 3.14, would have escaped. As regards the privileged few, the remnant whom the Lord calls, Joel 3.5, they only attain the perfection at which they aim after due preparatory labor. The necessity of such a preparation and the need of such a training for the acquisition of real knowledge has been plainly stated by King Solomon in the following words, If the iron be blunt, and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength, and it is profitable to prepare for wisdom. Ecclesiastes 10.10 10. Hear counsel, and receive instruction, that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. Proverbs 19.20 there is still another urgent reason why the preliminary disciplines should be studied and understood. During the study many doubts present themselves, and the difficulties or the objections raised against certain assertions are soon understood, just as the demolition of a building is easier than its erection. 
while on the other hand, it is impossible to prove an assertion or to remove any doubts without having recourse to several propositions taken from these preliminary studies. He who approaches metaphysical problems without proper preparation is like a person who journeys towards a certain place and on the road falls into a deep pit, out of which he cannot rise, and he must perish there. If he had not gone forth, but had remained at home, it would have been better for him. Solomon has expatiated in the book of Proverbs on sluggards and their indolence, by which he figuratively refers to indolence in the search after wisdom. He thus speaks of a man who desires to know the final results, but does not exert himself to understand the preliminary disciplines which lead to them, doing nothing else but desire. The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. He coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. Proverbs 21, 25, and 26. That is to say, if the desire killeth the slothful, it is because he neglects to seek the thing which might satisfy his desire. He does nothing but desire, and hopes to obtain a thing without using the means to reach it. It would be better for him were he without that desire. Observe how the end of the simile throws light on its beginning. It concludes with the words, But the righteous giveth, and spareth not. The antithesis of righteous and slothful can only be justified on the basis of our interpretation. Solomon thus indicates that only such a man is righteous who gives to everything its due portion, that is to say, who gives to the study of a thing the whole time required for it, and does not devote any part of that time to another purpose. The passage may therefore be paraphrased thus, And the righteous man devotes his ways to wisdom, and does not withhold any of them. Compare, give not thy strength unto women. Proverbs 31, 3. The majority of scholars, that is to say the most famous in science, are afflicted with this failing, vide licit, that of hurrying at once to the final results and of speaking about them without treating of the preliminary disciplines. Led by folly or ambition to disregard those preparatory studies for the attainment of which they are either incapable or too idle, some scholars endeavor to prove that these are injurious or superfluous. On reflection, the truth will become obvious. The fourth reason is taken from the physical constitution of man. It has been proved that moral conduct is a preparation for intellectual progress, and that only a man whose character is pure, calm, and steadfast can attain to intellectual perfection, that is, acquire correct conceptions. Many men are naturally so constituted that all perfection is impossible. Exempli gratia, he whose heart is very warm, and is himself very powerful, is sure to be passionate, though he tries to counteract that disposition by training. He whose testicles are warm, humid, and vigorous, and the organs connected therewith are surcharged, will not easily refrain from sin, even if he makes great efforts to restrain himself. You also find persons of great levity and rashness whose excited manners and wild gestures prove that their constitution is in disorder and their temperament so bad that it cannot be cured. Such persons can never attain to perfection. It is utterly useless to occupy oneself with them on such a subject as metaphysics, for this science is, as you know, different from the science of medicine and of geometry, and, from the reason already mentioned, it is not every person who is capable of approaching it. It is impossible for a man to study it successfully without moral preparation. He must acquire the highest degree of uprightness and integrity, for the froward is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. Proverbs 3.32 Therefore it was considered inadvisable to teach it to young men. Nay, it is impossible for them to comprehend it on account of the heat of their blood and the flame of youth, which confuses their minds. 
That heat, which causes all the disorder, must first disappear. They must have become moderate and settled, humble in their hearts, and subdued in their temperament. Only then will they be able to arrive at the highest degree of the perception of God. Id est the study of metaphysics, which is called Maase Merkaba. Compare, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. Psalms 34, 18. I dwell in the high and lofty place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Isaiah 57, 15. Therefore, the rule, the heading of the sections may be confided to him, is further restricted in the Talmud in the following way. The headings of the sections must only be handed down to the Abet Din, president of the court, whose heart is full of care, it est, in whom wisdom is united with humility, meekness, and a great dread of sin. It is further stated there, the secrets of the law can only be communicated to a counselor, scholar, and good orator. These qualities can only be acquired if the physical constitution of the student favor their development. You certainly know that some persons, though exceedingly able, are very weak in giving counsel, while others are ready with proper counsel and good advice in social and political matters. A person so endowed is called counselor, and may be unable to comprehend purely abstract notions, even such as are similar to common sense. He is unacquainted with them, and has no talent whatever for them. We apply to him the words, Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart to it? Proverbs 17.16 Others are intelligent and naturally clear-sighted, able to convey complicated ideas in concise and well-chosen language. Such a person is called a good orator, but he has not been engaged in the pursuit of science or has not acquired any knowledge of it. Those who have actually acquired a knowledge of the sciences are called wise in arts, or scholars. The Hebrew term for wise in arts, chakam harashim, has been explained in the Talmud as implying that when such a man speaks, all become, as it were, speechless. Now consider how in the writings of the rabbis, the admission of a person into discourses on metaphysics is made dependent on distinction in social qualities and study of philosophy as well as the possession of clear-sightedness, intelligence, eloquence, and ability to communicate things by slight allusions. If a person satisfies these requirements, the secrets of the law are confided to him. In the same place, we also read the following passage. Rabbi Yohanan said to Rabbi Alasar, Come, I will teach you Maasa Merkaba. The reply was, I am not yet old. Or in other words, I have not yet become old. I still perceive in myself the hot blood and the rashness of youth. You learn from this that, in addition to the above-named good qualities, a certain age is also required. How then could any person speak on these metaphysical themes in the presence of ordinary people, of children, and of women? Fifth reason, man is disturbed in his intellectual occupation by the necessity of looking after the material wants of the body, especially if the necessity of providing for wife and children be superadded, much more so if he seeks superfluities in addition to his ordinary wants for by custom and bad habits, these become a powerful motive. Even the perfect man to whom we have referred, if too busy with these necessary things, much more so if busy with unnecessary things and filled with a great desire for them, must weaken or altogether lose his desire for study to which he will apply himself with interruption, lassitude, and want of attention. He will not attain to that for which he is fitted by his abilities, or he will acquire imperfect knowledge, a confused mass of true and false ideas. 
For these reasons, it was proper that the study of metaphysics should have been exclusively cultivated by privileged persons and not entrusted to the common people. It is not for the beginner, and he should abstain from it, as the little child has to abstain from taking solid food and from carrying heavy weights. End of chapter 34 Part 1, Chapter 35 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 35 Do not think that what we have laid down in the preceding chapters on the importance, obscurity, and difficulty of the subject and its unsuitableness for communication to ordinary persons includes the doctrine of God's incorporeality and His exemption from all affections, pathé, this is not the case, for in the same way as all people must be informed, and even children must be trained in the belief that God is one, and that none besides Him is to be worshipped, so must all be taught by simple authority that God is incorporeal, that there is no similarity in any way whatsoever between Him and His creatures, that His existence is not like the existence of His creatures, His life not like that of any living being, being, his wisdom not like the wisdom of the wisest of men, and that the difference between him and his creatures is not merely quantitative but absolute, as between two individuals of two different classes. I mean to say that all must understand that our wisdom and his, or our power and his, do not differ quantitatively or qualitatively or in a similar manner, for two things, of which the one is the stronger and the other the weak, are necessarily similar, belong to the same class, and can be included in one definition. The same is the case with all other comparisons. They can only be made between two things belonging to the same class, as has been shown in works on natural science. Anything predicated of God is totally different from our attributes, no definition can comprehend both. Therefore, his existence and that of any other being totally differ from each other, and the term existence is applied to both homonymously, as I shall explain. This suffices for the guidance of children and of ordinary persons who must believe that there is a being existing perfect, incorporeal, not inherent in a body as a force in it, God, who is above all kinds of deficiency, above all affections. But the question concerning the attributes of God, their inadmissibility, and the meaning of those attributes which are ascribed to Him, concerning the creation, His providence, in providing for everything, concerning His will, His perception, His knowledge of everything, concerning prophecy and its various degrees, concerning the meaning of His names which imply the idea of unity, though they are more than one, all these things are very difficult problems. The true secrets of the law, the secrets mentioned so frequently in the books of the prophets and in the words of our teachers, the subjects of which we should only mention the headings of the chapters as we have already stated, and only in the presence of a person satisfying the above-mentioned conditions. That God is incorporeal, that he cannot be compared with his creatures, that he is not subject to external influence, these are things which must be explained to everyone according to his capacity, and they must be taught by way of tradition to children and women, to the stupid and ignorant, as they are taught that God is one, that he is eternal, and that he alone is to be worshipped. Without incorporeality there is no unity, for a corporeal thing is in the first case not simple, but composed of matter and form, which are two separate things by definition, and secondly, as it has extension, it is also divisible. When persons have received this doctrine, and have been trained in this belief, and are in consequence at a loss to reconcile it with the writings of the prophets, the meaning of the latter must be made clear and explained to them by pointing out the homonymity and the figurative application of certain terms discussed in this part of the work. 
Their belief in the unity of God and in the words of the prophets will then be a true and perfect belief. Those who are not sufficiently intelligent to comprehend the true interpretation of these passages in the Bible or to understand that the same term admits of two different interpretations may simply be told that the scriptural passage is clearly understood by the wise, but that they should content themselves with knowing that God is incorporeal, that he is never subject to external influence as passivity implies a change while God is entirely free from all change, that he cannot be compared to anything besides himself, that no definition includes him together with any other being, that the words of the prophets are true, and that difficulties met with may be explained on this principle. This may suffice for that class of persons, and it is not proper to leave them in the belief that God is corporeal or that he has any of the properties of material objects, just as there is no need to leave them in the belief that God does not exist, that there are more gods than one, or that any other being may be worshipped. End of chapter 35 Part 1, Chapter 36 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 36 I shall explain to you when speaking on the attributes of God in what sense we can say that a particular thing pleases him or excites his anger and his wrath, and in reference to certain persons that God was pleased with them, was angry with them, or was in wrath against them. This is not the subject of the present chapter. I intend to explain in it what I am now going to say. You must know that in examining the law and the books of the prophets, you will not find expressions burning anger, provocation, or jealousy applied to God except in reference to idolatry, and that none but the idolater called enemy, adversary, or hater of the Lord. Compare, and ye serve other gods, and then the Lord's wrath will be kindled against you. Deuteronomy 11, 16, and 17. Lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee, etc. Ibid 6.15 To provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. Ibid 31.29 They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. Ibid 32.21 For the Lord thy God is a jealous God. Ibid 6.15 Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? Jeremiah 8.19 Because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. Deuteronomy 32.19 For fire is kindled in mine anger. Ibid 22 The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Nahum 1.2 and repayeth them that hate him. Deuteronomy 7.10 Until he hath driven out his enemies from before him. Numbers 32.21 Which the Lord thy God hateth. Deuteronomy 16.22 For every abomination to the Lord which he hateth have they done unto their gods. Ibid 12.31 Instances like these are innumerable, and if you examine all the examples met with in the holy writings, you will find that they confirm our view. The prophets in their writings laid special stress on this, because it concerns error in reference to God. It est, it concerns idolatry. For if any one believes that exempli gratia, Zayed is standing while in fact he is sitting, he does not deviate from truth so much as one who believes that fire is under the air, or that water is under the earth, or that the earth is a plain, or things similar to these. The latter does not deviate so much from truth as one who believes that the sun consists of fire or that the heavens form a hemisphere and similar things. In the third instance, the deviation from truth is less than the deviation of a man who believes that angels eat and drink and the like. 
The latter again deviates less from truth than one who believes that something besides God is to be worshipped. For ignorance and error concerning a great thing, it est a thing which has a high position in the universe, are of greater importance than those which refer to a thing which occupies a lower place. By error, I mean the belief that a thing is different from what it really is. By ignorance, the want of knowledge respecting things the knowledge of which can be obtained. If a person does not know the measure of the cone or the sphericity of the sun, it is not so important as not to know whether God exists or whether the world exists without God. And if a man assumes that the cone is half of the cylinder or the sun is a circle, it is not so injurious as to believe that God is more than one. You must know that idolaters when worshipping idols do not believe that there is no God besides them, and no idolater ever did assume that any image made of metal, stone, or wood has created the heavens and the earth, and still governs them. Idolatry is founded on the idea that a particular form represents the agent between God and his creatures. This is plainly said in passages like the following, who would not fear thee, O king of nations? Jeremiah 10.7 And in every place incense is offered unto my name. Malachi 1.11 By my name allusion is made to the being which is called by them, id es the idolaters, the first cause. We have already explained this in our larger work, Mishneh Torah, part 1 on idolatry, chapter 1 and none of our co-religionists can doubt it. The infidels, however, though believing in the existence of the Creator, attack the exclusive prerogative of God, namely the service and worship which was commanded in order that the belief of the people in His existence should be firmly established in the words, And you shall serve the Lord, etc. Exodus 23.25 by transferring that prerogative to other beings, they cause the people who only notice the rites without comprehending their meaning or the true character of the being which is worshipped to renounce their belief in the existence of God. They were therefore punished with death. Compare, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth. Deuteronomy 20.16 the object of this commandment, as is distinctly stated, is to extirpate that false opinion in order that other men should not be corrupted by it any more. In the words of the Bible, that they teach you not, etc. Ibid 18. They are called enemies, foes, adversaries. By worshipping idols they are said to provoke God to jealousy, anger, and wrath. How great, then, must be the offense of him who has a wrong opinion of God himself and believes him to be different from what he truly is. It est, assumes that he does not exist, that he consists of two elements, that he is corporeal, that he is subject to external influence or ascribes to him any defect whatever. Such a person is undoubtedly worse than he who worships idols in the belief that they, as agents, can do good or evil. Therefore bear in mind that by the belief in the corporeality or in anything connected with corporeality, you would provoke God to jealousy and wrath, kindle his fire and anger, become his foe, his enemy, and his adversary in a higher degree than by the worship of idols. If you think that there is an excuse for those who believe in the corporeality of God on the ground of their training, their ignorance of their defective comprehension, you must make the same concession to the worshipper of idols. Their worship is due to ignorance or to early training. They continue in the custom of their fathers. Babylonian Talmud, Tractate Chulin, 13a.
you will perhaps say that the literal interpretation of the Bible causes men to fall into that doubt, but you must know that idolaters were likewise brought to their belief by false imaginations and ideas. There is no excuse whatever for those who, being unable to think for themselves, do not accept the doctrine of the incorporeality of God from the true philosophers. I do not consider those men as infidels who are unable to prove the incorporeality, but I hold those to be so who do not believe it, especially when they see that Onkelos and Jonathan avoid in reference to God expressions implying corporeality as much as possible. This is all I intended to say in this chapter. End of chapter 36「Part 1 Chapter 37 of the Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 37 The Hebrew term panim, face, is homonymous. Most of its various meanings have a figurative character. It denotes in the first place the face of a living being. Compare, and all faces are turned into paleness. Jeremiah 36. Wherefore are your faces so sad? Genesis 47. In this sense the term occurs frequently. The next meaning of the word is anger. Compare, and her anger, Paneha, was gone. 1 Samuel 1, 18. Accordingly, the term is frequently used in reference to God in the sense of anger and wrath. Compare, the anger, Pene, of the Lord hath divided them. Lamentations 4.16 The anger, Pene, of the Lord is against them that do evil. Psalms 34.17 Mine anger, Panai, shall go, and I will give thee rest. Exodus 33.14 then will I set mine anger, Panai, Leviticus 23. There are many other instances. Another meaning of the word is the presence and existence of a person. Compare, he died in the presence, Pene, it est in the lifetime of all his brethren, Genesis 25:18, And in the presence, Pene, of all the people, I will be glorified. Leviticus 10.3 He will surely curse thee in thy very presence. Paneka. Job 1.11 In the same sense the word is used in the following passage. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face. Id est both being present without any intervening medium between them. Compare. Come, let us look one another in the face. 2 Kings 14.8 And also the Lord talked with you face to face. Deuteronomy 5.4 Instead of which we read more plainly in another place, ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude, only ye heard a voice. Ibid 4.12 The hearing of the voice without seeing any similitude is termed face to face. Similarly do the words, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, correspond to there he heard the voice of one speaking unto him. Numbers 7.89 In the description of God speaking to Moses. Thus it will be clear to you that the perception of the divine voice without the intervention of an angel is expressed by face to face. In the same sense, the word panim must be understood in, and my face, panai, shall not be seen. Exodus 33.23 It est, my true existence as it is cannot be comprehended. The word panim is also used in Hebrew as an adverb of place, in the sense of before or between the hands. In this sense, it is frequently employed in reference to God, so also in the passage, And my face, panai, shall not be seen. 
according to Ankalos, who renders it, and those before me shall not be seen. He finds here an allusion to the fact that there are also higher created beings of such superiority that their true nature cannot be perceived by man. Videlicet the ideals, separate intellects which in their relation to God are described as being constantly before him or between his hands. Id est as enjoying uninterruptedly the closest attention of divine providence. He, it is Onkelos, considers that the things which are described as completely perceptible are those beings which, as regards existence, are inferior to the ideals, vide licet, substance and form, in reference to which we are told, and thou shalt see that which is behind me, Ibid. It is beings from which, as it were, I turn away, and which I leave behind me. This figure is to represent the utter remoteness of such beings from the deity. You shall later on, chapter 54, hear my explanation of what Moses our teacher asked for. The word is also used as an adverb of time, meaning before. Compare, in former time, lefanim in Israel, Ruth 4, 7, of old, lefanim, Hast thou laid the foundation of the earth? Psalms 102.25 Another signification of the word is attention and regard. Compare, thou shalt not have regard, pene, to the poor. Leviticus 20.15 And a person receiving attention, panim. Isaiah 3.3 3. What does not show regard, panim, etc. Deuteronomy 10.17, etc. The word panim, face, has a similar signification in the blessing, The Lord turn his face to thee. It est, the Lord let his providence accompany thee and give thee peace. End of chapter 37「Part 1, Chapter 38 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides – this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 38 The Hebrew term achor is a homonym. It is a noun signifying back. Compare behind achare the tabernacle. Exodus 36, 12 The spear came out behind him. Acharav, 2 Samuel 2, 23 It is next used in reference to time signifying after. Neither after him, Acharav, arose there any like him. 2 Kings 23.25 After Achar, these things. Genesis 15.1 In this sense, the word occurs frequently. The term includes also the idea of following a thing and of conforming with the moral principles of some other being. Compare, ye shall walk after Achare, the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 13.5 They shall walk after Achare, the Lord. Hosea 11.10 It est, follow his will, walk in the way of his actions, and imitate his virtues. He walked after Achare, the commandment. Ibid 5.11 in this sense the word occurs in Exodus 33.20, And thou shalt see my back, achorai, thou shalt perceive that which follows me, is similar to me, and is the result of my will. It est all things created by me, as will be explained in the course of this treatise. End of chapter 38 Part 1, Chapter 39 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 39 The Hebrew leb, heart, is a homonymous noun signifying that organ which is the source of life to all beings possessing a heart. Compare, and thrust them through the heart of Absalom. 1 Samuel 18.4 this organ being in the middle of the body, the word has been figuratively applied to express the middle part of a thing. Compare, unto the midst, leb, of heaven, Deuteronomy 4.11. The midst, lebat, of fire, 
Exodus 3, 2. It further denotes thought, compare, went not mine heart with thee? 2 Kings 5, 26. It est, I was with thee in my thought when a certain event happened. Similarly must be explained, and that ye seek not after your own heart. Numbers 15.39, id est, after your own thoughts, whose heart, id est, whose thought, turneth away this day. Deuteronomy 29.18. The word further signifies counsel, compare. All the rest of Israel were of one heart, id est, had one plan, to make David king. 1 Chronicles 12.38. But fools die for want of heart, id est of counsel. My heart, id est my counsel, shall not turn away from this so long as I live. Job 27, 6. For this sentence is preceded by the words, My righteousness I hold fast, and will not let it go. And then follows, My heart shall never turn away from this. As regards the expression, Yecheraf, I think that it may be compared with the same verb in the form nechrefet, a handmaid betrothed nechrefet to a man, Leviticus 19.20, where nechrefet is similar in meaning to the Arabic monharifat, turning away, and signifies turning from the state of slavery to that of marriage. Leb, heart, denotes also will. Compare, and I shall give you pastors according to my will. Libby, Jeremiah 3.15. Is thine heart right as my heart is? 2 Kings 10.15. It est, is thy will right as my will is? In this sense, the word has been figuratively applied to God. Compare, that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my soul. 1 Samuel 2.35 Id est according to my will, and mine eyes and mine heart. Id est my providence and my will shall be there perpetually. 1 Kings 9.3 The word is also used in the sense of understanding. Compare, for vain man will be endowed with a heart. Job 11.12 Id est will be wise. A wise man's heart is at his right hand. Ecclesiastes 10.2 It est, his understanding is engaged in perfect thoughts, the highest problems. Instances of this kind are numerous. It is in this sense, namely, that of understanding, that the word is used whenever figuratively applied to God. But exceptionally, it is also used in the sense of will. It must in each passage be explained in accordance with the context. Also, in the following and similar passages, it signifies understanding. Consider it in thine heart, Deuteronomy 4.39, and none considereth in his heart, Isaiah 44.19. Thus also, yet the Lord hath not given you an heart to perceive, is identical in its meaning with, Unto thee it was shown that thou mightest know. Deuteronomy 4.35 As to the passage, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, Ibid 6.5 I explain with all thine heart to mean with all the powers of thine heart, that is, with all the powers of the body, for they all have their origin in the heart, and the sense of the entire passage is, make the knowledge of God the aim of all thy actions, as we have stated in our commentary on the Mishnah, Abot, 8 chapters, 5, and in our Mishnah Torah, Yesod de HaTorah, chapter 2, 2. End of chapter 39「Ruach」is a homonym, signifying air, that is, one of the four elements. Compare, and the air of God moved. Genesis 1-2. It denotes also wind. Compare, and the east wind, Ruach, brought the locusts. Exodus 10.13 West Wind, Ruach, Ibid, 19 In this sense, the word occurs frequently. 
Next, it signifies breath. Compare a breath, ruach, that passed away and does not come again. Psalms 78, 39. Wherein is the breath, ruach, of life? Genesis 7, 15. It signifies also that which remains of man after his death and is not subject to destruction. Compare, and the spirit, ruach, shall return unto God who gave it. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Another signification of this word is the divine inspiration of the prophets whereby they prophesy, as we shall explain when speaking on prophecy as far as it is opportune to discuss the subject in a treatise like this. Compare, and I will take of the spirit, ruach, which is upon thee, and will put it upon them. Numbers 11.17 And it came to pass when the spirit, ruach, rested upon them. Ibid 25 The spirit, ruach, of the Lord spake by me. 2 Samuel 13.2 The term is frequently used in this sense. The meaning of intention, will, is likewise contained in the word ruach. Compare. A fool uttereth all his spirit, ruach, Proverbs 29, 11, id est, his intention and will. And the spirit, ruach, of Egypt shall fail in the midst thereof, and I will destroy the counsel thereof. Isaiah 19, 3, id est, her intentions will be frustrated, and her plans will be obscured. Who has comprehended the spirit, ruach, of the Lord, or who is familiar with his counsel that he may tell us? Isaiah 40, 13. It is, who knows the order fixed by his will, or perceives the system of his providence in the existing world that he may tell us, as we shall explain in the chapters in which we shall speak on providence. Thus the Hebrew, ruach, when used in reference to God, has generally the fifth signification. Sometimes, however, as explained above, the last signification, videlicet, will. The meaning of the word in each individual case is therefore to be determined by the context. End of chapter 40 Part 1, Chapter 41 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 41. The Hebrew nefesh, soul, is a homonymous noun signifying the vitality which is common to all living, sentient beings, exempli gratia, wherein there is a living soul, nefesh, Genesis 1.30. It denotes also blood, as in, Thou shalt not eat the blood, nefesh, with the meat, Deuteronomy 12.23. Another signification of the term is reason, that is, the distinguishing characteristic of man, as in, As the Lord liveth that made us this soul, Jeremiah 38.16. It denotes also the part of man that remains after his death, nefesh, soul, compare, but the soul, nefesh, of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life. 1 Samuel 25, 29. Lastly, it denotes will. Compare, to bind his princes at his will. Be nuptial. Psalms 105, 22. Thou wilt not deliver me unto the will, be nefesh, of my enemies. Psalms 41, 3. And according to my opinion, it has this meaning also in the following passages. If it be your will, nafshirkim, that I should bury my dead. Genesis 23, 8. Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my will, nefshi, could not be toward this people. Jeremiah 15, 1. That is, I had no pleasure in them. I did not wish to preserve them. When nefesh is used in reference to God, it has the meaning will, as we have already explained with reference to the passage, that shall do according to that which is in my will, be lebebi, and in mine intention, be nefshi, 1 Samuel 2.35. Similarly, we explain the phrase, and his will, nefsho, 
to trouble Israel ceased. Judges 10.16 Jonathan the son of Uzziel in the Targum of the Prophets did not translate this passage because he understood Nefshi to have the first signification and finding therefore in these words sensation ascribed to God, he omitted them from his translation. If, however, nefesh be here taken in the last signification, the sentence can well be explained. For in the passage which precedes, it is stated that providence abandoned the Israelites and left them on the brink of death. Then they cried and prayed for help, but in vain. When, however, they had thoroughly repented, when their misery had increased and their enemy had had power over them, he showed mercy to them, and his will to continue their trouble and misery ceased. Note it well, for it is remarkable. The preposition the in this passage has the force of the preposition mean, from, or of, and ba'amal is identical with ma'amal. Grammarians give many instances of this use of the preposition ba, and that which remaineth of ba, the flesh, and of ba. The bread, Leviticus 8.32. If there remains but few of, ba, the years, Ibid 25.52. Of, ba, the strangers, and of, ba, those born in the land, Exodus 12.19. End of chapter 41. Part 1, Chapter 42 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 42 Hai, living, signifies a sentient organism, literally growing and having sensation. Compare every moving thing that liveth, Genesis 9, 3. It also denotes recovery from a severe illness, and was recovered, va yachi of his sickness. Isaiah 38, 9. In the camp till they recovered, Chayyotam. Joshua 5, 8. Quick, raw, Chay, flesh. Leviticus 13, 10. Mavet signifies death and severe illness, as in, his heart died, the Yamut, within him, and he became as a stone. 1 Samuel 25, 37. That is, his illness was severe. For this reason it is stated concerning the son of the woman of Zarephath, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. 1 Kings 17.17 17. The simple expression, Vayamot, would have given the idea that he was very ill, near death, like Nabal, when he heard what had taken place. Some of the Andalusian authors say that his breath was suspended so that no breathing could be perceived at all, as sometimes an invalid is seized with a fainting fit or an attack of asphyxia and it cannot be discovered whether he is alive or dead. In this condition the patient may remain a day or two. The term chai has also been employed in reference to the acquisition of wisdom. Compare so shall they be life, chayim, unto thy soul. Proverbs 3.22 For whoso findeth me, findeth life. Ibid 8.35 For they are life, chayim, to those that find them. Ibid 4.22 Such instances are numerous. In accordance with this metaphor, true principles are called life, and corrupt principles death. Thus the Almighty says, See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. Deuteronomy 30.15 Showing that life and good, death and evil are identical. And then he explains these terms. In the same way I understand his words, That ye may live. Ibid 5.33 In accordance with the traditional interpretation of That it may be well with thee. Skilichet in the life to come. Ibid 22.7 In consequence of the frequent use of this figure in our language, our sages say, The righteous even in death are called living, while the wicked even in life are called dead. Babylonian Talmud Tractate Berakot, page 78. Note this well. End of chapter 42.
Part 1, Chapter 43 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 43. The Hebrew kanaf is a homonym. Most of its meanings are metaphorical. Its primary signification is wing of a flying creature, exempli gratia, any winged kanaf, fowl that flieth in the air. Deuteronomy 4.17. The term was next applied figuratively to the wings or corners of garments. Compare, upon the four corners, confort of thy vesture, Ibid 22.12. It was also used to denote the ends of the inhabited part of the earth, and the corners that are most distant from our habitation. Compare, that it might take hold of the ends, confort of the earth, Job 38.13, from the uttermost part Kenaf of the earth have we heard songs, Isaiah 24, 16. Ibn Ganah, in his book of Hebrew Roots, says that Kenaf is used in the sense of concealing in analogy with the Arabic, Kenaf to I have hidden something, and accordingly explains Isaiah thirty twenty, and thy teacher will no longer be hidden or concealed. It is a good explanation, and I think that Kanaf has the same meaning in Deuteronomy 23.1. He shall not take away the cover, Kanaf, of his father. Also in, spread therefore thy cover, Kanafika, over thine handmaid, Ruth 3.9. In this sense, I think the word is figuratively applied to God and to angels, for angels are not corporeal, according to my opinion, as I shall explain. Ruth 2.12 must therefore be translated under whose protection enough of thou art come to trust. And wherever the word occurs in reference to angels, it means concealment. You have surely noticed the words of Isaiah, Isaiah 6.2, With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet. Their meaning is this, the cause of his angel's existence is hidden and concealed. This is meant by the covering of the face. The things of which he, the angel, is the cause, and which are called his feet, as I stated in speaking of the homonym regal, are likewise concealed. For the actions of the intelligences are not seen, and their ways are, except after long study, not understood on account of two reasons, the one of which is contained in their own properties, the other in ourselves. That is to say, because our perception is imperfect, and the ideals are difficult to be fully comprehended. As regards the phrase, and with twain he flieth, I shall explain in a special chapter, 49, why flight has been attributed to angels. End of chapter 43 Part 1, Chapter 44 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 44 The Hebrew ayin is a homonym signifying fountain, exempli gratia, by a fountain in of water, Genesis 16.7. It next denotes I, compare ayin, eye for eye, Exodus 21.24. Another meaning of the word is providence, as it is said concerning Jeremiah, Take him and direct thine attention, Eneka, to him. Jeremiah 39.12 In this figurative sense, it is to be understood when used in reference to God. Exempli gratia, and my providence and my pleasure shall be there perpetually. 1 Kings 9.3 As we have already explained, page 140, the eyes, ene, it is the providence of the Lord thy God, are always upon it. Deuteronomy 11.12 They are the eyes, ene, of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Zechariah 4.10 It est, his providence is extended over everything that is on earth, as will be explained in the chapters in which we shall treat of providence. When, however, the word I is connected with the verb to see, rah or chazah, as in open thine eyes and see, 1 Kings 19.16, his eyes behold, Psalms 11.4, the phrase denotes perception of the mind, not that of the senses. 
for every sensation is a passive state, as is well known to you, and God is active, never passive, as will be explained by me. End of chapter 44 Part 1, Chapter 45 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 45 Shama is used homonymously. It signifies to hear and also to obey. As regards the first signification, compare, neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. Exodus 13.13 13. And the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house. Genesis 45.16 Instances of this kind are numerous. Equally frequent are the instances of this verb being used in the sense of to obey. And they hearkened, shema o not, unto Moses. Exodus 6.9 If they obey, yishme o, and serve him. Job 36.11 Shall we then hearken, nishma, unto you. Nehemiah 13.27 Whosoever will not hearken, Yishma, unto thy words. Joshua 1.18 The verb also signifies to know, to understand. Compare, a nation whose tongue, id est, its language. Thou shalt not understand. Tishma. Deuteronomy 28.49 The verb Shama, used in reference to God, must be taken in the sense of perceiving, which is part of the third signification, whenever, according to the literal interpretation of the passage, it appears to have the first meaning. Compare. And the Lord heard. Numbers 11.1 1, For that he heareth your murmurings. Exodus 16.7 In all such passages, mental perception is meant. When, however, according to the literal interpretation, the verb appears to have the second signification, it implies that God responded to the prayer of man and fulfilled his wish, or did not respond and did not fulfill his wish. I will surely hear his cry. Exodus 22:23. I will hear, for I am gracious. Ibid 27. Bow down thine ear and hear. 2 Kings 19.16 But the Lord would not hearken to your voice, nor give ear unto you. Deuteronomy 1.45 Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Isaiah 1.15 For I will not hear thee. Jeremiah 7.16 There are many instances in which Shama has the sense. Remarks will now be presented to you on these metaphors and similes, which will quench your thirst and explain to you all their meanings without leaving a doubt. End of chapter 45。Part 1, Chapter 46 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 46 we have already stated in one of the chapters of this treatise that there is a great difference between bringing to view the existence of a thing and demonstrating its true essence. We can lead others to notice the existence of an object by pointing to its accidents, actions, or even most remote relations to other objects. Exempli gratia. If you wish to describe the king of a country to one of his subjects, who does not know him, you can give a description and an account of his existence in many ways. You will either say to him, The tall man with a fair complexion and gray hair is the king, thus describing him by his accidents. Or you will say, The king is the person round whom are seen a great multitude of men on horses and on foot and soldiers with drawn swords, over whose head banners are waving, and before whom trumpets are sounded. Or it is the person living in the palace in a particular region of a certain country. Or it is the person who ordered the building of that wall, or the construction of that bridge, or by some other similar acts and things relating to him. His existence can be demonstrated in a still more indirect way, exempli gratia, if you are asked whether this land has a king, you will undoubtedly answer in the affirmative. What proof have you? 
the fact that this banker here, a weak and little person, stands before this large mass of gold pieces, and the poor man, tall and strong, who stands before him asking in vain for alms of the weight of a carob grain, is rebuked, and is compelled to go away by the mere force of words, for had he not feared the king, he would, without hesitation, have killed the banker, or pushed him away and taken as much of the money as he could. Consequently, this is a proof that this country has a ruler, and his existence is proved by the well-regulated affairs of the country, on account of which the king is respected, and the punishments decreed by him are feared. In this whole example nothing is mentioned that indicated his characteristics and his essential properties, by virtue of which he is king. The same is the case with the information concerning the Creator given to the ordinary classes of men in all prophetical books and in the law. For it was found necessary to teach all of them that God exists, and that He is in every respect the most perfect being, that is to say, He exists not only in the sense in which the earth and the heavens exist, but He exists and possesses life, wisdom, power, activity, and all other properties which our belief in His existence must include, as will be shown below. That God exists was therefore shown to ordinary men by means of similes taken from physical bodies, that he is living by a simile taken from motion, because ordinary men consider only the body as fully, truly, and undoubtedly existing. That which is connected with a body, but is itself not a body, although believed to exist, has a lower degree of existence on account of its dependence on the body for existence. That, however, which is neither itself a body nor a force within a body is not existent according to man's first notions, and is above all excluded from the range of imagination. In the same manner motion is considered by the ordinary man as identical with life. What cannot move voluntarily from place to place has no life, although motion is not part of the definition of life but an accident connected with it. The perception by the senses, especially by hearing and seeing, is best known to us. We have no idea or notion of any other mode of communication between the soul of one person and that of another than by means of speaking, id est, by the sound produced by lips, tongue, and the other organs of speech. When, therefore, we are to be informed that God has a knowledge of things, and that communication is made by him to the prophets who convey it to us, they represent him to us as seeing and hearing, id est, as perceiving and knowing those things which can be seen and heard. They represent him to us as speaking, id est, that communications from him reach the prophets, that is to be understood by the term prophecy, as will be fully explained. God is described as working because we do not know any other mode of producing a thing except by direct touch. He is said to have a soul in the sense that he is living, because all living beings are generally supposed to have a soul, although the term soul is, as has been shown, a homonym. Again, since we perform all these actions only by means of corporeal organs, we figuratively ascribe to God the organs of locomotion as feet and their souls, organs of hearing, seeing, and smelling as ear, eye, and nose, organs and substance of speech as mouth, tongue, and sound, organs for the performance of work as hand, its fingers, its palm, and the arm, in short, these organs of the body are figuratively ascribed to God, who is above all imperfection, to express that he performs certain acts, and these acts are figuratively ascribed to him, to express that he possesses certain perfections different from those acts themselves. Exemple gratia, we say that he has eyes, ears, hands, a mouth, a tongue, to express that he sees, hears, acts, and speaks. But seeing and hearing are attributed to him to indicate simply that he perceives. You thus find in Hebrew instances in which the perception of the one sense is named instead of the other. 
Thus, see the word of the Lord, Jeremiah 2.31, in the same meaning as hear the word of the Lord, for the sense of the phrase is, perceive what he says. Similarly, the phrase, see the smell of my son, Genesis 27.27, has the same meaning as smell the smell of my son, for it relates to the perception of the smell. In the same way are used the words, And all the people saw the thunders and the lightnings, Exodus 20.15, although the passage also contains the description of a prophetical vision, as is well known and understood among our people. Action and speech are likewise figuratively applied to God, to express that a certain influence has emanated from Him, as will be explained chapter 65 and chapter 66. The physical organs which are attributed to God in the writings of the prophets are either organs of locomotion, indicating life, organs of sensation, indicating perception, organs of touch, indicating action, or organs of speech, indicating the divine inspiration of the prophets, as will be explained. The object of all these indications is to establish in our minds the notion of the existence of a living being, the maker of everything, who also possesses a knowledge of the things which he has made. We shall explain when we come to speak of the inadmissibility of divine attributes that all these various attributes convey but one notion, vide licet, that of the essence of God. The sole object of this chapter is to explain in what sense physical organs are ascribed to the most perfect being, namely, that they are mere indications of the actions generally performed by means of these organs, such actions being perfections respecting ourselves, are predicated of God because we wish to express that He is most perfect in every respect as we remarked above in explaining the rabbinical phrase, the language of the Torah is like the language of man. Instances of organs of locomotion being applied to the Creator occur as follows. My footstool, Isaiah 66.1, the place of the soles of my feet, Ezekiel 43.7, For examples of organs of touch applied to God, compare the hand of the Lord, Exodus 9.3, with the finger of God, Ibid 31.18, the work of thy fingers, Psalms 8.4, and thou hast laid thine hand upon me, Ibid 139.5, the arm of the Lord, Isaiah 53.1, thy right hand, O Lord, Exodus 15.6. In instances like the following, organs of speech are attributed to God. The mouth of the Lord has spoken, Isaiah 1.20, and he would open his lips against thee, Job 11.5. The voice of the Lord is powerful, Psalms 29.4, and his tongue as a devouring fire, Isaiah 30.27. Organs of sensation are attributed to God in instances like the following. His eyes behold, his eyelids try, Psalms 11.4. The eyes of the Lord which run to and fro, Zechariah 4.10. Bow down thine ear unto me and hear, 2 Kings 19.16. You have kindled a fire in my nostril, Jeremiah 18.5. Of the inner parts of the human body, only the heart is figuratively applied to God, because heart is a homonym and denotes also intellect. It is besides the source of animal life. In phrases like, My bowels are troubled for him, Jeremiah 31.20, The sounding of thy bowels, Isaiah 63.15, The term bowels is used in the sense of heart, for the term bowels is used both in a general and in a specific meaning. It denotes specifically bowels, but more generally it can be used as the name of any inner organ, including heart. The correctness of this argument can be proved by the phrase, And thy law is within my bowels, Psalms 49, which is identical with, And thy law is within my heart.
For that reason, the prophet employed in this verse the phrase, My bowels are troubled, and the sounding of thy bowels. The verb, hama, is in fact used more frequently in connection with heart than with any other organ. Compare, my heart maketh a noise, home, in me. Jeremiah 4.19 Similarly, the shoulder is never used as a figure in reference to God because it is known as a mere instrument of transport and also comes into close contact with the thing which it carries. With far greater reason, the organs of nutrition are never attributed to God. They are at once recognized as signs of imperfection. In fact, all organs, both the external and the internal, are employed in the various actions of the soul. Some, as exemple gratia, all inner organs, are the means of preserving the individual for a certain time. Others, as the organs of generation, are the means of preserving the species. Others are the means of improving the condition of man and bringing his actions to perfection, as the hands, the feet, and the eyes, all of which tend to render motion, action, and perception more perfect. Animate beings require motion in order to be able to approach that which is conducive to their welfare and to move away from the opposite. They require the senses in order to be able to discern what is injurious to them and what is beneficial. In addition, man requires various kinds of handiwork to prepare his food, clothing, and dwelling, and he is compelled by his physical constitution to perform such work, namely, to prepare what is good for him. And he is compelled by his physical constitution to perform such work, namely, to prepare what is good for him. Some kinds of work also occur among certain animals, as far as such work is required by those animals. I do not believe that any man can doubt the correctness of the assertion that the Creator is not in need of anything for the continuance of His existence or for the improvement of His condition. Therefore, God has no organs, or, what is the same, He is not corporeal. His actions are accomplished by His essence, not by any organ, and as undoubtedly physical forces are connected with the organs, He does not possess any such forces. That is to say, He has, besides His essence, nothing that could be the cause of His action, His knowledge, or His will, for attributes are nothing but forces under a different name. It is not my intention to discuss the question in this chapter. Our sages laid down a general principle by which the literal sense of the physical attributes of God mentioned by the prophets is rejected, a principle which evidently shows that our sages were far from the belief in the corporeality of God and that they did not think any person capable of misunderstanding it or entertaining any doubt about it. For that reason they employ in the Talmud and in the Midrashim phrases similar to those contained in the prophecies, without any circumlocution. They knew that there could not be any doubt about their metaphorical character or any danger whatever of their being misunderstood, and that all such expressions would be understood as figurative language employed to communicate to the intellect the notion of his existence. Now it was well known that in figurative language God is compared to a king who commands, cautions, punishes, and rewards his subjects, and whose servants and attendants publish his orders so that they might be acted upon, and they also execute whatever he wishes. Thus the sages adopted that figure, used it frequently, and introduced such speech, consent, and refusal of a king and other usual acts of kings as became necessary by that figure. In all these instances they were sure that no doubt or confusion would arise from it. The general principle alluded to above is contained in the following saying of our sages mentioned in Berashit Rabbah, chapter 28. Great was the power of the prophets. They compared the creature to its creator. Compare, and over the resemblance of the throne was a resemblance like the appearance of man. Ezekiel 1.26 they have thus plainly stated that all those images which the prophets perceived, id est in prophetic visions, are images created by God. This is perfectly correct, for every image in our imagination has been created. How pregnant is the expression, great is their boldness.
they indicated by it that they themselves found it very remarkable, for whenever they perceived a word or act difficult to explain or apparently objectionable, they used that phrase, exempli gratia, a certain rabbi has performed the act of Khali Ah with a slipper, alone, and by night. Another rabbi thereupon exclaimed, How great is his boldness to have followed the opinion of the minority. The Kelde phrase Rab Gubre in the original of the latter quotation and the Hebrew Gado Koho in that of the former quotation have the same meaning. Vide Lichet, great is the power of or the boldness of. Hence, in the preceding quotation, the sense is how remarkable is the language which the prophets were obliged to to use when they speak of God the Creator in terms signifying properties of beings created by Him. This deserves attention. Our sages have thus stated in distinct and plain terms that they are far from believing in the corporeality of God, and in the figures and forms seen in a prophetical vision, though belonging to created beings, the prophets, to use the words of our sages, compared the creature to its creator. If, however, after these explanations any one wishes out of malice to cavil at them and to find fault with them, though their method is neither comprehended nor understood by him, the sages of blessed memory will sustain no injury by it. End of chapter 46「Part 1 Chapter 47 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 47 We have already stated several times that the prophetic books never attribute to God anything which ordinary men consider a defect, of which they cannot, in their imagination, combine with the idea of the Almighty, although such terms may not otherwise be different from those which were employed as metaphors in relation to God. Indeed, all things which are attributed to God are considered in some way to be perfection, or can at least be imagined as appertaining to Him. We must now show why, according to this principle, the senses of hearing, sight, and smell are attributed to God, but not those of taste and touch. He is equally elevated above the use of all the five senses. They are all defective as regards perception, even for those who have no other source of knowledge, because they are passive, receive impressions from without, and are subject to interruptions and sufferings, as much as the other organs of the body. By saying that God sees, we mean to state that he perceives visible things. He hears is identical with saying he perceives audible things, in the same way we might say he tastes and he touches, in the sense of he perceives objects which man perceives by means of taste and touch. For, as regards perception, the senses are identical. If we deny the existence of one sensation in God, we must deny that of all other sensations. It is the perceptions of the five senses. And if we attribute the existence of one sensation to him, it is the perception appertaining to one of the senses, we must attribute all the five sensations. Nevertheless, we find in Holy Writ, And God saw, Genesis 6.5, and God heard, Numbers 11.1, 1. and God smelt, Genesis 8.21. But we do not meet with the expressions, and God tasted, and God touched. According to our opinion, the reason of this is to be found in the idea, which is a firm hold in the mind of all men, that God does not come into contact with a body in the same manner as one body comes into contact with another, since he is not even seen by the eye. While these two senses, namely taste and touch, only act when in close contact with the object, by sight, hearing, and smell, even distant objects are perceived. These, therefore, were considered by the multitude appropriate expressions to be figuratively applied to God. Besides, the object in figuratively applying the sensations to him could only have been to express that he perceives our actions. 
But hearing and sight are sufficient for that, namely, for the perception of what a man does or says. Thus our sages, among other admonitions, gave the following advice and warning, Know what is above thee, a seeing eye, and a hearing ear. Mishnah Abot 2.1 You, however, know that, strictly speaking, the condition of all the sensations is the same, that the same argument which is employed against the existence of touch and taste in God may be used against sight, hearing, and smell, for they all are material perceptions and impressions which are subject to change. There is only this difference, that the former, touch and taste, are at once recognized as deficiencies, while the others are considered as perfections. In a similar manner the defect of imagination is easily seen, less easily that of thinking and reasoning. Imagination, ra'yon, therefore, was never employed as a figure in speaking of God, while thought and reason are figuratively ascribed to him. Compare the thoughts which the Lord thought, Jeremiah 49.20, and with his understanding he stretched out the heavens, Ibid 10.12. The inner senses were thus treated in the same way as the external. Some are figuratively applied to God, some not. All this is according to the language of man. He ascribes to God what he considers a perfection and does not ascribe to him what he considers a defect. In truth, however, no real attribute implying an addition to his essence can be applied to him, as will be proved. End of chapter 47「Part 1, Chapter 48 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 48 Whenever in the Pentateuch the term to hear is applied to God, Onkelos, the proselyte, does not translate it literally, but paraphrases it, merely expressing that a certain speech reached him. It est, he perceived it, or that he accepted it, or did not accept, when it refers to supplication and prayer as its object. The words, God heard, are therefore paraphrased by him regularly, either, it was heard before the Lord, or, he accepted. When employed in reference to supplication and prayer, exempli gratia, I will surely accept, literally, I will surely hear, Exodus 22.22. 22. This principle is followed by Onkelos in his translation of the Pentateuch without any exception, but as regards the verb to see, ra, his renderings vary in a remarkable manner, and I was unable to discern his principle or method. In some instances he translates literally, and God saw. In others he paraphrases, it was revealed before the Lord. The use of the phrase Vahaza Adonai by Onkelos is sufficient evidence that the term Chaza in Kelde is homonymous, and that it denotes mental perception as well as the sensation of sight. This being the case, I am surprised that in some instances, avoiding the literal rendering, he substituted for it, and it was revealed before the Lord. When I, however, examined the various readings in the version of Onkelos, which I either saw myself or heard from others during the time of my studies, I found that the term to see, when connected with wrong, injury, or violence, was paraphrased, it was manifest before the Lord. There is no doubt that the term Chaza in Kelde denotes complete apprehension and reception of the object in the state in which it has been perceived. When Onkelos, therefore, found the verb to see connected with the object wrong, he did not render it literally, but paraphrased it, it was revealed before the Lord. Now, I notice that in all instances of the Pentateuch where seen is ascribed to God, he translated it literally, except those instances which I will mention to you. For my affliction was revealed before the Lord, Genesis 29.32, For all that Laban doeth unto thee is revealed before me, Ibid 31.12. 
Although the first person in the sentence refers to the angel and not to God, Onkelos does not ascribe to him that perception which implies complete comprehension of the object, because the object is iniquity. The oppression of the children of Israel was known to the Lord. Exodus 2.25 The oppression of my people was surely known to me. Ibid 3.7 The affliction is known to me. Ibid 9 The oppression is known to me. Ibid 4.31 This people is known to me. Ibid 32.9 It est the rebellion is known to me. Compare the Targum of the passage, And God saw the children of Israel, Ibid 2.25, which is equal to, He saw their affliction and their trouble, and it was known to the Lord, and he abhorred them. Deuteronomy 32.19 It was known to him that their power was gone. Ibid 36 in this instance, the object of the perception is likewise the wrong done to the Israelites and the increasing power of the enemy. In all these examples, Onkelos is consistent, following the maxim expressed in the words, Thou canst not look on iniquity. Habakkuk 1.13 Wherefore he renders the verb to see when referring to oppression or rebellion, it is revealed before him, etc., this appropriate and satisfactory explanation, the correctness of which I do not doubt, is weakened by three passages in which, according to this view, I expected to find the verb, to see, paraphrased, to be revealed before him, but found instead the literal rendering, to see, in the various copies of the Targum. The following are the three passages. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth. Genesis 6.6 6. And the Lord saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. Ibid 6.12 And God saw that Leah was hated. Ibid 30.31 It appears to me that in these passages there is a mistake which has crept into the copies of the Targum. Since we do not possess the Targum in the original manuscript of Onkelos, for in that case we should have assumed that he had a satisfactory explanation of it. In rendering Genesis 22.8, the Lamb is known to the Lord. He either wished to indicate that the Lord was not expected to seek and to bring it, or he considered it inappropriate in Kelde to connect the divine perception with one of the lower animals. However, the various copies of the Targum must be carefully examined with regard to this point, and if you still find those passages the same as I quoted them, I cannot explain what he meant. End of chapter 48「Part 1, Chapter 49 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides – this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 49 The angels are likewise incorporeal. They are intelligences without matter, but they are nevertheless created beings, and God created them, as will be explained below. In Bereshit Rabbah, on Genesis 3.24, we read the following remark of our sages. The angel is called the flame of the sword, which turned every way, Genesis 3.24, in accordance with the words, His ministers a flaming fire, Psalms 104.4. The attribute, which turned every way, is added because angels are changeable in form. They appear at one time as males, at another as females, now as spirits, now as angels. By this remark, they clearly stated that angels are incorporeal and have no permanent bodily form independent of the mind of him who perceives them. They exist entirely in prophetic vision and depend on the action of the imaginative power, as will be explained when speaking on the true meaning of prophecy. As to the words, at another time as females, which imply that the prophets in prophetical vision perceived angels also in the form of women, they refer to the vision of Zechariah, verse 9, And behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings. You know very well how difficult it is for men to form a notion of anything immaterial and entirely devoid of corporeality, except after considerable training. 
It is especially difficult for those who do not distinguish between objects of the intellect and objects of the imagination, and depend mostly on the mere imaginative power. They believe that all imagined things exist, or at least have the possibility of existing. But that which cannot be imagined does not exist, and cannot exist. For persons of this class, and the majority of thinkers belong to it, cannot arrive at the true solution of any question or at the explanation of anything doubtful. On account of this difficulty, the prophetic books contain expressions which, taken literally, imply that angels are corporeal, moving about, endowed with human form, receiving commands of God, obeying His word and performing whatever He wishes according to His command. All this only serves to lead to the belief that angels exist and are alive and perfect in the same way as we have explained in reference to God. If the figurative representation of angels were limited to this, their true essence would be believed to be the same as the essence of God, since, in reference to the Creator, expressions are likewise employed, which literally imply that He is corporeal, living, moving, and endowed with human form. In order, therefore, to give to the mind of men the idea that the existence of angels is lower than the existence of God, certain forms of lower animals were introduced in the description of angels. It was thereby shown that the existence of God is more perfect than that of angels, as much as man is more perfect than the lower animals. Nevertheless, no organ of the brute creation was attributed to the angels except wings. Without wings, the act of flying appears as impossible as that of walking without legs. For these two modes of motion can only be imagined in connection with these organs. The motion of flying has been chosen as a symbol to represent that angels possess life, because it is the most perfect and most sublime movement of the brute creation. Men consider this motion a perfection to such an extent that they themselves wish to be able to fly in order to escape easily what is injurious and to obtain quickly what is useful, though it be at a distance. For this reason this motion has been attributed to the angels. There is besides another reason. The bird in its flight is sometimes visible, sometimes withdrawn from our sight, one moment near to us and in the next far off, and these are exactly the circumstances which we must associate with the idea of angels, as will be explained below. This imaginary perfection, the motion of flight, being the exclusive property of the brute creation, has never been attributed to God. You must not be misled by the passage, And he rode upon a cherub, and he did fly. Psalms 18.10 For it is the cherub that did fly, and the simile only serves to denote the rapid arrival of that which is referred to in that passage. Compare. Behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud, and shall come into Egypt. Isaiah 19.1 That is, the punishment alluded to will come down quickly upon Egypt. Nor should expressions like the face of an ox, the face of a lion, the face of an eagle, the sole of the foot of a calf, found in the prophecies of Ezekiel 1, 10, and 7, mislead you. For all these are explained in a different manner, as you will learn later, and besides, the prophet only describes the animals, chayot. The subject will be explained, part 3, chapter 1, though by mere hints, as far as necessary, for directing your attention to the true interpretation. The motion of flying frequently mentioned in the Bible necessitates, according to our imagination, the existence of wings. Wings are therefore given to the angels as symbols expressive of their existence, not of their true essence. You must also bear in mind that whenever a thing moves very quickly, it is said to fly, as that term implies great velocity of motion. 
Compare, as the eagle flieth, Deuteronomy 28, 49. The eagle flies and moves with greater velocity than any other bird, and therefore it is introduced in this simile. Furthermore, the wings are the organs, literally causes, of flight. Hence, the number of the wings of angels in the prophetic vision corresponds to the number of the causes which set a thing in motion. But this does not belong to the theme of this chapter. Compare Part 2, Chapter 4 and 10. End of Chapter 49《Part I, Chapter 50 of the Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 50. When reading my present treatise, bear in mind that by faith we do not understand merely that which is uttered with the lips, but also that which is apprehended by the soul, the conviction that the object of belief is exactly as it is apprehended. If, as regards real or supposed truths, you content yourself with giving utterance to them in words without apprehending them or believing in them, especially if you do not seek real truth, you have a very easy task, as, in fact, you will find many ignorant people professing articles of faith without connecting any idea with them. If, however, you have a desire to rise to a higher state, vide licet that of reflection, and truly to hold the conviction that God is one and possesses true unity, without admitting plurality or divisibility in any sense whatever, you must understand that God has no essential attribute in any form or in any sense whatever, and that the rejection of corporeality implies the rejection of essential attributes. Those who believe that God is one, and that he has many attributes, declare the unity with their lips, and assume plurality in their thoughts. This is like the doctrine of the Christians, who say that he is one and he is three, and that the three are one. Of the same character is the doctrine of those who say that God is one, but that he has many attributes, and that he, with his attributes, is one, although they deny corporeality and affirm his most absolute freedom from matter, as if our object were to seek forms of expression, not subjects of belief. For belief is only possible after the apprehension of a thing. It consists in the conviction that the thing apprehended has its existence beyond the mind in reality exactly as it is conceived in the mind. If, in addition to this, we are convinced that the thing cannot be different in any way from what we believe it to be, and that no reasonable argument can be found for the rejection of the belief or for the admission of any deviation from it, then the belief is true. Renounce desires and habits, follow your reason, and study what I am going to say in the chapters which follow on the rejection of the attributes. You will then be fully convinced of what we have said. You will be of those who truly conceive the unity of God, not of those who utter it with their lips without thought, like men of whom it has been said, Thou art near in their mouth and far from their reins. Jeremiah 12.2 it is right that a man should belong to that class of men who have a conception of truth and understand it, though they do not speak of it. Thus the pious are advised and addressed. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Psalms 4-5 End of chapter 50《Part I, Chapter 51 of the Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 51 
There are many things whose existence is manifest and obvious. Some of these are innate notions or objects of sensation, others are nearly so, and in fact they would require no proof if man had been left in his primitive state. Such are the existence of motion, of man's free will, of phases of production and destruction, and of the natural properties perceived by the senses, exempli gratia, the heat of fire, the coldness of water, and many other similar things. False notions, however, may be spread either by a person laboring under error or by one who has some particular end in view, and who establishes theories contrary to the real nature of things by denying the existence of things perceived by the senses or by affirming the existence of what does not exist. Philosophers are thus required to establish by proof things which are self-evident and to disprove the existence of things which only exist in man's imagination. Thus Aristotle gives a proof for the existence of motion because it had been denied. He disproves the reality of atoms because it had been asserted. To the same class belongs the rejection of essential attributes in reference to God, for it is a self-evident truth that the attribute is not inherent in the object to which it is ascribed, but it is superadded to its essence and is consequently an accident. If the attribute denoted the essence, toten enai, of the object, it would be either mere tautology, as if, exempli gratia, one would say, man is man, or the explanation of a name, as, exempli gratia, man is a speaking animal. For the words speaking animal include the true essence of man, and there is no third element besides life and speech in the definition of man. When he, therefore, is described by the attributes of life and speech, these are nothing but an explanation of the name man. That is to say, that the thing which is called man consists of life and speech. It will now be clear that the attribute must be one of two things, either the essence of the object described, in that case it is a mere explanation of a name, and on that account we might admit the attribute in reference to God, but we reject it from another cause as will be shown, or the attribute is something different from the object described, some extraneous superadded element. In that case, the attribute would be an accident, and he who merely rejects the appellation accidents in reference to the attributes of God does not thereby alter their character. For everything superadded to the essence of an object joins it without forming part of its essential properties, and that constitutes an accident. Add to this the logical consequence of admitting many attributes, vide licet, the existence of many eternal beings. There cannot be any belief in the unity of God except by admitting that he is one simple substance without any composition or plurality of elements, one from whatever side you view it and by whatever test you examine it, not divisible into two parts in any way and by any cause, nor capable of any form of plurality either objectively or subjectively, as will be proved in this treatise. Some thinkers have gone so far as to say that the attributes of God are neither his essence nor anything extraneous to his essence. This is like the assertion of some theorists that the ideals, id est, the universalia, are neither existing nor non-existent, and like the views of others that the atom does not fill a definite place but keeps an atom of space occupied, that man has no freedom of action at all, but has acquirement. Such things are only said, they exist only in words, not in thought, 
much less in reality. But as you know, and as all know who do not delude themselves, these theories are preserved by a multitude of words, by misleading similes, sustained by declamation and invective, and by numerous methods borrowed both from dialectics and sophistry. If, after uttering them and supporting them by such words, a man were to examine for himself his own belief on this subject, he would see nothing but confusion and stupidity in an endeavor to prove the existence of things which do not exist, or to find a mean between two opposites that have no mean. Or is there a mean between existence and non-existence, or between the identity and non-identity of two things? But, as we said to such absurdities, men were forced by the great license given to the imagination, and by the fact that every existing material thing is necessarily imagined as a certain substance possessing several attributes, for nothing has ever been found that consists of one simple substance without any attribute. Guided by such imaginations, men thought that God was also composed of many different elements, vide licet of his essence and of the attributes superadded to his essence. Following up this comparison, some believed that God was corporeal and that he possessed attributes. Others, abandoning this theory, denied the corporeality but retained the attributes. The adherence to the literal sense of the text of Holy Writ is the source of all this error, as I shall show in some of the chapters devoted to this theme. End of chapter 51「Part 1 Chapter 52 of the Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides – this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 52 Every description of an object by an affirmative attribute which includes the assertion that an object is of a certain kind must be made in one of the following five ways. First, the object is described by its definition as exempli gratia, man is described as a being that lives and has reason. Such a description containing the true essence of the object is, as we have already shown, nothing else but the explanation of a name. All agree that this kind of description cannot be given of God, for there are no previous causes to his existence by which he could be defined, and on that account it is a well-known principle received by all the philosophers who are precise in their statements that no definition can be given of God. Secondly, an object is described by part of its definition as when, exempli gratia, man is described as a living being or as a rational being. This kind of description includes the necessary connection of the two ideas. For when we say that every man is rational, we mean by it that every being which has the characteristics of man must also have reason. All agree that this kind of description is inappropriate in reference to God, for if we were to speak of a portion of his essence, we should consider his essence to be a compound. The inappropriateness of this kind of description in reference to God is the same as that of the preceding kind. Thirdly, an object is described by something different from its true essence, by something that does not complement or establish the essence of the object. The description, therefore, relates to a quality, but quality, in its most general sense, is an accident. If God could be described in this way, he would be the substratum of accidents, a sufficient reason for rejecting the idea that he possesses quality since it diverges from the true conception of his essence. 
It is surprising how those who admit the application of attributes to God can reject, in reference to Him, comparison and qualification. For when they say He cannot be qualified, they can only mean that He possesses no quality. And yet every positive essential attribute of an object either constitutes its essence, and in that case it is identical with the essence, or it contains a quality of the object. There are, as you know, four kinds of quality. I will give you instances of attributes of each kind in order to show you that this class of attributes cannot possibly be applied to God. a. A man described by any of his intellectual or moral qualities or by any of the dispositions appertaining to him as an animate being. When, exempli gratia, we speak of a person who is a carpenter, or who shrinks from sin, or who is ill, it makes no difference whether we say a carpenter, or a sage, or a physician. By all these we represent certain physical dispositions, nor does it make any difference whether we say sin-fearing or merciful. Every trade, every profession, and every settled habit of man are certain physical dispositions. All this is clear to those who have occupied themselves with the study of logic. b. A thing is described by some physical quality it possesses or by the absence of the same, exempli gratia, as being soft or hard, It makes no difference whether we say soft or hard or strong or weak. In both cases we speak of physical conditions. C. A man is described by his passive qualities or by his emotions. We speak, exempli gratia, of a person who is passionate, irritable, timid, merciful, without implying that these conditions have become permanent. The description of a thing by its color, taste, heat, cold, dryness, and moisture belong also to this class of attributes. d. A thing is described by any of its qualities resulting from quantity as such. We speak exempli gratia of a thing which is long, short, curved, straight, etc., Consider all these and similar attributes, and you will find that they cannot be employed in reference to God. He is not a magnitude that any quality resulting from quantity as such could be possessed by him. He is not affected by external influences and therefore does not possess any quality resulting from emotion. He is not subject to physical conditions and therefore does not possess strength or similar qualities. He is not an animate being, that he should have a certain disposition of the soul or acquire certain properties as meekness, modesty, etc., or be in a state to which animate beings as such are subject, as exempli gratia, in that of health or of illness. Hence it follows that no attribute coming under the head of quality in its widest sense can be predicated of God. Consequently, these three classes of attributes describing the essence of a thing, or part of the essence, or a quality of it, are clearly inadmissible in reference to God, for they imply composition, which, as we shall prove, is out of the question as regards the Creator. We say with regard to this latter point that He is absolutely one. Fourthly, a thing is described by its relation to another thing, exempli gratia, to time, to space, or to a different individual. Thus we say Zayed, the father of A, or the partner of B, or who dwells at a certain place, or who lived at a stated time. This kind of attribute does not necessarily imply plurality or change in the essence of the object described, for the same Zayid, to whom reference is made, is the partner of Amru, the father of Bekr, the master of Khalid, the friend of Zayid, dwells in a certain house, and was born in a certain year. 
Such relations are not the essence of a thing, nor are they so intimately connected with it as qualities. At first thought, it would seem that they may be employed in reference to God, but after careful and thorough consideration we are convinced of their inadmissibility. It is quite clear that there is no relation between God and time or space, for time is an accident connected with motion, in so far as the latter includes the relation of anteriority and posteriority, and is expressed by number, as is explained in books devoted to this subject. And since motion is one of the conditions to which only material bodies are subject, and God is immaterial, there can be no relation between him and time. Similarly, there is no relation between him and space, but what we have to investigate and to examine is this, whether some real relation exists between God and any of the substances created by him by which he could be described. That there is no correlation between him and any of his creatures can easily be seen, for the characteristic of the two objects correlative to each other is the equality of their reciprocal relation. Now as God has absolute existence, while all other beings have only possible existence, as we shall show, there consequently cannot be any correlation between God and his creatures. That a certain kind of relation does exist between them is by some considered possible, but wrongly. It is impossible to imagine a relation between intellect and sight, although, as we believe, the same kind of existence is common to both. How then could a relation be imagined between any creature and God who has nothing in common with any other being? For even the term existence is applied to him and other things, according to our opinion, only by way of pure homonymity. Consequently, there is no relation whatever between him and any other being. For whenever we speak of a relation between two things, these belong to the same kind. But when two things belong to different kinds, though of the same class, there is no relation between them. We therefore do not say, this red compared with that green is more or less or equally intense, although both belong to the same class, color. When they belong to two different classes, there does not appear to exist any relation between them, not even to a man of ordinary intellect, although the two things belong to the same category. Exempli gratia, between a hundred cubits and the heat of pepper, there is no relation, the one being a quality, the other a quantity, or between wisdom and sweetness, between meekness and bitterness. Although all these come under the head of quality in its more general signification, how then could there be any relation between God and his creatures, considering the important difference between them in respect to true existence, the greatest of all differences? Besides, if any relation existed between them, God would be subject to the accident of relation, and although that would not be an accident to the essence of God, it would still be, to some extent, a kind of accident. You would therefore be wrong if you applied affirmative attributes in their literal sense to God, though they contained only relations. These, however, are the more appropriate of all attributes to be employed, in a less strict sense, in reference to God, because they do not imply that a plurality of eternal things exists, or that any change takes place in the essence of God when those things change to which God is in relation. Fifthly, a thing is described by its actions. I do not mean by its actions the inherent capacity for a certain work as is expressed in carpenter, painter, or smith, for these belong to the class of qualities which have been mentioned above, but I mean the action the latter has performed. 
we speak exemple gratia of Zayd, who made this door, built that wall, wove that garment. This kind of attributes is separate from the essences of the thing described, and therefore appropriate to be employed in describing the Creator, especially since we know that these different actions do not imply that different elements must be contained in the substance of the agent by which the different actions are produced, as will be explained. On the contrary, all the actions of God emanate from His essence, not from any extraneous thing superadded to His essence, as we have shown. What we have explained in the present chapter is this, that God is one in every respect, containing no plurality or any element superadded to His essence, and that the many attributes of different significations applied in Scripture to God originate in the multitude of His actions, not in a plurality existing in His essence, and are partly employed with the object of conveying to us some notion of His perfection in a accordance with what we consider perfection, as has been explained by us. The possibility of one simple substance excluding plurality, though accomplishing different actions, will be illustrated by examples in the next chapter. End of chapter 52Part 1, Chapter 53 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 53 The circumstances which caused men to believe in the existence of divine attributes is similar to that which caused others to believe in the corporeality of God. The latter have not arrived at that belief by speculation, but by following the literal sense of certain passages in the Bible. The same is the case with the attributes. When in the books of the prophets and of the law God is described by attributes, such passages are taken in their literal sense, and it is then believed that God possesses attributes, as if he were to be exalted above corporeality and not above things connected with corporeality. It est the accidents, I mean physical dispositions, all of which are qualities and connected with corporeality. Every attribute which the followers of this doctrine assume to be essential to the Creator you will find to express, although they do not distinctly say so, a quality similar to those which they are accustomed to notice in the bodies of all living beings. We apply to all such passages the principle, The Torah speaketh in the language of man, and say that the object of all these terms is to describe God as the most perfect being, not as possessing those qualities which are only perfections in relation to created living beings. Many of the attributes express different acts of God, but that difference does not necessitate any difference as regards him from whom the acts proceed. This fact, vide licet, that from one agency different effects may result, although that agency has not free will, and much more so if it has free will, I will illustrate by an instance taken from our own sphere. Fire melts certain things and makes others hard. It boils and burns. It bleaches and blackens. If we described the fire as bleaching, blackening, burning, boiling, hardening, and melting, we should be correct. And yet, he who does not know the nature of fire would think that it included six different elements, one by which it blackens, another by which it bleaches, a third by which it boils, a fourth by which it consumes, a fifth by which it melts, a sixth by which it hardens things, actions which are opposed to one another and of which each has its peculiar property. He, however, who knows the nature of fire, will know that by virtue of one quality in action, namely by heat, it produces all these effects. 
thoughts. If this is the case with that which is done by nature, how much more is it in the case with regard to beings that act by free will, and still more with regard to God who is above all description? If we therefore perceive in God certain relations of various kinds, for wisdom in us is different from power and power from will, it does by no means follow that different elements are really contained in him, that he contains one element by which he knows, another by which he wills, and another by which he exercises power, as is in fact the signification of the attribute attributes of God, according to the attributists. Some of them express it plainly, and enumerate the attributes as elements added to the essence. Others, however, are more reserved with regard to this matter, but indicate their opinion, though they do not express it in distinct and intelligible words. Thus, exempli gratia, some of them say, God is omnipotent by his essence, wise by his essence, living by his essence, and endowed with a will by his essence. I will mention to you as an instance man's reason, which being one faculty and imply no plurality, enables him to know many arts and sciences. By the same faculty man is able to sew, to do carpenter's work, to weave, to build, to study, to acquire a knowledge of geometry, and to govern a state. These various acts, resulting from one simple faculty, which involves no plurality, are very numerous. Their number, that is, the number of the actions originating in man's reason, is almost infinite. It is therefore intelligible how, in reference to God, those different actions can be caused by one simple substance that does not include any plurality or any additional element. The attributes found in Holy Scripture are either qualifications of his actions without any reference to his essence, or indicate absolute perfection, but do not imply that the essence of God is a compound of various elements. For in not admitting the term compound, they do not reject the idea of a compound when they admit a substance with attributes. There still remains one difficulty which led them to that error, and which I am now going to mention. Those who assert the existence of the attributes do not found their opinion on the variety of God's actions. They say that it is true that one substance can be the source of various effects, but his essential attributes cannot be qualifications of his actions because it is impossible to imagine that the Creator created Himself. They vary with regard to the so-called essential attributes, I mean as regards their number, according to the text of the Scripture which each of them follows. I will enumerate those on which all agree, and the knowledge of which they believe that they have derived from reasoning, not from some words of the prophets, namely, the following four, life, power, wisdom, and will. They believe that these are four different things, and such perfections as cannot possibly be absent from the Creator, and that these cannot be qualifications of His actions. This is their opinion, but you must know that wisdom and life in reference to God are not different from each other, for in every being that is conscious of itself, life and wisdom are the same thing. That is to say, if by wisdom we understand the consciousness of self. Besides, the subject and the object of that consciousness are undoubtedly identical, as regards God, for according to our opinion, he is not composed of an element that apprehends and another that does not apprehend. He is not like man, who is a combination of a conscious soul and an unconscious body, 
If, therefore, by wisdom we mean the faculty of self-consciousness, wisdom and life are one and the same thing. They, however, do not speak of wisdom in this sense, but of his power to apprehend his creatures. There is also no doubt that power and will do not exist in God in reference to himself, for he cannot have power or will as regards himself. We cannot imagine such a thing. They take these attributes as different relations between God and his creatures, signifying that he has power in creating things, will in giving things existence as he desires, and wisdom in knowing that he created. Consequently, these attributes do not refer to the essence of God, but express relations between him and his creatures. Therefore we, who truly believe in the unity of God, declare that as we do not believe that some element is included in his essence by which he created the heavens, another by which he created the four elements, a third by which he created the ideals, in the same way we reject the idea that his essence contains an element by which he has power, another element by which he he has will, and a third by which he has a knowledge of his creatures. On the contrary, he is a simple essence, without any additional element whatever. He created the universe and knows it, but not by any extraneous force. There is no difference whether these various attributes refer to his actions or to relations between him and his works. In fact, these relations, as we have also shown, exist only in the thoughts of men. This is what we must believe concerning the attributes occurring in the books of the prophets. Some may also be taken as expressive of the perfection of God by way of comparison with what we consider as perfections in us, as we shall explain. End of chapter 53. Part 1, Chapter 54 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 54. The wisest man, our teacher Moses, asked two things of God, and received a reply respecting both. The one thing he asked was that God should let him know his true essence. The other, which in fact he asked first, that God should let him know his attributes. In answer to both these petitions, God promised that he would let him know all his attributes, and that these were nothing but his actions. He also told him that his true essence could not be perceived, and pointed out a method by which he could obtain the utmost knowledge of God possible for man to acquire. The knowledge obtained by Moses has not been possessed by any human being before him or after him. His petition to know the attributes of God is contained in the following words, Show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight. Exodus 33, 13. Consider how many excellent ideas found expression in the words, Show me thy way, that I may know thee. We learn from them that God is known by his attributes, for Moses believed that he knew him when he was shown the way of God. The words, that I may find grace in thy sight, imply that he who knows God finds grace in his eyes. Not only is he acceptable and welcome to God who fasts and prays, but everyone who knows him. Not only is he acceptable and welcome to God who fasts and prays, but everyone who knows him. He who has no knowledge of God is the object of his wrath and displeasure. The pleasure and displeasure of God, the approach to him, and the withdrawal from him are proportional to the amount of man's knowledge or ignorance concerning the Creator. 
We have already gone too far away from our subject. Let us now return to it. Moses prayed to God to grant him knowledge of his attributes and also pardon for his people. When the latter had been granted, he continued to pray for the knowledge of God's essence in the words, Show me thy glory, Ibid 18, and then received, respecting his first request, Show me thy way, the following favorable reply, I will make all my goodness to pass before thee, Ibid 19. As regards the second request, however, he was told, Thou canst not see my face. Ibid 20. The words, All my goodness, imply that God promised to show him the whole creation concerning which it has been stated, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Genesis 1.31 When I say to show him the whole creation, I mean to imply that God promised to make him comprehend the nature of all things, their relation to each other, and the way they are governed by God both in reference to the universe as a whole and to each creature in particular. This knowledge is referred to when we are told of Moses, He is firmly established in all mine house. Numbers 12, 7 That is, his knowledge of all the creatures in my universe is correct and firmly established, for false opinions are not firmly established. Consequently, the knowledge of the works of God is the knowledge of his attributes by which he can be known. The fact that God promised Moses to give him a knowledge of his works may be inferred from the circumstance that God taught him such attributes as refer exclusively to his works. Vide licet, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness, etc. Exodus 34, 6. It is therefore clear that the ways which Moses wished to know and which God taught him are the actions emanating from God. Our sages call them midot, qualities, and speak of the thirteen midot of God. Babylonian Talmud, Tractate Rosh Hashanah, page 17b. They used the term also in reference to man. Compare. There are four different midot, characters, among those who go to the house of learning. There are four different midot, characters, among those who give charity. Mishnah Abot 5, 13, and 14. They do not mean to say that God really possesses midot, qualities, but that he performs actions similar to such of our actions as originate in certain qualities, id est, in certain psychical dispositions, not that God has really such dispositions. Although Moses was shown all his goodness, id est, all his works, Only the thirteen midot are mentioned because they include those acts of God which refer to the creation and government of mankind, and to know these acts was the principal object of the prayer of Moses. This is shown by the conclusion of his prayer, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. Exodus 33.16 That is to say, the people whom I have to rule by certain acts in the performance of which I must be guided by thy own acts in governing them. We have thus shown that the ways used in the Bible and midot used in the Mishnah are identical, denoting the acts emanating from God in reference to the universe. Whenever any one of his actions is perceived by us, we ascribe to God that emotion which is the source of the act when performed by ourselves, and call him by an epithet which is formed from the verb expressing that emotion. 
We see, exempli gratia, how well he provides for the life of the embryo of living beings, how he endows with certain faculties both the embryo itself and those who have to rear it after its birth, in order that it may be protected from death and destruction, guarded against all harm, and assisted in the performance of all that is required for its development. Similar acts, when performed by us, are due to a certain emotion and tenderness called mercy and pity. God is, therefore, said to be merciful, exempli gratia, like as a father is merciful to his children, so the Lord is merciful to them that fear him. Psalms 103.13 and I will spare them as a man spareth, Yechamol, his own son that serveth him. Malachi 3.17 Such instances do not imply that God is influenced by a feeling of mercy, but that acts similar to those which a father performs for his son out of pity, mercy, and real affection emanate from God solely for the benefit of his pious men, and are by no means the result of any impression or change produced in God. When we give something to a person who has no claim upon us, we perform an act of grace, exempli gratia, grant them graciously unto us. Judges 21, 22. The same term is used in reference to God, exempli gratia, which God hath graciously given. Genesis 33, 5. Because God hath dealt graciously with me. Ibid 11. Instances of this kind are numerous. God creates and guides beings who have no claim upon him to be created and guided by him. He is therefore called gracious, chanun. His actions towards mankind also include great calamities which overtake individuals and bring death to them, or affect whole families and even entire regions, spread death, destroy generation after generation, and spare nothing whatsoever. Hence, there occur inundations, earthquakes, destructive storms, expeditions of one nation against the other for the sake of destroying it with the sword and blotting out its memory, and many other evils of the same kind. Whenever such evils are caused by us to any person, they originate in great anger, violent jealousy, or a desire for revenge. God is therefore called, because of these acts, jealous, revengeful, wrathful, and keeping anger. Nahum 1, 2. That is to say, he performs acts similar to those which, when performed by us, originate in certain psychical dispositions, in jealousy, desire for retaliation, revenge, or anger. They are in accordance with the guilt of those who are to be punished and not the result of any emotion, for he is above all defect. The same is the case with all divine acts. Though resembling those acts which emanate from our passions and psychical dispositions, they are not due to anything superadded to his essence. The governor of a country, if he is a prophet, should conform to these attributes. Acts of punishment must be performed by him moderately and in accordance with justice, not merely as an outlet of his passion. He must not let loose his anger, nor allow his passion to overcome him. For all passions are bad, and they must be guarded against, as far as it lies in man's power. At times and towards some persons, he must be merciful and gracious, not only from motives of mercy and compassion, but according to their merits. At other times and towards other persons, he must evince anger, revenge, and wrath in proportion to their guilt, but not from motives of passion. 
he must be able to condemn a person to death by fire without anger, passion, or loathing against him, and must exclusively be guided by what he perceives of the guilt of the person, and by a sense of the great benefit which a large number will derive from such a sentence. You have no doubt noticed in the Torah how the commandment to annihilate the seven nations and to save alive nothing that breatheth, Deuteronomy 20.16, is followed immediately by the words that they teach you not to do after all their abominations which they have done unto their gods. So should you sin against the Lord your God, Ibid 18, that is to say, you shall not think that this commandment implies an act of cruelty or of retaliation. It is an act demanded by the tendency of man to remove everything that might turn him away from the right path, and to clear away all obstacles in the road to perfection that is to the knowledge of God. Nevertheless, acts of mercy, pardon, pity, and grace should more frequently be performed by the governor of a country than acts of punishment, seeing that all the thirteen midot of God are attributes of mercy with only one exception, namely, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. Exodus 34, 7 for the meaning of the preceding attribute in the original vanake lo yinake is and he will not utterly destroy and not he will by no means clear the guilty compare and she will be utterly destroyed veniketa she shall sit upon the ground isaiah three twenty six when it is said that God is visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, this refers exclusively to the sin of idolatry, and to no other sin. That this is the case may be inferred from what is said in the Ten Commandments, upon the third and fourth generation of my enemies. Exodus 25. None except idolaters being called enemy. Compare also every abomination to the Lord which he hateth. Deuteronomy 12.31 it was, however, considered sufficient to extend the punishment to the fourth generation, because the fourth generation is the utmost a man can see of his posterity. And when therefore the idolaters of a place are destroyed, the old man worshipping idols is killed, his son, his grandson, and his great-grandson, that is, the fourth generation. By the mention of this attribute we are, as it were, told that his commandments, undoubtedly in harmony with his acts, include the death even of the little children of idolaters because of the sin of their fathers and grandfathers. This principle we find frequently applied in the law, as exempli gratia, we read concerning the city that has been led astray to idolatry, destroy it utterly, and all that is therein. Deuteronomy 13.15 all this has been ordained in order that every vestige of that which would lead to great injury should be blotted out, as we have explained. We have gone too far away from the subject of this chapter, but we have shown why it has been considered sufficient to mention only these thirteen out of all his acts, namely because they are required for the good government of a country. For the chief aim of man should be to make himself, as far as possible, similar to God, that is to say, to make his acts similar to the acts of God, or as our sages express it in explaining the verse, ye shall be holy, Leviticus 21, 2, he is gracious, so be you also gracious, he is merciful, so be you also merciful. The principal object of this chapter was to show that all attributes ascribed to God are attributes of his acts, and do not imply that God has inequalities. End of chapter 54
Part 1, Chapter 55 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 55 We have already on several occasions shown in this treatise that everything that implies corporeality or passiveness is to be negatived in reference to God. For all passiveness implies change, and the agent producing the state is undoubtedly different from the object affected by it. And if God could be affected in any way whatever, another being beside him would act on him and cause change in him. All kinds of non-existence must likewise be negatived in reference to him. No perfection whatever can therefore be imagined to be at one time absent from him and at another time present in him. For if this were the case, he would at a certain time only be potentially perfect. Potentiality always implies non-existence, and when anything has to pass from potentiality into reality, another thing that exists in reality is required to effect that transition. Hence it follows that all perfections must really exist in God, and none of them must in any way be a mere potentiality. Another thing likewise to be denied in reference to God is similarity to any existing being. This has been generally accepted, and is also mentioned in the books of the prophets, exempli gratia, to whom then will you liken me? Isaiah 40, 25. To whom then will you liken God? Ibid 18. There is none like unto thee. Jeremiah 10, 6. Instances of this kind are frequent. In short, it is necessary to demonstrate by proof that nothing can be predicated of God that implies any of the following four things, corporeality, emotion or change, non-existence, exempli gratia, that something would be potential at one time and real at another, and similarity with any of his creatures, in this respect, our knowledge of God is aided by the study of natural science. For he who is ignorant of the latter cannot understand the defect implied in emotions, the difference between potentiality and reality, the non-existence implied in all potentiality, the inferiority of a thing that exists in potentia to that which moves in order to cause its transition from potentiality into reality, and the inferiority of that which moves for this purpose compared with its condition when the transition has been effected. He who knows these things, but without their proofs, does not know the details which logically result from these general propositions, and therefore he cannot prove that God exists, or that the four things mentioned above are inadmissible in reference to God. Having premised these remarks, I shall explain in the next chapter the error of those who believe that God has essential attributes. Those who have some knowledge of logic and natural science will understand it. End of chapter 55「Part 1, Chapter 56 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 56 Similarity is based on a certain relation between two things. If between two things no relation can be found, there can be no similarity between them, and there is no relation between two things that have no similarity to each other. Exempli gratia. We do not say this heat is similar to that color, or this voice is similar to that sweetness. This is self-evident. Since the existence of a relation between God and man, or between him and other beings, has been denied, similarity must likewise be denied. 
you must know that two things of the same kind, id est, whose essential properties are the same, and which are distinguished from each other by greatness and smallness, strength and weakness, etc., are necessarily similar, though different in this one way. Exempli gratia, a grain of mustard, and the sphere of the fixed stars are similar as regards the three dimensions. Although the one is exceedingly great, the other exceedingly small, the property of having three dimensions is the same in both. Or the heat of wax melted by the sun and the heat of the element of fire are similar as regards heat. Although the heat is exceedingly great in the one case and exceedingly small in the other, the existence of that quality, heat, is the same in both. Thus, those who believe in the presence of essential attributes in God, vide licet, existence, life, power, wisdom, and will, should know that these attributes, when applied to God, have not the same meaning as when applied to us, and that the difference does not only consist of magnitude or in the degree of perfection, stability, and durability. It cannot be said, as they practically believe, that his existence is only more stable, his life more permanent, his power greater, his wisdom more perfect, and his will more general than ours, and that the same definition applies to both. This is in no way admissible, for the expression more than is used in comparing two things as regards a certain attribute predicated of both of them in exactly the same sense, and consequently implies similarity between God and his creatures. When they ascribe to God essential attributes, these so-called essential attributes should not have any similarity to the attributes of other things, and should, according to their own opinion, not be included in one of the same definition, just as there is no similarity between the essence of God and that of other beings. They do not follow this principle, for they hold that one definition may include them, and that, nevertheless, there is no similarity between them. Those who are familiar with the meaning of similarity will certainly understand that the term existence, when applied to God and to other beings, is perfectly homonymous. In like manner, the terms wisdom, power, will, and life are applied to God and to other beings by way of perfect homonymity, admitting of no comparison whatever. Nor must you think that these attributes are employed as hybrid terms, for hybrid terms are such as are applied to two things which have a similarity to each other in respect to a certain property which is in both of them an accident, not an essential constituent element. The attributes of God, however, are not considered as accidental by any intelligent person, while all attributes applied to man are accidents, according to the mutakalimim. I am therefore at a loss to see how they can find any similarity between the attributes of God and those of man, how their definitions can be identical and their significations the same. This is a decisive proof that there is in no way or sense anything common to the attributes predicated of God and those used in reference to ourselves. They have only the same names, and nothing else is common to them. Such being the case, it is not proper to believe, on account of the use of the same attributes, that there is in God something additional to his essence in the same way as attributes are joined to our essence. This is most important for those who understand it. Keep it in memory and study it thoroughly in order to be well prepared for that which I am going to explain to you. End of chapter 56
Part 1, Chapter 57 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 57 On Attributes, Remarks More Recondite Than the Preceding It is known that existence is an accident appertaining to all things, and therefore an element superadded to their essence. This must evidently be the case as regards everything the existence of which is due to some cause. Its existence is an element superadded to its essence. But as regards a being whose existence is not due to any cause, God alone is that being, for his existence, as we have said, is absolute. Existence and essence are perfectly identical. He is not a substance to which existence is joined as an accident, as an additional element. His existence is always absolute, and has never been a new element or an accident in him. Consequently, God exists without possessing the attribute of existence. Similarly, he lives without possessing the attribute of life, knows without possessing the attribute of knowledge, is omnipotent without possessing the attribute of omnipotence, is wise without possessing the attribute of wisdom, all this reduces itself to one and the same entity. There is no plurality in him, as will be shown. It is further necessary to consider that unity and plurality are accidents supervening to an object according as it consists of many elements or of one. This is fully explained in the book called Metaphysics, in the same way as number is not the substance of the things numbered, so is unity not the substance of the thing which has the attribute of unity. For unity and plurality are accidents belonging to the category of discrete quantity and supervening to such objects as are capable of receiving them. To that being, however, which has truly simple absolute existence, and in which composition is inconceivable, the accident of unity is as inadmissible as the accident of plurality. That is to say, God's unity is not an element superadded, but he is one without possessing the attribute of unity. The investigation of this subject, which is almost too subtle for our understanding, must not be based on current expressions employed in describing it, for these are the great source of error. It would be extremely difficult for us to find, in any language whatsoever, words adequate to this subject, and we can only employ inadequate language. In our endeavor to show that God does not include a plurality, we can only say he is one, although one and many are both terms which serve to distinguish quantity. We therefore make the subject clear and show to the understanding the way of truth by saying he is one but does not possess the attribute of unity. The same is the case when we say God is the first, kadmon, to express that he has not been created. The term first is decidedly inaccurate, for it can in its true sense only be applied to a being that is subject to the relation of time. The latter, however, is an accident to motion which again is connected with a body. Besides, the attribute first is a relative term, being in regard to time the same as the terms long and short are in regard to a line. Both expressions, first and created, are equally inadmissible in reference to any being to which the attribute of time is not applicable. Just as we do not say crooked or straight in reference to taste, salted or insipid in reference to the voice. These subjects are not unknown to those who have accustomed themselves to seek a true understanding of the things, and to establish their properties in accordance with the abstract notions which the mind has formed of them, and who are not misled by the inaccuracy of the words employed. All attributes, such as the first, the last, occurring in the scriptures in reference to God, are as metaphorical as the expressions ear and eye. 
They simply signify that God is not subject to any change or innovation whatever. They do not imply that God can be described by time, or that there is any comparison between him and any other being as regards time, and that he is called on that account the first and the last. In short, all similar expressions are borrowed from the language commonly used among the people, in the same way we use one in reference to God to express that there is nothing similar to him, but we do not mean to say that an attribute of unity is added to his essence. End of chapter 57「Part 1 Chapter 58 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 58 This chapter is even more recondite than the preceding. Know that the negative attributes of God are the true attributes. They do not include any incorrect notions or any deficiency whatever in reference to God, while positive attributes imply polytheism and are inadequate, as we have already shown. It is now necessary to explain how negative expressions can, in a certain sense, be employed as attributes, and how they are distinguished from positive attributes. Then I shall show that we cannot describe the Creator by any means except by negative attributes. An attribute does not exclusively belong to the one object to which it is related. While qualifying one thing, it can also be employed to qualify other things, and is, in that case, not peculiar to that one thing. Exempli gratia. If you see an object from a distance, and on inquiring what it is, are told that it is a living being, you have certainly learnt an attribute of the object seen, and although that attribute does not exclusively belong to the object perceived, it expresses that the object is not a plant or a mineral. Again, if a man is in a certain house, and you know that something is in the house, but not exactly what, you ask what is in that house, and you are told not a plant nor a mineral. You have thereby obtained some special knowledge of the thing. You have learnt that it is a living being, although you do not yet know what kind of a living being it is. The negative attributes have this in common with the positive, that they necessarily circumscribe the object to some extent, although such circumscription consists only in the exclusion of what otherwise would not be excluded. In the following point, however, the negative attributes are distinguished from the positive. The positive attributes, although not peculiar to one thing, describe a portion of what we desire to know, either some part of its essence or some of its accidents. The negative attributes, on the other hand, do not, as regards the essence of the thing which we desire to know, in any way tell us what it is, except it be indirectly, as has been shown in the instance given by us. After this introduction I would observe that, as has already been shown, God's existence is absolute, that it includes no composition, as will be proved, and that we comprehend only the fact that he exists, not his essence. Consequently, it is a false assumption to hold that he has any positive attribute, for he does not possess existence in addition to his essence. It therefore cannot be said that the one may be described as an attribute of the other, much less has he, in addition to his existence, a compound essence consisting of two constituent elements to which the attribute could refer. Still less has he accidents which could be described by an attribute. Hence it is clear that he has no positive attribute whatever. The negative attributes, however, are those which are necessary to direct the mind to the truths which we must believe concerning God. 
for on the one hand they do not imply any plurality, and on the other they convey to man the highest possible knowledge of God, exempli gratia, it has been established by proof that some being must exist besides those things which can be perceived by the senses or apprehended by the mind. When we say of this being that it exists, we mean that its non-existence is impossible. We then perceive that such a being is not, for instance, like the four elements which are inanimate, and we therefore say that it is living, expressing thereby that it is not dead. We call such a being incorporeal, because we notice that it is unlike the heavens which are living but material. Seeing that it is also different from the intellect, which, though incorporeal and living, owes its existence to some cause, we say it is the first, expressing thereby that its existence is not due to any cause. We further notice that the existence, that is the essence, of this being is not limited to its own existence. Many existences emanate from it, and its influence is not like that of the fire in producing heat, or that of the sun in sending forth light, but consists in constantly giving them stability and order by well-established rule, as we shall show. We say on that account it has power, wisdom, and will. It est, it is not feeble, or ignorant, or hasty, and does not abandon its creatures. When we say that it is not feeble, we mean that its existence is capable of producing the existence of many other things. By saying that it is not ignorant, we mean it perceives, or it lives, for everything that perceives is living. By saying it is not hasty and does not abandon its creatures, we mean that all these creatures preserve a certain order and arrangement, they are not left to themselves, they are not produced aimlessly, but whatever condition they receive from that being is given with design and intention. We thus learn that there is no other being like unto God, and we say that he is one. It est, there are not more gods than one. It has thus been shown that every attribute predicated of God either denotes the quality of an action or, when the attribute is intended to convey some idea of the divine being itself and not of his actions, the negation of the opposite. Even these negative attributes must not be formed and applied to God, except in the way in which, as you know, sometimes an attribute is negative in reference to a thing, although that attribute can naturally never be applied to it in the same way. As, exempli gratia, we say, this wall does not see. Those who read the present work are aware that, notwithstanding all the efforts of the mind, we can obtain no knowledge of the essence of the heavens, a revolving substance which has been measured by us in spans and cubits, and examined even as regards the proportions of the several spheres to each other and respecting most of their motions, although we know that they must consist of matter and form. But the matter not being the same as sublunary matter, we can only describe the heavens in terms expressing negative properties, but not in terms denoting positive qualities. Thus we say that the heavens are not light, not heavy, not passive, and therefore not subject to impressions, and that they do not possess the sensations of taste and smell, or we use similar negative attributes. All this we do because we do not know their substance. What, then, can be the result of our efforts when we try to obtain a knowledge of a being that is free from substance, that is most simple, whose existence is absolute and not due to any cause, 
to whose perfect essence nothing can be superadded, and whose perfection consists, as we have shown, in the absence of all defects. All we understand is the fact that he exists, that he is a being to whom none of his creatures is similar, who has nothing in common with them, who does not include plurality, who is never too feeble to produce other beings, and whose relation to the universe is that of a steersman to a boat. And even this is not a real relation, a real simile, but serves only to convey to us the idea that God rules the universe, that is, that he gives it duration and preserves its necessary arrangement. This subject will be treated more fully. Praised be he in the contemplation of his essence, our comprehension and knowledge prove insufficient. In the examination of his works, how they necessarily result from his will, our knowledge proves to be ignorance, and in the endeavor to extol him in words, all our efforts in speech are mere weakness and failure. End of chapter 58 Part 1, Chapter 59 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 59 the following question might perhaps be asked. Since there is no possibility of obtaining a knowledge of the true essence of God, and since it has also been proved that the only thing that man can apprehend of him is the fact that he exists, and that all positive attributes are inadmissible, as has been shown, what is the difference among those who have obtained a knowledge of God? Must not the knowledge obtained by our teacher Moses and by Solomon be the same as that obtained by any of the lowest class of philosophers, since there can be no addition to this knowledge? But on the other hand, it is generally accepted among theologians and also among philosophers that there can be a great difference between two persons as regards the knowledge of God obtained by them. Know that this is really the case, that those who have obtained a knowledge of God differ greatly from each other. For in the same way as by each additional attribute an object is more specified and is brought near to the true apprehension of the observer, so by each additional negative attribute you advance toward the knowledge of God, and you are nearer to it than he who does not negative in reference to God those qualities which you are convinced, by proof, must be negatived. There may thus be a man who, after having earnestly devoted many years to the pursuit of one science, and to the true understanding of its principles, till he is fully convinced of its truths, has obtained as the sole result of this study the conviction that a certain quality must be negatived in reference to God, and the capacity of demonstrating that it is impossible to apply it to him. Superficial thinkers will have no proof for this, will doubtfully ask, is that thing existing in the Creator or not? And those who are deprived of sight will positively ascribe it to God, although it has been clearly shown that he does not possess it. Exempli gratia, while I show that God is incorporeal, another doubts and is not certain whether he is corporeal or incorporeal. Others even positively declare that he is corporeal and appear before the Lord with that belief. Now see how great the difference is between these three men. The first is undoubtedly nearest to the Almighty, the second is remote, and the third, and the third still more distant from him. If there be a fourth person who holds himself convinced by proof that emotions are impossible in God, while the first who rejects the corporeality is not convinced of that impossibility, that fourth person is undoubtedly nearer the knowledge of God than the first, and so on, so that a person who, convinced by proof, negatives a number of things in reference to God, which according to our belief may possibly be in him or emanate from him, is undoubtedly a more perfect man than we are, and would surpass us still more if we positively believed these things to be properties of God. 
it will now be clear to you that every time you establish by proof the negation of a thing in reference to God, you become more perfect, while with every additional positive assertion, you follow your imagination and recede from the true knowledge of God. Only by such ways must we approach the knowledge of God, and by such researches and studies as would show us the inapplicability of what is inadmissible as regards the Creator, not by such methods as would prove the necessity of ascribing to Him anything extraneous to His essence, or asserting that He has a certain perfection when we find it to be a perfection in relation to us. The perfections are all to some extent acquired properties, and a property which must be acquired does not exist in everything capable of making such acquisition. You must bear in mind that by affirming anything of God, you are removed from Him in two respects. First, whatever you affirm is only a perfection in relation to us. Secondly, He does not possess anything superadded to this essence. His essence includes all His perfections as we have shown. Since it is a well-known fact that even that knowledge of God which is accessible to man cannot be attained except by negations, and that negations do not convey a true idea of the being to which they refer, all people, both of past and present generations, declared that God cannot be the object of human comprehension, that none but himself comprehends what he is, and that our knowledge consists in knowing that we are unable truly to comprehend him. All philosophers say he has overpowered us by his grace and is invisible to us through the intensity of his light, like the sun which cannot be perceived by eyes which are too weak to bear its rays. Much more has been said on this topic, but it is useless to repeat it here. The idea is best expressed in the book of Psalms, Silence is praise to thee, 65.2. It is a very expressive remark on this subject, for whatever we utter with the intention of extolling and of praising Him contains something that cannot be applied to God, and includes derogatory expressions. It is therefore more becoming to be silent and to be content with intellectual reflection as has been recommended by men of the highest culture in the words commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Psalms 4.4 4. You must surely know the following celebrated passage in the Talmud. Would that all passages in the Talmud were like that. Although it is known to you, I quote it literally as I wish to point out to you the ideas contained in it. A certain person reading prayers in the presence of Rabbi Hanina said, God the Great, the Valiant, and the Tremendous, the Powerful, the Strong, and the Mighty. The Rabbi said to him, Have you finished all the praises of your Master? The three epithets, God, the Great, the Valiant, and the Tremendous, we should not have applied to God, had Moses not mentioned them in the law, and had not the men of the Great Synagogue come forward subsequently and established their use in the prayer. And you say all this. Let this be illustrated by a parable. There was once an earthly king possessing millions of gold coin. He was praised for owning millions of silver coin. Was this not really dispraised to him? Thus far the opinion of the pious rabbi. Consider first how repulsive and annoying the accumulation of all these positive attributes was to him. Next, how he showed that, if we had only to follow our reason, we should never have composed these prayers, and we should not have uttered any of them. It has, however, become necessary to address men in words that should leave some idea in their minds, and, in accordance with the saying of our sages, the Torah speaks in the language of men, the Creator has been described to us in terms of our own perfections. 
but we should not on that account have uttered any other than the three above-mentioned attributes, and we should not have used them as names of God except when meeting with them in reading the law. Subsequently, the men of the great synagogue, who were prophets, introduced these expressions also into the prayer, but we should not on that account use in our prayers any other attributes of God. The principal lesson to be derived from this passage is that there are two reasons for our employing those phrases in our prayers. First, they occur in the Pentateuch. Secondly, the prophets introduced them into the prayer. Were it not for the first reason, we should never have uttered them, and were it not for the second reason, we should not have copied them from the Pentateuch to recite them in our prayers. How, then, could we approve of the use of those numerous attributes? You also learn from this that we ought not to mention and employ in our prayers all the attributes we find applied to God in the books of the prophets. For he does not say, were it not that Moses our teacher said them, we should not have been able to use them, but he adds another condition, and had not the men of the great synagogue come forward and established their use in the prayer, because only for that reason are we allowed to use them in our prayers. We cannot approve of what those foolish persons do who are extravagant in praise, fluent and prolix in the prayers they compose, and in the hymns they make in the desire to approach the Creator. They describe God in attributes which would be an offense if applied to a human being. For those persons have no knowledge of these great and important principles which are not accessible to the ordinary intelligence of man. Treating the Creator as a familiar object, they describe Him and speak of Him in any expressions they think proper. They eloquently continue to praise Him in that manner, and believe that they can thereby influence Him and produce an effect on Him. If they find some phrase suited to their object in the words of the prophets, they are still more inclined to consider that they are free to make use of such texts, which should at least be explained, to employ them in their literal sense, to derive new expressions from them, to form from them numerous variations, and to found whole compositions on them. This license is frequently met with in the compositions of the singers, preachers, and others who imagine themselves to be able to compose a poem. Such authors write things which partly are real heresy, partly contain such folly and absurdity that they naturally cause those who hear them to laugh, but also to feel grieved at the thought that such things can be uttered in reference to God. Were it not that I pitied the authors for their defects, and did not wish to injure them, I should have cited some passages to show you their mistakes. Besides, the fault of their compositions is obvious to all intelligent persons. You must consider it and think thus. If slander and libel is a great sin, how much greater is the sin of those who speak with looseness of tongue in reference to God, and to describe him by attributes which are far below him? And I declare that they not only commit an ordinary sin, but unconsciously at least incur the guilt of profanity and blasphemy. This applies both to the multitude that listens to such prayers, and to the foolish man that recites them. Men, however, who understand the fault of such compositions, and nevertheless recite them, may be classed, according to my opinion, among those to whom the following words are applied, and the children of Israel used words that were not right against the Lord their God, Second Kings 17.9, and utter error against the Lord, Isaiah 32.6. If you are of those who regard the honor of their Creator, do not listen in any way to them, much less utter what they say, and still less compose such prayers, knowing how great is the offense of one who hurls aspersions against the Supreme Being.
There is no necessity at all for you to use positive attributes of God with the view of magnifying Him in your thoughts, or to go beyond the limits which the men of the great synagogue have introduced in the prayers and in the blessings, for this is sufficient for all purposes, and even more than sufficient, as Rabbi Hanina said. Other attributes, such as occur in the books of the prophets, may be uttered when we meet with them in reading those books, but we must bear in mind what has already been explained, that they are either attributes of God's actions or expressions implying the negation of the opposite. This likewise should not be divulged to the multitude but a reflection of this kind is fitted for the few only who believe that the glorification of God does not consist in uttering that which is not to be uttered, but in reflecting on that on which man should reflect. We will now conclude our exposition of the wise words of Rabbi Hanina. He does not employ any such simile as a king who possesses millions of gold denarii and is praised as having hundreds. For this would imply that God's perfections, although more perfect than those ascribed to man, are still of the same kind. But this is not the case as has been proved. The excellence of the simile consists in the words, who possesses golden denarii and is praised as having silver denarii. This implies that these attributes, though perfections as regards ourselves, are not such as regards God. In reference to Him, they would all be defects, as is distinctly suggested in the remark, Is this not an offense to Him? I have already told you that all these attributes, whatever perfection they may denote according to your idea, imply defects in reference to God if applied to him in the same sense as they are used in reference to ourselves. Solomon has already given us sufficient instruction on this subject by saying, For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. Ecclesiastes 5 2. End of chapter 59. Part 1, Chapter 60 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 60 I will give you in this chapter some illustrations in order that you may better understand the propriety of forming as many negative attributes as possible and the impropriety of ascribing to God any positive attributes. A person may know for certain that a ship is in existence, but he may not know to what object that name is applied, whether to a substance or to an accident. A second person then learns that the ship is not an accident, a third that it is not a mineral, a fourth that it is not a plant growing in the earth, a fifth that it is not a body whose parts are joined together by nature, a sixth that it is not a flat object like boards or doors, a seventh that it is not a sphere, an eighth that it is not pointed, a ninth that it is not round-shaped nor equilateral, a tenth that it is not solid. It is clear that this tenth person has almost arrived at the correct notion of a ship by the foregoing negative attributes, as if he had exactly the same notion as those have who imagine it to be a wooden substance which is hollow, long, and composed of many pieces of wood, that is to say, who know it by positive attributes. Of the other persons in our illustration, each one is more remote from the correct notion of a ship than the next mentioned, so that the first knows nothing about it but the name. In the same manner you will come near to the knowledge and comprehension of God by the negative attributes, but you must be careful in what you negative, to negative by proof, not by mere words. For each time you ascertain by proof that a certain thing believed to exist in the Creator must be negatived, you have undoubtedly come one step nearer to the knowledge of God. It is in this sense that some men come very near to God, and others remain exceedingly remote from Him. 
not in the sense of those who are deprived of vision and believe that God occupies a place which man can physically approach or from which he can recede. Examine this well, know it, and be content with it. The way which will bring you near to God has been clearly shown to you. Walk in it, if you have the desire. On the other hand, there is a great danger in applying positive attributes to God, for it has been shown that every perfection we could imagine, even if existing in God in accordance with the opinion of those who assert the existence of attributes, would in reality not be of the same kind as that imagined by us, but would only be called by the same name, According to our explanation, it would in fact amount to a negation. Suppose exempli gratia you say he has knowledge, and that knowledge, which admits of no change and of no plurality, embraces many changeable things. His knowledge remains unaltered, while new things are constantly formed, and his knowledge of a thing before it exists, while it exists, and when it has ceased to exist, is the same without the least change. You would thereby declare that his knowledge is not like ours, and similarly that his existence is not like ours. You thus necessarily arrive at some negation, without obtaining a true conception of an essential attribute. On the contrary, you are led to assume that there is a plurality in God, and to believe that he, the one essence, has several unknown attributes. For if you intend to affirm them, you cannot compare them with those attributes known by us, and they are consequently not of the same kind. You are, as it were, brought by the belief in the reality of the attributes to say that God is one subject of which several things are predicated, though the subject is not like ordinary subjects, and the predicates are not like ordinary predicates. This belief would ultimately lead us to associate other things with God, and not to believe that He is one. For of every subject certain things can undoubtedly be predicated, and although in reality subject and predicate are combined in one thing, by the actual definition they consist of two elements, the notion contained in the subject not being the same as that contained in the predicate. In the course of this treatise, it will be proved to you that God cannot be a compound, and that he is simple in the strictest sense of the word. I do not merely declare that he who affirms attributes of God has not sufficient knowledge concerning the Creator, admits some association with God, or conceives him to be different from what he is, but I say that he unconsciously loses his belief in God. For he whose knowledge concerning a thing is insufficient understands one part of it while he is ignorant of the other, as, exempli gratia, a person who knows that man possesses life, but does not know that man possesses understanding. But in reference to God, in whose real existence there is no plurality, it is impossible that one thing should be known and another unknown. Similarly, he who associates an object with the properties of another object conceives a true and correct notion of the one object and applies that notion also to the other, while those who admit the attributes of God do not consider them as identical with his essence but as extraneous elements. Again, he who conceives an incorrect notion of an object must necessarily have a correct idea of the object to some extent. He, however, who says that taste belongs to the category of quantity has not, according to my opinion, an incorrect notion of taste, but is entirely ignorant of its nature, for he does not know to what object the term taste is to be applied. This is a very difficult subject. Consider it well. According to this explanation, you will understand that those who do not recognize in reference to God the negation of things which others negative by clear proof are deficient in the knowledge of God and are remote from comprehending Him. Consequently, the smaller the number of things in which a person can negative in relation to God the less he knows of Him, as has been explained in the beginning of this chapter, 
but the man who affirms an attribute of God knows nothing but the same, for the object to which in his imagination he applies the name does not exist. It is a mere fiction and invention, as if he applied that name to a non-existing being. For there is in reality no such object. Exempli gratia, someone has heard of the elephant and knows that it is an animal and wishes to know its form and nature. A person who is either misled or misleading tells him it is an animal with one leg, three wings, lives in the depth of the sea, has a transparent body, its face is wide like that of a man, has the same form and shape, speaks like a man, flies sometimes in the air, and sometimes swims like a fish. I should not say that he described the elephant incorrectly, or that he has insufficient knowledge of the elephant, but I would say that the thing thus described is an invention and fiction, and that, in reality, there exists nothing like it. It is a non-existing being, called by the name of a really existing being, and, like the griffin, the centaur, and similar imaginary combinations for which simple and compound names have been borrowed from real things. The present case is analogous, namely, God, praised be his name, exists, and his existence has been proved to be absolute and perfectly simple, as I shall explain. If such a simple, absolutely existing essence were said to have attributes, as has been contended, and were combined with extraneous elements, it would in no way be an existing thing, as has been proved by us. And when we say that that essence, which is called God, is a substance with many properties by which it can be described, we apply that name to an object which does not at all exist. Consider, therefore, what are the consequences of affirming attributes to God. As to those attributes of God which occur in the Pentateuch or in the books of the prophets, we must assume that they are exclusively employed, as has been stated by us, to convey to us some notion of the perfections of the Creator, or to express qualities of actions emanating from Him. End of chapter 60「Part 1 Chapter 61 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 61 It is well known that all the names of God occurring in Scripture are derived from His actions, except one, namely the Tetragrammaton, which consists of the letters Yod, Ha, Vau, and He. This name is applied exclusively to God, and is on that account called Shem Ha Meforash, the Nomen Proprium. It is the distinct and exclusive designation of the divine being, whilst his other names are common nouns and are derived from actions, to which some of our own are similar, as we have already explained. Even the name Adonai, Lord, which has been substituted for the Tetragrammaton, is derived from the appellative Lord. Compare, the man who is the Lord, Adonai, of the land spake roughly to us. Genesis 43, 30. The difference between Adonai, my Lord, with Herak under the Nun, or Adonai, with Kemetz, is similar to the difference between Sari, my prince, and Sarai, Abraham's wife, Ibid 16.1, the latter form denoting majesty and distinction. An angel is also addressed as Adonai, exempli gratia, Adonai, my Lord, pass not away, I pray thee, Ibid 18.3. I have restricted my explanation to the term Adonai, the substitute for the Tetragrammaton, because it is more commonly applied to God than any of the other names which are in frequent use, like Dayan, Judge, Shaddai, Almighty, Tzaddik, Righteous, Hanun, Gracious, Rahum, Merciful, and Elohim, Chief. All these terms are unquestionably appellations and derivatives. The derivation of the name consisting of Yod, He, Vau, and He is not positively known, the word having no additional signification. 
This sacred name, which as you know was not pronounced except in the sanctuary by appointed priests when they gave the sacerdotal blessing, and by the high priest on the Day of Atonement, undoubtedly denotes something which is peculiar to God, and is not found in any other being. It is possible that in the Hebrew language of which we have now but a slight knowledge, the Tetragrammaton, in the way it was pronounced, conveyed the meaning of absolute existence. In short, the majesty of the name and the great dread of uttering it are connected with the fact that it denotes God himself, without including in its meaning any names of the things created by him. Thus our sages say, My name, Numbers 6.27, means the name which is peculiar to me. All other names of God have reference to qualities and do not signify a simple substance, but a substance with attributes, they being derivatives. On that account, it is believed that they imply the presence of a plurality in God, I mean to say the presence of attributes, that is, of some extraneous element superadded to his essence. Such is the meaning of all derivative names. They imply the presence of some attribute and its substratum, though this be not distinctly named. As, however, it has been proved that God is not a substratum capable of attributes, we are convinced that those appellatives, when employed as names of God, only indicate the relation of certain actions to him, or they convey to us some notion of his perfection. Hence, Rabbi Hanina would have objected to the expression, the great, the mighty, and the tremendous, had it not been for the two reasons mentioned by him, because such expressions lead men to think that attributes are essential, it est, they are perfections actually present in God. The frequent use of names of God derived from actions led to the belief that he had as many essential attributes as there were actions from which the names were derived. The following promise was therefore made, implying that mankind will at a certain future time understand this subject and be free from the error it involves. In that day will the Lord be one, and his name one. Zechariah 14.9 The meaning of this prophecy is this, He being one will then be called by one name, which will indicate the essence of God, but it does not mean that his sole name will be a derivative, videlicet, one. In the Pirka Rabbi Eliezer, chapter 3, occurs the following passage. Before the universe was created, there was only the Almighty and his name. Observe how clearly the author states that all these appellatives employed as names of God came into existence after the creation. This is true, for they all refer to actions manifested in the universe. If, however, you consider his essence as separate and as abstracted from all actions, you will not describe it by an appellative, but by a proper noun, which exclusively indicates that essence. Every other name of God is a derivative. Only the Tetragrammaton is a real nomen proprium and must not be considered from any other point of view. You must be aware of sharing the error of those who write amulets, camiot, Whatever you hear from them or read in their works, especially in reference to the names which they form by combination, is utterly senseless. They call these combinations shemot, names, and believe that their pronunciation demands sanctification and purification, and that by using them they are enabled to work miracles. Rational persons ought not to listen to such men, nor in any way believe their assertions. No other name is called Shem Ha Meforash, except this tetragrammaton, which is written but is not pronounced according to its letters. The words, Thus shall ye bless the children of Israel, Numbers 6.23, are interpreted in Sifri as follows, Thus in the holy language, again thus, with the Shem Ha Meforash. The following remark is also found there, in the sanctuary the name of God is pronounced as it is spelt, but elsewhere by its substitutes.
In the Talmud, the following passage occurs. Thus, it est, with the Shem Ha Meforash, you say that the priests, when blessing the people, had to pronounce the Shem Ha Meforash. This was perhaps not the case, and they may have used other names instead. We inferred from the words, and they shall put my name, number 627, it est, my name which is peculiar to me. It has thus been shown that the Shem HaMephorash, the proper name of God, is the Tetragrammaton, and that this is the only name which indicates nothing but his essence. And therefore our sages, in referring to this sacred term, said, My name means the one which is peculiar to me alone. In the next chapter I will explain the circumstances which brought men to a belief in the power of Shemot, names of God. I will point out the main subject of discussion and lay open to you its mystery, and then not any doubt will be left in your mind, unless you prefer to be misguided. End of chapter 61Part 1, Chapter 62 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 62 We were commanded that, in the sacerdotal blessing, the name of the Lord should be pronounced as it is written in the form of the Tetragrammaton, the Shem Ha Meforash. It was not known to everyone how the name was to be pronounced, what vowels were to be given to each consonant, and whether some of the letters capable of reduplication should receive a dagesh. Wise men successively transmitted the pronunciation of the name. It occurred only once in seven years that the pronunciation was communicated to a distinguished disciple. I must, however, add that the statement, the wise men communicated the tetragrammaton to their children and their disciples once in seven years, does not only refer to the pronunciation but also to its meaning, because of which the tetragrammaton was made a nomen proprium of God, and which includes certain metaphysical principles. Our sages knew, in addition, a name of God which consisted of twelve letters inferior in sanctity to the Tetragrammaton. I believe that this was not a single noun, but consisted of two or three words, the sum of their letters being twelve, and that these words were used by our sages as a substitute for the Tetragrammaton whenever they met with it in the course of their reading the Scriptures. In the same manner as we at present substitute for it Aleph, Daleth, etc., it est Adonai the Lord. There is no doubt that this name, also consisting of twelve letters, was in this sense more distinctive than the name Adonai. It was never withheld from any of the students. Whoever wished to learn it had the opportunity given to him without any reserve. Not so the Tetragrammaton. Those who knew it did not communicate it except to a son or disciple once in seven years. When, however, unprincipled men had become acquainted with that name which consists of twelve letters, and in consequence had become corrupt in faith, as is sometimes the case when persons with imperfect knowledge become aware that a thing is not such as they had imagined, the sages concealed also that name, and only communicated it to the worthiest among the priests, that they should pronounce it when they blessed the people in the temple, for the tetragrammaton was then no longer uttered in the sanctuary on account of the corruption of the people. There is a tradition that with the death of Simeon the Just, his brother priests discontinued the pronunciation of the tetragrammaton in the blessing. They used instead this name of twelve letters, it is further stated that at first the name of twelve letters was communicated to every man, but when the number of impious men increased, it was only entrusted to the worthiest among the priests, whose voice in pronouncing it was drowned amid the singing of their brother priests. Rabbi Tarfon said, Once I followed my grandfather to the dais, where the blessing was pronounced, I inclined my ear to listen to a priest who pronounced the name, and noticed that his voice was drowned amid the singing of his brother priests. 
There was also a name of forty-two letters known among them. Every intelligent person knows that one word of forty-two letters is impossible, but it was a phrase of several words which had together forty-two letters. There is no doubt that the words had such a meaning as to convey a correct notion of the essence of God in the way we have stated. This phrase of so many letters is called a name because, like other proper nouns, they represent one single object, and several words have been employed in order to explain more clearly the idea which the name represents. For an idea can more easily be comprehended if expressed in many words. Mark this and observe now that the instruction in regard to the names of God extended to the signification of each of those names and did not confine itself to the pronunciation of the single letters which, in themselves, are destitute of an idea. Shem Ha Meforash applied neither to the name of forty-two letters nor to that of twelve, but only to the Tetragrammaton, the proper name of God, as we have explained. Those two names must have included some metaphysical ideas. It can be proved that one of them conveyed profound knowledge from the following rule laid down by our sages: the name of forty-two letters is exceedingly holy. It can only be entrusted to him who is modest in the midway of life, not easily provoked to anger, temperate, gentle, and who speaks kindly to his fellow men. He who understands it is cautious with it and keeps it in purity. Is loved above and is liked here below. He is respected by his fellow men. His learning remaineth with him. And he enjoys both this world and the world to come. So far in the Talmud, how grievously has this passage been misunderstood? Many believe that the forty-two letters are merely to be pronounced mechanically; that by knowledge of these, without any further interpretation, they can attain to these exalted ends. Although it is stated that he who desires to obtain a knowledge of that name must be trained in the virtues named before and go through all the great preparations which are mentioned in that passage. On the contrary, it is evident that all this preparation aims at a knowledge of metaphysics and includes ideas which constitute the secrets of the law, as we have explained, Chapter Thirty Five. In works on metaphysics, it has been shown that such knowledge, it is the perception of the active intellect, can never be forgotten, and this is meant by the phrase "his learning remaineth with him." When bad and foolish men were reading such passages, they considered them to be a support of their false pretensions and of their assertion that they could, by means of an arbitrary combination of letters, form a shem, a name, which would act and operate miraculously when written or spoken in a certain particular way. Such fictions, originally invented by foolish men, were in the course of time committed to writing and came into the hands of good but weak-minded and ignorant persons who were unable to discriminate between truth and falsehood and made a secret of these shemot. When, after the death of such persons, those writings were discovered among their papers, it was believed that they contained truths. For the simple believeth every word. Proverbs fourteen fifteen. We have already gone too far away from our interesting subject and recondite inquiry, endeavoring to refute a perverse notion, the absurdity of which every one must perceive who gives a thought to the subject. We have, however, been compelled to mention it in treating of the divine names, their meanings, and the opinions commonly held concerning them. We shall now return to our theme, having shown that all names of God, with the exception of the Tetragrammaton Shem Ha Meforash, are appellatives. We must now, in a separate chapter, speak on the phrase Aya Asher Aya. Exodus three fourteen, because it is connected with the difficult subject under discussion, namely the inadmissibility of divine attributes.
End of chapter 62part 1 chapter 63 of the guide for the perplexed by moses maimonides this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 63 before approaching the subject of this chapter we will first consider the words of moses and they shall say unto me what is his name what shall i say unto them exodus 3:13 how far was this question, anticipated by Moses, appropriate, and how far was he justified in seeking to be prepared with the answer? Moses was correct in declaring, But behold, they will not believe me, for they will say the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Ibid 4 1. For any man claiming the authority of a prophet must expect to meet with such an objection, so long as he is not given a proof of his mission. Again, if the question, as appears at first sight, referred only to the name as a mere utterance of the lips, the following dilemma would present itself. Either the Israelites knew the name, or they had never heard it. If the name was known to them, they would perceive in it no argument in favor of the mission of Moses, his knowledge and their knowledge of the divine name being the same. If, on the other hand, they had never heard it mentioned, and if the knowledge of it was to prove the mission of Moses, what evidence would they have that this was really the name of God? Moreover, after God had made known that name to Moses, and had told him, Go, and gather the elders of Israel, and they shall hearken to thy voice. Ibid 16.18, he replied, Behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, although God had told him, And they will hearken to thy voice. Whereupon God answered, What is that in thine hand? and he said a rod, Ibid 4.2. In order to obviate this dilemma, you must understand what I am about to tell you. You know how widespread were in those days the opinions of the Sabians. All men, except a few individuals, were idolaters. That is to say, they believed in spirits, in man's power to direct the influences of the heavenly bodies, and in the effect of talismans. Any one who in those days laid claim to authority based it either like Abraham on the fact that, by reasoning and by proof, he had been convinced of the existence of a being who rules the whole universe, or that some spiritual power was conferred upon him by a star, by an angel, or by a similar agency. But no one could establish his claim on prophecy, that is to say, on the fact that God had spoken to him or had entrusted a mission to him. Before the days of Moses, no such assertion had ever been made. You must not be misled by the statements that God spoke to the patriarchs or that he had appeared to them, for you do not find any mention of a prophecy which appealed to others or which directed them. Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, or any other person before them, did not tell the people, God said unto me, You shall do this thing, or you shall not do that thing, or God has sent me to you. Far from it, for God spoke to them on nothing but of what especially concerned them. It est, he communicated to them things relating to their perfection, directed them in what they should do, and foretold them what the condition of their descendants would be, nothing beyond this. They guided their fellow men by means of argument and instruction, as is implied according to the interpretation generally received amongst us in the words and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, Genesis 12.5. When God appeared to our teacher Moses and commanded him to address the people and to bring them the message, Moses replied that he might first be asked to prove the existence of God in the universe, and that only after doing so he would be able to announce to them that God had sent him. For all men, with few exceptions, were ignorant of the existence of God. Their highest thoughts did not extend beyond the heavenly sphere, its forms, or its influences. 
They could not yet emancipate themselves from sensation, and had not yet attained to any intellectual perfection. Then God taught Moses how to teach them, and how to establish amongst them the belief in the existence of himself, namely by saying, Eya asher eya, a name derived from the verb haya, in the sense of existing, for the verb haya denotes to be, and in Hebrew no difference is made between the verb to be and to exist. The principal point in this phrase is that the same word which denotes existence is repeated as an attribute. The word asher, that, corresponds to the Arabic alethi and aleti, and is an incomplete noun that must be completed by another noun. It may be considered as the subject of the predicate which follows. The first noun which is to be described as eyeh, the second by which the first is described is likewise eyeh, the identical word, as if to show that the object which is to be described and the attribute by which it is described are in this case necessarily identical. This is therefore the expression of the idea that God exists, but not in the ordinary sense of the term. Or, in other words, he is the existing being which is the existing being. That is to say, the being whose existence is absolute. The proof which he was to give consisted in demonstrating that there is a being of absolute existence that has never been and never will be without existence. This I will clearly prove. Part 2, Introduction, Proposition 20, and Chapter 1. God thus showed Moses the proofs by which his existence would be firmly established among the wise men of his people. Therefore the explanation of the name is followed by the words, Go, gather the elders of Israel, and by the assurance that the elders would understand what God had shown to him, and would accept it, as is stated in the words, And they will hearken to thy voice. Then Moses replied as follows, They will accept the doctrine that God exists, convinced by these intelligible proofs. But, said Moses, by what means shall I be able to show that this existing God has sent me? Thereupon God gave him the sign. We have thus shown that the question, what is his name, means who is that being, which according to thy belief has sent thee. The sentence, what is his name, instead of who is he, has here been used as a tribute of praise and homage, as though it had been said, Nobody can be ignorant of thy essence and of thy real existence. If nevertheless I ask what is thy name, I mean what idea is to be expressed by the name. Moses considered it inappropriate to say to God that any person was ignorant of God's existence, and therefore described the Israelites as ignorant of God's name, not as ignorant of him who was called by that name. The name Yah likewise implies eternal existence. Shaddai, however, is derived from Dai, enough, compare, for the stuff they had was sufficient, the yam, Exodus 36, 7, the sheen is equal to asher, which, as in shikabar, which already, Ecclesiastes 2, 16. The same Shaddai, therefore, signifies he who is sufficient, that is to say, he does not require any other being for affecting the existence of what he created, or its conservation. His existence is sufficient for that. In a similar manner, the name Chasun implies strength. Compare, he was strong, Chasun, as the oaks, Amos 2.9. The same is the case with rock, which is a homonym, as we have explained, chapter 16. It is therefore clear that all these names of God are appellatives, or are applied to God by way of homonymy, like Zur and others, the only exception being the Tetragrammaton, the Shem Ha Mephorash, the nomen proprium of God, which is not appellative. It does not denote any attribute of God, nor does it imply anything except his existence. 
absolute existence includes the idea of eternity. It is the necessity of existence. Note well the result at which we have arrived in this chapter. End of chapter 63「Part 1, Chapter 64 of The Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 64 Know that in some instances by the phrase, The name of the Lord, nothing but the name alone is to be understood. Compare, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Exodus 27 and he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord. Leviticus 24.16 This occurs in numerous other passages. In other instances it means the essence and reality of God himself, as in the phrase, They shall say to me, What is his name? Sometimes it stands for the word of God, so that the name of God, the word of God, and the command of God are identical phrases. Compare for my name is in him, Exodus 23, 21. That is, my word or my command is in him. It is, he is the instrument of my desire and will. I shall explain this fully in treating of the homonymity of the term angel, part 2, chapters 6 and 34. The same is the case with the glory of the Lord. The phrase sometimes signifies the material light which God caused to rest on a certain place in order to show the distinction of that place. Exempli gratia, and the glory of the Lord, Kebod Adonai, abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it. Exodus 24, 16. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Ibid 40, 35. Sometimes the essence, the reality of God is meant by the expression, as in the words of Moses, Show me thy glory, Ibid 33.18, to which the reply was given, For no man shall see me and live, Ibid 20. This shows that the glory of the Lord in this instance is the same as he himself, and that thy glory has been substituted for thyself as a tribute of homage, an explanation which we also gave of the words, And they shall say unto me what is his name. Sometimes the term glory denotes the glorification of the Lord by man or by any other being. For the true glorification of the Lord consists in the comprehension of his greatness, and all who comprehend his greatness and perfection glorify him according to their capacity, with this difference, that man alone magnifies God in words expressive of what he has received in his mind and what he desires to communicate to others. Things not endowed with comprehension, as exempli gratia minerals, may also be considered as glorifying the Lord, for by their natural properties they testify to the omnipotence and wisdom of their Creator, and cause him who examines them to praise God, by means of speech or without the use of words, if the power of speech be wanting. In Hebrew, this license has been extended still further, and the use of the verb to speak has been admitted as applicable in such a case. Things which have no comprehension are therefore said to give utterance to praise, exempli gratia, all my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee? Psalms 35.10 because a consideration of the properties of the bones leads to the discovery of that truth, and it is through them that it became known, they are represented as having uttered the divine praise. And since this cause of God's praise is itself called praise, it has been said, the fullness of the whole earth is his praise. Isaiah 6, 3. In the same sense as the earth is full of his praise. Habakkuk 3, 3. As to kabod being employed in the sense of praise, compare, give praise, kabod, to the Lord your God, Jeremiah 13, 16. Also, and in his temple does every one speak of his praise, kabod, Psalms 29, 9, etc. Consider well the homonymity of this term, and explain it in each instance in accordance with the context. You will thus escape great embarrassment. End of chapter 64